please re uh, remember to mute yourself if you are not speaking. That way we can avoid background noise. Thank you. I'd like to call this meeting of the Anchorage Assembly to order. Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Ms. Allard. Here. Mr. Peterson. Present. Ms. LaFrance. Here. Mr. Dunbar. Mr. Dunbar. Here. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Mr. Rivera? Present. Mr. Weddleton? Here. Mr. Constant? Here. Ms. Kennedy? Here. Mr. Presbordia? Here. Ms. Zolotel? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Next, we have the Pledge of Allegiance. Ms. Kennedy, can you please lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, a nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Next, we have the land acknowledgement. Mr. Dunbar, if you could please read that. Oh, actually, uh, never mind. I will go ahead and read the land acknowledgement today. A land acknowledgement is a formal statement recognizing the indigenous people of a place. It is a public gesture of appreciation for the past and present indigenous stewardship of the lands that we now occupy. It is an actionable statement that marks our collective movement towards decolonization and equity. The Anchorage Assembly would like to acknowledge that we gather today on the traditional lands of the Dena'ina Athabascans. For thousands of years, the, the Dena'ina have been and continue to be the stewards of this land. It is with gratefulness and respect that we recognize the contributions, innovations, and contemporary perspectives of the Upper Cook Inlet Dena'ina. Next, we have minutes of previous meetings. Mr. Vice Chair. Um, move to approve the minutes of the regular meeting November 4th, 2020. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the motion? Is there any opposition to the motion? Okay. Seeing none, that motion is approved. Next, we have the mayor's report. Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening to you and to other assembly members. I'm happy to report tonight that we have reason to be hopeful about the direction we're heading. COVID cases continue to decrease, and this reduction in cases has created more buffer capacity at our hospitals. Though over the past couple of weeks, we've been seeing COVID-19 hospitalizations remain steady as outbreaks in other parts of the state with fewer public health measures are sending people to Anchorage hospitals. Alaska is leading the country in vaccination rates. 44,915 Anchorage residents have received at least one dose of vaccine. There are hundreds of appointments available for eligible residents as soon as this weekend. If you're listening and you're eligible, please sign up at AnchorageCOVIDVaccine.org. Eligible Alaskans include anyone 65 and older, frontline workers in a healthcare setting, and long-term care facility residents and staff. Our dual efforts to roll out vaccine as quickly as possible and keep up our personal precautions, including masks and distancing, are critical not only to saving lives, but also to strengthening and speeding up our economic recovery. Lower cases means more people will have the confidence to go out and patronize Anchorage businesses, and more kids will safely return to classrooms. The Canadian announcement that would prevent cruise ship travelers this summer underscores our fundamental need to prioritize public health. We're going to need independent travelers this summer 
and travelers will seek out locations where COVID is well managed and hospitals are not overwhelmed. In the meantime, more economic help is on the way. Millions of dollars of new federal rental assistance will be available next week, and renters will be eligible for up to 12 months of rent and utility assistance. Residents can check their eligibility and pre-register today at alaskahousingrelief.org. That's alaskahousingrelief.org. A program made possible by the municipality's collaboration with our terrific partners, Alaska Housing Finance Corporation and Cook Inlet Housing Authority. I'd like to personally thank Brian Butcher and Carol Gore for their great leadership and partnership in making sure we get assistance to Anchorage residents efficiently and quickly. This funding is restricted by the federal government to renters, unfortunately, but we are hopeful and have been advocating that the next stimulus package make available funding to those paying mortgages as well. As we look forward to brighter days ahead, Anchorage will continue to have an outsized responsibility in driving our public health and economic recovery. The factors that make us vulnerable to the spread of COVID-19, that we are the dense, diverse, and large population center of the state, also increase the importance that we protect the progress that we have made. Our hospitals serve the entire state. We are the economic heart of this state. That is why we have eased restrictions in a manner that is consistent with the best available science and with regular communication with impacted sectors. Thanks to the diligence and sacrifice of this community, we have made incredible progress. Let's keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have the Assembly Chair's Report. Welcome to everyone who is either joining us in person or online. For those in person, thank you for following our COVID-19 protocols in place for both the Assembly Chambers and the Wilda Marston, including mask wearing and physical distancing. I want to reiterate a few comments I made during a continued Assembly meeting on January 27th about decorum. As most know who've attended the Assembly meetings over the last few months, I always start uh, state before audience participation and opening public hearings the following requests. One, to direct your comments to the assembly or the chair, and two, that personal attacks are not appropriate. Following these two requests helps to create an atmosphere focused on debating and deliberating facts, principles, and ideas, and not attacking opinions and personalities. I ask for everyone's help to create this atmosphere in these chambers and to maintain decorum. Disruptions while someone is speaking will not be tolerated. A quick item on, on process for items 14E through 14H. As is noted in the clerk's note on the agenda, it is my intent to keep the public hearing open on item 14E for approximately one and a half hours. After which, I will ask for a motion to continue the public hearing of this item to a future regular meeting possibly in March at the request of a sponsor. If the body agrees, we will then proceed to the public hearing on 14F and get through as much of the remainder of the agenda as possible. I will not be asking for a motion to continue this meeting. So whatever we don't finish today will be transferred over to the second meeting in February or another future regular meeting. As usual, if anyone needs help during the meeting, please see our wonderful aide, Heather, in the back. With that, we're gonna go ahead and move on to committee and liaison reports. Um, I'll, I'll start on this side uh, with Ms. Allard. I don't have anything to report, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have no report this evening. Thank you. Ms. LaFrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The next meeting of the Budget and Finance Committee will be Thursday, February 18th at 1 p.m. And I would just encourage any members who have any items that they'd like to see on the agenda to please let me or Mr. perez Verdia know. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No report this evening. Are you hearing me better now? I made some changes. Yes, we can. We can hear you better. Thank you. There's no lack. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Weddleton. Uh, thanks. Uh, the Community Economic Development Committee uh, is continuing work on um, 
Yeah, looking at how we handle our rights away and easements that we haven't paid much attention to and um, how we can reassert those. We're also continuing work on marijuana cha law changes and made quite a bit of headway. We should see something in the next month or two. Um, and we're also working on um, ordinance for shelter licensing. The uh, Anchorage Metropolitan Area Transportation Solutions, our um, group for spending federal highway funds, uh, has the non-motorized plan out for review for a very short time longer. So take a look at that. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Constant. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Just a brief report that the Enterprise and Utility Oversight Committee will be meeting on the 18th week from Thursday at 11 a.m. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just want to update uh, on the uh, Public Safety um, Committee. Uh, we had basically charged the uh, Public Safety Advisory Commission to be, take that first look at the um, policy, the APD's policy in regard to body-worn cameras, and they are taking on that challenge. And I believe their meeting is the 17th of this month, so they'll be taking that first glance and we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. perez Verdia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No update tonight. Thank you. Ms. Alatel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I co-chair the Health Policy Committee with Ms. LaFrance. We had a meeting um, a week ago, or this past Wednesday, um, and we did a pretty deep dive into the health risk metrics, um, the new uh, guidance we have now um, about the overall risk level and then what goes into that that you can find on the municipality's webpage if you press the large COVID button and then scroll down just below where you'll see the um, icons but before you uh, get into uh, the specific uh, counts. Um, it's really a great tool. Um, I encourage you to take a look at that and to listen to that meeting if you want um, to uh, know more about what's going into the decisions and how the municipality is making those. And then as chair of the communications subcommittee, um, I hope everyone will be seeing soon um, some infographics that we'll be putting up or some posts about how to contact members both um, via email and then via written testimony or to make a request for telephonic testimony and the differences between the two. And recently as well, an Assembly 101 all about ordinances was published. So um, please look for those resources. And um, thanks again to our uh, communications staff within the clerk's team for putting those together. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on in our agenda, uh, we're going to move on to addendum to the agenda. Before we do that, there are three items um, to uh, read into the record. They're laid on the table items. All of them are supplemental items, so we won't have to take a vote on these. Um, so first is AR number 2021-44S, um, a supplemental item. The title is a resolution of the Anchorage Assembly to address Assemblymember Allard's actions and conduct that breached the public trust. Second is uh, AM 98-2021. It's an assembly memorandum to uh, item 14F on our agenda, AO 2021-12, an ordinance of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly amending Anchorage Municipal Code chapters 10.50 and 10.80 to allow for curbside pickup of alcoholic beverages, marijuana and marijuana products to allow delivery of sealed alcoholic beverages and related changes in response to COVID-19 and terminating the relevant emergency order. And then last is an assembly memorandum AM 99-2021 uh, pertaining to AO 2021-2020-14, which is item 14G on our agenda, an ordinance of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly um, amending Anchorage Municipal Code Section 21.03.040 to allow temporary expansion of licensed premises for on-site consumption of alcoholic beverages in response to COVID-19, waiving the review and approval process for Title 21, amendments of Anchorage Municipal Code Section 21.03.210, and terminating the relevant emergency order. Other than that, that completes our laid on the table item uh, process. So let's go ahead and move on to addendum to the agenda. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, uh, move to incorporate the addendum to the agenda and the agenda and the laid on the table items. Second. 
Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the motion? Is there any opposition to the motion? Okay, seeing none, that motion is approved. All right, we're gonna go ahead and move on to appearance requests and initial audience participation. Um, so for, uh, for this initial audience participation, I'd like to prioritize times uh, for members of the public who would like to speak on a consent agenda item, those who cannot stay until the second audience participation at the end of the meeting, and those who would have difficulty staying for a public hearing item already on the agenda due to uh, childcare or travel issues before we open it up to the broader public. As a reminder, if you choose to speak now on a public hearing item already on the agenda, you may not speak again when we open the public hearing on the item. Also, if you choose to speak now, you cannot speak again during the final audience participation. For audience participation, please direct your comments to the assembly or the chair. You will have three minutes to speak and personal attacks are not appropriate. In addition, audience members are asked to avoid clapping or other disruptions during audience participation. Last, during audience participation, assembly members generally do not answer questions or respond to comments. We may talk to you offline during a break or after the meeting to address any questions you have. I will, as chair, work to maintain decorum at this meeting and ask for your assistance. With that, we do have two appearance requests before we do audience participation. Uh, so first we have Mr. Uh, Niall Williams. It's Mr. Williams here. Okay, um, we, we can go ahead and call Mr. Williams then. Nile Williams. Sorry, I have missed. All right, we will try him again during final audience participation. Then, uh, so next we have uh, Mr. Ivan Hodes. Okay. Okay. You'll have three minutes. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to oh, can you can you press the yellow button? Is that on yet? Yellow button. There you go. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to begin by clarifying that I speak in my capacity as a private concerned citizen and not on behalf of my employer or any organization to which I belong. On Holocaust Remembrance Day this year, I found myself wondering what had happened to Germans who had married uh, Jewish spouses. I was surprised to learn that the vast majority of such people survived the Holocaust and even more surprised to learn that their Jewish spouses and children, for the most part, did too. The reason for this is because uh, German citizens who were married to Jews advocated for and rose to defend their loved ones, succeeding in delivering them from the furnaces. This can be taken as an inspiring story about the power of love in the face of tyranny, but it's also a troubling one to me because it shows that had ordinary Germans stood up for their Jewish neighbors and citizens that they weren't married to, the Holocaust would never have happened, at least not in Germany. The problem wasn't that so many Germans hated Jews, it was that when determined and lethal anti-Semitism showed up in their neighborhoods, most Germans didn't care enough to speak up for their neighbors. Like Germans in the 1930s, I think most Alaskans and citizens of Anchorage don't spend much time thinking about how much they hate Jews or other minorities. And unlike in Germany, those who do don't hold political power. The problem here too is apathy and misvaluation. Recently, some fraction of our community demonstrated it's more concerned with scoring points against woke cancel culture than in denouncing clear and unequivocally expressed pro-Nazi sentiment. There may even have been some members of this assembly who failed to treat the situation with the seriousness with which it was due. However, after the events of the last few weeks, the governor's actions, the national and international press attention, the outcry from leaders in the Jewish community, uh, I, have, I have to believe that every member of this assembly now understands that this is a serious issue, that it is deeply offensive to those of us, like me, whose relatives survived or didn't, the Holocaust and- Actually, um, sir, I'm sorry. I, yes. I'm gonna ask you to pause this second. Okay. We're dealing with an issue with our telephone. <laughs> Uh, folks on the phone, can you hear us now? Yes, you, but not the speaker. Can you can you just say, say a little bit, just so we can hear, see if they can hear you? Yeah. Um, can everybody hear me that, now? That's better. Okay. Great. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Okay. Um, 
After the events of the last few weeks, I have to believe that every member of this assembly now does understand that this is a serious issue. It is deeply offensive to those of us, uh, like me, whose relatives survived or didn't survive the Holocaust, and the many members of our diverse community who would have been targeted for extermination by the Third Reich. Speaking out against Nazism and white supremacy should not be and is not a liberal or conservative issue. It is and ought to be something that unites all of us as Americans and neighbors. I'm not here to advocate for or advocate against any disciplinary action taken regarding any member of this assembly, nor to advocate for or against the recall of any member. That's up to the judgment of the assembly and the citizens of this municipality. But I am here to suggest that regardless of what does happen, that every member of this assembly take the opportunity to recognize the power of their voices and the influence they have in their communities. I encourage those who wish to demonstrate that they take the issue seriously and demonstrate that they re represent all of their constituents to use their influence to take proactive role in speaking out against racism and anti-Semitism and to curb the baser impulses of the small minority that speaks out so angrily and disrespectfully. In that way, Anchorage can be made a community where every citizen, regardless of race or ethnic background, feels safe and valued. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're gonna go ahead and move on to initial audience participation. As usual, we're gonna start with our phone list and we're gonna do three on the phones, then three in person and go back and forth. Uh, so first, uh, we have uh, Ms. Paige Coatney. Good afternoon, this is Paige. Hi, Ms. Coatney. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on initial audience participation. You have three minutes. Welcome. Welcome. I'd like to uh, state, well, you already have my name, um, Paige Coatney. I live in Airport Heights, and I would like to state my support of this assembly. This assembly is faced with numerous issues that need immediate attention, and they face a daunting task. Uh, homelessness, loss of state funding for services, and a pandemic with its own quagmire of issues. And this assembly has had to take action on preventative measures on COVID-19 with no federal or state leadership or direction. So the folks of Midtown expect their assembly members to be responsive, and they are. So Midtowners will call their assembly members about a pothole and want the members to come and see the pothole for themselves. And it wouldn't surprise me if some expected assembly members Zalatel and, and Rivera, or Rivera to show up with a shovel and a bucket of asphalt. So they expect these members to do things because they have a history following through. And a few reminders of what assembly member Rivera has done for the municipality. In 2016, there was a store, a liquor store in Midtown. They had issues with littering, vagrants, uh, and simply were not being good partners with the neighborhood or other businesses. So complaints about this liquor store were not getting resolved. However, after uh, Member Rivera was elected to the assembly, he and the Midtown Community Council reached out to work with this business. When it became clear that this business had no interest in supporting their commun uh, the community in which it was located, they were willing to meet minimal requirements of property maintenance, action was uh, initiated to revoke their uh, license. So, trying to scroll. Uh, homelessness is a concern in Anchorage, and Assemblymember Rivera hasn't wrung his hands lamenting what to do. He has initiated actions to address homelessness. He understands homelessness is a complex issue with in intersecting causes. Most recently, he spearheaded using CARE funds for rental assistance during the pandemic. So Housing First isn't just about housing, and he knows this. It's about providing a safe environment to address the crisis and trauma which led to homelessness. And homelessness isn't restricted to just one or two areas of town. It's citywide. Therefore, services need to be available throughout the city. The efforts the assembly take on to address homelessness is not choosing the homeless over the housed residents. They're providing services so all of Anchorage is better off. So the recall efforts for a mem member Rivera allege he continued an assembly meeting with 17 people in the chambers. So people attended this um, meeting with the intent to surpass the maximum capacity. When Member Rivera was informed only 15 were present, he continued. But after the meeting, someone alleged there were two extra in the room. And there's no proof of this. And that's the sole issue for the recall efforts. So supporters of the recall went door to door in the district to collect signatures. 
The irony of going door to door to complain about COVID emergency mandates is Apologies not. Apologies for interrupting, ma'am, but your, not time, a problem. your time is up. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Ann Jensen. Hi, Ms. Jensen. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on audience participation. You have three minutes. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I had uh, wanted to comment about the proposed changes to the Title 17 leash laws. And basically, I wanted to point out to the members of the Assembly and to the members of the public that it seems that it didn't go through the usual way in that an unidentified assembly member asked for the changes to be drafted. I don't think the proposed changes will actually satisfy the stated need of or the stated cause of the changes, which is to make it safer. When listening to the animal board uh, meeting, the first and foremost reason was because they said it would make it easier for enforcement officers to cite people, not to actually change the conditions of the trails or not to make it a better environment for all people. Um, secondly, in the recent article, it was pointed out that many of the citations are dismissed by hearing officers. If hearing officers dismiss citations, it's likely there's another issue with the citation or could be. And I think those things need to be considered, and I think that a more robust public participation needs to occur before any changes are then made. Um, that being said, the trails are used by many types of people, bikers, skiers, skiers with children, ski jurors, walkers, um, et cetera. And I think there's room for everybody on the trail. It, I, I think that because more people are using them this year, it's just more crowded and people are losing their patience and not realizing that the trails are there for everybody. In the 20 years I've been here, I've noticed an increase in the number of people using Bicentennial Park. And it's just a matter of change. I mean... That's why the parks are there for all of us to enjoy. And that includes people who wish to use or follow, <clears throat> excuse me, follow the existing law as it's written. And I don't mean to say people should scoff at that. But I don't think that the title as written now needs to be amended. And I think that there's no good reason for doing so. Um, and that my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Last on the phones before we go to in person is Miss Cass Smiley. has been forwarded. All right, we'll go ahead and switch to in person. Welcome. Hello, I'm, my name is Michelle and I'm a blue collar worker. I'm also a proud member of the Save Anchorage group, which according through the chair, per Mr. Constant, makes everything about me bad. Ivan Holder, last week, when I approached to get in line for the assembly, turned around and verbally attacked me. When I asked him why, 
He thought it was okay to verbally attack me. He pointed at my button, my Dave Bronson for mayor button. So when he speaks of peace and such, I would doubt that. He himself shows communist traits. He is coming at me because I am wearing a button silently saying what my thoughts are. So when he speaks of communism and Nazis, I don't think he knows what he's talking about. I've got family that have been involved with concentration camps. So I want to talk about what you're going to do to Jamie, your reprimand. Jamie is not a Nazi sympathizer. She was simply speaking freedom of speech. And in fact, I googled Anchorage Fuhrer phone. There are a lot of people in this town with the last name Fuhrer. Shall we go hunt them down and call them Nazi sympathizers? Just to say. So I think that if you guys proceed with this reprimand, which I think should be tabled permanently, you're going to have more people rise up. Because in Save Anchorage Group, when you cut one of our heads off, 60 more up here. Okay? Now, I've been going at this since 6 a.m. this morning, so I'm leaving after this. I'm going to put my little two cents in here about your changing the mandate to an assembly order. You're only doing that because you know that you have committed political suicide. So you're trying to get that squeezed in there so that our mayor that we elect, which we should have already been to elect, but you guys were so confused about that charter, um, you know, you're just trying to cover your bases so you guys can keep us pinned down, tied down, masked up. And you know what you're doing. And if you continue on that route, not only will Save Anchorage Group become stronger, we are going to become even more in numbers because people in this town are done with your games. Thank you for my testimony. Thank you. Welcome. No, press it one more time. There you go. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. Um, my name is Rebecca Gall, and um, I want to thank you guys, each of you, for being here today um, and taking my testimony. Uh, my husband and I currently live in Palmer, but we have been a part of a church in the MOA for the last 42 years. This community directly affects us and our family. Um, I would like to ask several questions. I know that you can't answer them. Um, how many children do you have? I'm here to speak today for those who cannot speak. I have a boy who is 12. He experiences autism and is on the nonverbal side of the spectrum. My son cannot communicate well and has only a few words, but we have worked tirelessly to help him learn how to communicate. During the first month of COVID, we found out that he cannot understand what someone is saying when their face is covered. He panics and his fears are palatable. It is heart-wrenching to watch him struggle. His schools, his therapist, and his doctor's office accommodates him with clear shields. He is valuable and his life matters. How many of you have children who experience a disability? Um, through the chair, I would like to um, ask Meg Valatel, who has a certificate of law for mental disabilities, have you looked into how this legally might infringe on the rights of those who have disabilities and limits with their communication? Who is representing those with disabilities? The current mandate is written poorly. There is no accommodation for those with disabilities. Do you think that's discriminatory? Do you think that's inclusive? Now the language of the new proposed law has even taken face shields off the table. I would ask you, how will this affect those who, whose communication depends on reading lips? How does it impact those whose communication is already inhibited? I believe a community can be measured by how you care for those who are disabled. My son is not any less a member of a community, of this community, because he has a disability. Um, please reconsider um, AO13 and making that mask mandate law. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome.
I can't see without these on. Where's the button? We can hear you. The microphone's on. My name is Charles McKee. I'm the beneficiary of the McKee Trust, and the credibility is, is, is at risk. Uh, but I say that Mary, the mother of Jesus, um, her credibility was established, as well as um, Elizabeth, who gave birth to John, and therefore, uh, on the day that Jesus gave up the ghost, of centurion indicated that truly this man was the son of God so we now have a fast forward a commander George Washington he was also a general and he was also a commander in chief so the credibility which, which is why I sent this message to the president current president and indicating that my cred is at risk because I go before the corporate court judicial officer, the 20th, 9, 2019, and I turn in my declaration of affidavit and truth, and it doesn't get recorded in this t tape of that hearing. I handed it to him. I said, you're my trustee. Your clerk's a trustee. The prosecutor's involved, and he's carrying the controversy against me, and you carrying the liability. If you can't get me to transfer off my liability stance, I mean my, my beneficiary stance, they are have the liability. What they do, they palmed it off, which is what I'm referring to on this page here, to palm off, to impose a fraud. So the judicial officer imposed a fraud upon me by palming it off to another court and now I'm being in, uh, permitted fraud against me by the by the bar and their uh, court sanctioned attorneys that are worthless they don't understand the living man the private civilian they don't want to recognize the National Trust, which I filed and recorded. I'm no longer considered missing because I recorded myself as a, and my birth certificate with the Department of Treasury, with the State Department, with Oregon where I was born, not the state of Oregon, but the Oregon State, the sovereign state of Oregon. And then filed it here and recorded it here this to avoid what I refer to as the interlocking directorates, the Bar Association, and their imposition against Apologies me. for interrupting, sir, but your time is up. Thank you. Before we go back to the phones, uh, just a quick reminder for folks in the audience, uh, please, to refrain from clapping or other disruptions uh, during audience participation. Uh, either during or after someone is speaking. Thank you. So we're going to go ahead and move on to Miss Christian Schild. Hi, this is Christiane. Can you hear me? Hi, uh, Miss Schild. Uh, this is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. Uh, we are on audience participation. You have three minutes. Welcome. Hi, um, my name is Christiane Shield. My assembly members are LaFrance and Weddleton. And yes, I'm a little bit frustrated. The last time I spoke to this assembly, I was phone testifying. I go to a class every Tuesday, 4 to 5 p.m. after work for 10 weeks, so there's no way I can stand in line to even attempt to get a chance at testifying in person um, because of the commitments that I have already. I plan ahead, I sign up, I prepare what I want to talk about. I listen respectfully to all of you assembly members as I drive home or throughout the evening all the way till 11, 12, whenever you extend it. I really want to ask, can you please have the decency of sitting down and closing your lips to show some respect? When I watched my video last assembly meeting, 
You, Mr. Rivera, disrespectfully couldn't even stay seated and listen to me. You and your assembly members were up chatting away, and it was just very disrespectful and very frustrating for me because I really do want you guys to hear more opinions from the citizens. If you need to take a break, I would say take one. Otherwise, please sit down and really look at us, really listen. God gave us two ears, two eyes, and only one mouth. He's telling you to use your eyes, look at your citizens, listen with your ears, and use your mouth less. Wisdom can be gained by just simply listening. I have some stories throughout the evening because I've signed up for several items to share how it's affected my life and just children or people in my life. These different AOs to EOs or EO to AOs are, are not a good idea. I really hope you're listening to all the concerned citizens who really love this city. The stories I tell tonight are real and affect us all. The answer is simple to this problem. End the emergency declaration for a disease that we know has better than a 99% survival rate for anyone under the age of 60. It's 95% survival rate for anyone over that. We can still protect the vulnerable by letting the healthy working class citizens produce and provide everything in the economy for those in need. We can help them, but it's not right to shut everyone else down. Shutting everyone down individually and attempting to allow government to provide for us will not work. It has never worked. End all the emergency orders and let us get back to work. Then you don't need to vote on any of these extra orders. My son has a brilliant mind, and he can sum up situations beautifully. I love the things he says. I'm going to quote his wisdom. This is where you should really listen, Assembly members. Dumb people have too much confidence, and smart people don't have enough. Think about it. If you're smart, you realize what you don't know, so you're humble. You're really humble. If you're ignorant, you don't realize it, so you're overconfident. Everyone can use to listen more because there's always more wisdom to be found. Apologies for interrupting, ma'am, but your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Jonathan Marsh. Hi, Mr. Marsh. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on audience participation. You have three minutes. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jonathan Marsh. I am an Anchorage resident and have spent the majority of my life here. I used to not care about any local politics, and I only ever voted in the presidential election and barely knew who the mayor was at any given time. This COVID season has really opened my eyes to our local leaders and the different priorities some of them have. It's also opened my eyes to the various groups who either support or oppose them. When COVID first started, while lockdowns were an inconvenience and I understand businesses were hurt and continue to be, I appreciated the Assembly's effort to take the precautions necessary to mitigate the spread of COVID so that as few of us would be at, at a risk as possible. I'm a healthy younger individual and have confidence in my body's immune system, but I know others don't have that luxury. I appreciated the mask mandates to protect us all, as I'm a frontline essential worker myself. I'd also like to point out that despite the protests of closures and many change routines, that many businesses chose to either temporarily close or redesign their business practices before they were even forced to. The Fifth Avenue Mall being one example, as well as restaurants like Tommy's Burger Stop and Lucky Wishbone. I'm thankful for the overall regard for the health of our community that the majority of us support even if we aren't a loud minority. Just because people belonging to certain Facebook groups show up in numbers to these meetings complaining about shutdowns, spending, mandates, and other things, not to dismiss any concerns or thoughts they have, but they do not speak for all of Anchorage. I'm confident the majority of the Assembly knows this too, but I feel it's important to make it known that this body does have support. I'm sure vitriol will be headed my way later from said Facebook group, and that's fine. Speaking out is more important than worrying about any venom that may be thrown by way, my way by the unhinged. My next comment is directed towards the situation regarding license plates and the assembly member. The excuse is made for Nazi terminology from a sitting assembly member who is supposed to represent all of us, 
not just those who voted for this person, despite what this person thinks and is on record as saying, are willfully ignorant, disgusting, and indefensible. There is no proof anywhere of the claims that progressives have put a spin on the meetings that have made the terms three Reich and Fuhrer to mean anything what they are, explicit Nazi references. The audacity to suggest that progressives are to blame for the terms is a desperate attempt to come to the defense of individuals who, are, who no doubt have no problems with these said phrases and who I would not be surprised are part of said Facebook group. We indeed have freedom of speech from the government, but we also have consequences for certain speech. Just because you have the right to say something does not mean you should, and it doesn't mean you're correct. Good thing for the rest of Anchorage, many, many of us find this member's activity rep repulsive. Combine this with the constantly interrupting business, riling rowdy crowds who are constantly disrupting the meetings, blocking constituents from commenting on the official government Facebook page before it was deleted, despite his members' claims that she didn't. We have screenshots Apologies for, for us interrupting, doing otherwise. sir, but yeah. your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have, uh, before we go back to in-person, we have Ms. Kachin McRae. Hello, this is Keechan McRae. Hi, Ms. McRae. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on audience participation. You have three minutes. Welcome. Thank you. I attended my first assembly meeting two weeks ago, and frankly, it was a surreal and disheartening experience. I saw assembly members blatantly disrespect the public, and I saw the public blatantly disrespect assembly members. I saw the kind of power struggle you might see between a parent and a child. The child wanting to make their own decisions, and the parents not trusting them to make those decisions for themselves. Except the public are not children, and the assembly is not our parent. We are adults, and when you try to control adults, they don't like it, and sometimes they revert to childish shouting because they feel that they have no other option. This dynamic, as well as the polarization and hostility I saw was concerning. Most concerning, I saw citizens that are afraid to speak up because they are concerned they may lose their job or their friends because of their opinions. And as if to confirm the danger, I saw the efforts to silence one of the only voices that many community members feel is standing for their interests and listening to their concerns. I watched as the acting mayor claimed that white supremacism is dividing our community. Although she did not name names, her statements were clearly meant to identify a particular assembly member as a racist and Nazi sympathizer. The shouts and jeers from the audience caused her to turn their glare to them, clearly including them in her accusations. I have looked at the statements made by this assembly member and am baffled by the reaction. Nothing she said was hateful. Nothing she said suggested she supported the beliefs supposedly held by the owners of the license plates. She made no apologies for Nazis or racism. In fact, her comments were utterly unrelated to the possible beliefs of the owners in question. Her statements were explicitly and simply about the values of free speech upon which our country is based. An idea that we used to understand, that I can disapprove of what you say while still defending your right to say it. Free speech has to mean all speech, including statements that we dislike or that make us uncomfortable. Otherwise, speech isn't really free at all. I've heard a lot of talk about unity recently, but I don't see much action to actually pursue it. Labeling those who disagree with you as racists and Nazis is not productive and does not move the conversation forward toward common ground. If we truly want unity, we have to learn how to listen with curiosity and respect, to be willing to hear from the other side without shutting them down, to go into conversations with the assumption that we might be wrong, that we might have missed something, that the other person is there in good faith with honorable intentions and has simply reached a different conclusion than we have. I know that I do not always live up to the standard myself, but it is something that I am trying hard to achieve. I would ask the assembly and the audience to consider this as we move forward. As tempting as it is to shout in an effort to be heard, it does nothing to actually advance our position and it arguably weakens the very valid arguments I heard the public present. And assembly members, the actions that the government has taken in the last year means that you have claimed an extraordinary amount of power and control over the lives of your fellow citizens. Please live up to the responsibility that comes with that power by truly listening to your constituents with an open mind. Make them feel heard and earn their respect. And give some of that power back to the people where it should be. We are not children. Please do not treat us like we are. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and switch back to in person. Welcome. Uh, for the record, my name is Louis Imbriani. 
Uh, I'm not here speaking on behalf of anybody else but myself. I do, or I am a member of the hockey community, and I'm also proudly represented by Assemblymember Allard and Assemblymember Kennedy. Um, I've heard this body talk about three things on a regular, on a regular basis. Equity, science, and legal. So let's see how those apply to EO18. Equity. If it was really equitable, how come hockey and wrestling are the only two sports required to test? How is that giving kids the same opportunity, and how is that fair and impartial? You're forcing kids to play outside in sub-zero temp temperatures because it's their only chance to play or organize sports or miss out on that opportunity forever. Some reports I got about the Mulcahy ice rinks. Uh, intoxicated individuals yelling and swearing at children. Human excrement around the rink. Drinking and drug use in the vicinity of the rinks. And I've heard two instances where a presumed Sullivan Arena resident exposed their genitalia to a group of children. All of these things violate the USA Hockey rules for player safety and their safe sport initiative to protect the children. So science. We've all heard about the termination dust and how that was a super spreader event. Well, the health department confirmed it. It wasn't. It was not a super spreader event. The team that had the most people with COVID didn't play a single game at Dempsey or Ben Boki where, those, where that tournament took place. The CDC, report, or the CDC report of the recreational hockey game in Florida in June of 2020 that everybody knows was a super spreader event, they also referenced choir practices, dance classes, meat processing plants, and a squash facility that all had the same type of spread. The, Acad the American Academy for Pediatrics issued new guidance for returning to sports that physical uh, that the physical and psychological benefits outweigh the risk of illness from COVID for children, and that testing should only be done for symptomatic individuals or those who have had known close contact with symptomatic and test positive individuals. The CDC also changed this back in August of 2020 for general testing requirements. So legal, Anchorage Municipal Code, 3.80.060H, which gives the order its power, says issue such orders or regulations immediately necessary for the protection of life and property. So if we as hockey players don't get tested, we are an immediate threat to the people's lives of this community. How do you think that paints us? And do you think that is legally defensible? I don't. And I will be in the auditorium collecting money and taking anybody who wants to get involved in action against this municipality for the illegal actions. Thank you. Welcome. My name is Brittany Tompkins and I'm also here as a private citizen. Today I represented our representatives. I'm asking you to stop mandating medical procedures. This mask mandate has negatively affected my family as a whole. Examples include unable to use my gym membership because I refuse to wear a mask while working out, family members that have been discriminated against for having medical conditions, family members not getting medical treatment for the, from the hospital because of fear of COVID prevented medical staff to do the proper procedures, and a family member dying alone at Providence Extended Care without a family around. My family member became homeless and, be and because job loss with all these shutdowns, had to sell everything and move back to Alaska to live with family for the most part of 2020. Then she was told by her doctor not to wear a mask because she gets eye treatments and could get an infection easily because of the bacteria that is coming up into her eyes from her mask. She was doing great. She got a job here after seven months, got a car, got an apartment, two months after wearing a mask, because she had to, to go to work. She was legally blind. <laughs> that was a direct cause from your mask mandate. Choice is absolutely necessary. Through the chair, Miss LaFrance knew about this. I emailed her. Her response was, wear a mask. But the assembly continues to tell us that. So are you now liable when people like my family members have negative side effects from wearing a mask? 
because you should be. I testified over the phone in November regarding the PCR cycle threshold and how 40 cycles is extremely high that you will get false positives that fell on deaf ears. Oh, but wait, the day that our new president was sworn in, the WHO updated their suggestion. Now they are admitting that the, what we common people were saying, those cycle thresholds were too high. Making a mask mandate into a law will only keep it a law. Has this body ever voted to repeal a law? Your family members, kids, grandkids, nieces, and nephews will only know the world with masks. You cannot walk away from this meeting not being warned that this will happen if we continue with this AO. I heard in the work session that the sponsors wanted to hear public opinions. Will you actually listen to those who are here? Will you actually take these testimonies in an account? I stand for freedom of, inf of informed consent. And as a member of this body had said, this mask is stifling. Please vote against this AO 2020-13. Thank you. Before we go to the next person in person, um, just want to note for the record, we have about five minutes left, so we'll get through as many folks as we can. We're obviously not going to be able to get through everyone in line. So once we're done at 6 o'clock, I'll ask everyone else in line to please sign up for a priority list, and then we will uh, hopefully get you at the end of our meeting. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you for hearing me. Dr. Hannafin, local chiropractor, business owner, and veteran. This is the third time that I've testified in front of you. I need you to rec recognize that if you were to pass this ordinance, we would be the only city in the entire United States to take the mask to a law outside of an emergency mandate. Does this not strike you as bizarre? We're the only ones. As I stated before, it's a complete abuse of power, and it flies in the face of common sense and reason. There are no amendments, sunset dates, or otherwise that will make this ordinance make sense. It has been stated that you are attempting to limit the control of the acting mayor, so unilateral control. However, she does not have unilateral control. You have control and can vote against anything that we want you to vote against. We've lost 277 souls to COVID. We've lost roughly 665 to drug abuse and suicide from January 1st, 2020 through November 3rd, 2020. That's from the Alaska State Epidemiology website. The suicide care line has seen an increase of 90% just for the third quarter of last year. They've also seen an increase of 51% of new callers, people that have never called in before. That is the epidemic that requires your attention, not COVID. It is not an epidemic. Our numbers are going down. We're not in a state emergency. The increase in numbers over the holidays happens to coincide, as I stated before, with coronaviruses running rampant in the wintertime. Not because we had an increase in COVID. The PCR test cannot tell you the difference between COVID-19 and any other coronavirus. That is a proven fact, and you guys really need to pay attention to that. Currently, there are eight states that do not have a single mask mandate. Their metrics are the same as ours. There is no difference. They are running the same exact numbers. After reviewing the COVID dashboard, there are thousands of tests that you are still trying to investigate where they came from. So how can you possibly justify the limits on gatherings, restaurants, and other businesses when you can't even tell us where the sources are for the positive tests? You have absolutely no idea. Our hospitals are not overrun. They have never been overrun. There needs to be more put on the hospitals to utilize verified and proven treatments for COVID. We need to stop punishing the healthy and we need to care about our sick and our vulnerable and the masks is not the way to do it. Your bar must be set higher to take something from, a ma from an emergency mandate into an ordinance. I oppose the coming ordinance. Thank you. All right, we're gonna go ahead and switch to the phones and we'll actually be ending our initial audience participation over the phone. So I would ask that folks, uh, if you wanna get on a priority list to please sign up for a priority list. Mr. Chair, I had to arrange a babysitter. Can I please request to take my time now? 
Um, so, uh, unfortunately, I'm going to go with the procedure that we have, have been following, which is go back and forth between in-person and over the phone. But if you want to get first on our priority list, we can call you later tonight. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and move on to Ms. Leslie Rydell on the phone. Your call cannot be completed. All right, the next, um, so was that a, got it, thanks. Your call can. Okay, <laughs> then uh, next we will go ahead and go to Mr. Dustin Darden. Mr. Darden, this is Felix Rivera. You are here with Anchorage Assembly. We are on audience participation. You have three minutes. Welcome. So, uh, through the chair, Felix Rivera, uh, you guys, and through the chair, uh, uh, lady over there that's talking all this filth and vileness about through the chair, Jamie Allard, you all got problems. You all got serious problems. Because you're sitting up there behind a bulletproof wall that's designed to serve the people. You got problems. Because you sitting up there talking all this garbage that you that you that you have to erect a bulletproof wall. Uh, that that's an issue because you sitting in the government right now. Um, you're here to serve the people, right? And uh, sitting up there acting like you serve the people, it's a joke because you don't serve the people. What you what you took an oath to uphold the Constitution through the chair. He took an oath to uphold the Constitution. And the Constitution states that the, uh, you have the right to freely speak. You got the right to freely speak through your mouth. Right? And you, you're talking about making a thing that in law covers your mouth. And that's your First Amendment right to speak. And you've got the right to freely assemble. And you're cutting off people's right to freely assemble. And you're also guilty of cutting people's rights to uh, petition the government for redress. So you're all guilty of, through the chair, Felix Rivera, you are guilty of a class A misdemeanor interference with constitutional rights. Alaska Statutes 1176-110. When you all talk about your ideas, that's a felony conspiracy against rights. Through the chair, that's a felony conspiracy against rights. These, these rights that we hold that are inalienable, God-given rights, are a serious thing. That flag behind you, the, the blood that was shed for our nation through the chair is a very serious issue that the men and women who died for our country so let's go back to the wall, the separation wall that is built, that, that was built before all of you were on the assembly. Why did they make that wall bulletproof? Let's, let's, let's contemplate that. Why is that wall bulletproof? And why is it that y'all got the concept through the chair? Apologies for interrupting, but you are out of time. Thank you. All right, so that completes our initial audience participation. Again, for folks who are waiting in line, if you'd like to sign up um, to uh, be a priority for final audience participation, assuming we have time for that, please do so. Uh, we're gonna keep going in our meeting, though.
uh, thanks everyone for participating. Okay, so uh, next in, on our agenda, we have uh, the consent agenda. Consent agenda items number 10A through 10F are typically routine or non-controversial items such as bid awards, new business, information and reports, and ordinances and resolutions for introduction. The items on the consent agenda may be approved by the assembly by a single vote on a motion to approve the consent agenda. Prior to approval, items may be pooled by an assembly member for discussion and separate vote on each of those items. Under the assembly rules of procedure, all ordinances and some resolutions will have an opportunity for public hearing on a future date. I'm gonna go ahead and go down the dice and see what folks would like to pool. I'm gonna start on this side with Ms. Zolotel. And then for folks in the room, if we can try to keep our conversation down to a minimum, that would be helpful. Ms. Zolotel? Thank you, Mr. Chair. 10A2 for reading, 10B Bravo 1T, or sorry, 10 F4, and just um, I'm aware that there are individuals waiting out in the atrium um, with regard to 10A2. Um, they weren't able to get into the chambers due to capacity limits. Thank you. I believe that they are in the chambers. Thank you. Um, next, we have uh, Mr. Perez Verdia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 10A3 for reading, uh, and that's it. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy? Uh, nothing else to pull. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Constant? I have no items. Thank you. Mr. Whittleton? 10 Delta 3 and 10 Delta 5. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, 10A4 for reading. Thank you. Ms. LaFrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No items. Thank you. Mr. Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to pull 10A5 for reading. I'm sorry, can you, can you say that one more time? Yes, 10A5 for reading. Great, thank you. And then uh, Ms. Allard. Nothing, Chair, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll go back to you, Mr. Constant. He's good. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I was asked to read 10A1, nobody pulled it, so I'd pull 10A1. Great. Thank you. Are there any other items? All right, seeing none, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I move to approve the um, consent agenda, less the items pulled. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the motion? Is there any opposition to the motion? Seeing none, that motion is approved. So for the public's information, the assembly has now passed or accepted all items in 10A through 10F, other than the items that were just pooled, which we will take up next, or that have been introduced for future public hearing, which are all items in 10G. If you are here to see action on an item listed on the consent agenda that was not pooled, those items have been passed or accepted. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and start going through some of our items that were pooled. Starting with item 10A1, resolution number AR 2021-37, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly recognizing and commending David Washburn for his leadership and services, service as the editor of the Senior Voice. Um, what is the will of the body? Move to approve. Constant. Second. Second, Zalatel. Moved and seconded. Is there any opposition? Seeing none, that item is approved. Who's reading? Who's presenting? I'll be reading. And is this person on the, on the phone? Okay, can we go ahead and call up Mr. Washburn, please? Oh, he's on the bridge. Great. All right, go ahead, Mr. Constant. Thank you. Whereas David Washburn has been editor and media manager of The Senior Voice, a publication of the Older Persons Action Group since 1998, and whereas The Senior Voice has grown from a small newspaper serving Anchorage's seniors to a monthly publication run of 11,500 copies and online subscribers serving seniors across Alaska. 
And whereas, the senior voice has been nationally recognized multiple times and was recently awarded Best Publication by the National Mature Market Resource Center, which recognizes the nation's finest marketing communications, educational materials, and programs designed and produced for older adults. And whereas, the Senior Voice not only provides the latest news related to aging issues, it is also entertaining and a joy to read. And whereas, there are many isolated elders in our state who consider their Senior Voice a rare touch with the outside world and their lifeline to the larger community. And whereas, the Senior Citizens Advisory Commission recognized his efforts through a letter of appreciation, now therefore, the Anchorage Assembly recognizes and commends David Washburn for his service to the Senior Voice in Alaska's Seniors, passed and approved by the Anchorage Assembly this ninth day of February, 2021. Mr. Washburn, are you on the phone? Yes, I am. All right. Would you like to speak? Uh, I would just uh, give my humble thanks for this recognition. It's been an honor and a privilege uh, to be able to work for Older Persons Action Group, which has a tremendous history in the community for organizing and advocating for seniors and their families. Uh, I can't say enough about the uh, volunteers, the board members, the directors I've worked for, and the staff and co-workers. It's, it's been truly a privilege. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Next, we have item 10A2, resolution number AR 2021-39, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly recognizing and celebrating February 2021 as Black History Month. What is the will of the body? Move to approve, is that Second. Second. Thank you. Moved and seconded. Is there any opposition? Seeing none, that item is approved. Who's reading? Who's presenting? I'll be reading, Mr. Chair. Great. And before a resolution start, of the Anchorage... Before you start, Ms. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I think we have folks who are here to accept it, so if you folks can come on up. Go ahead, Ms. Alatel. Thank you. A resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly recognizing and celebrating February 2021 as Alaska, or sorry, as Black History Month. Whereas Black History Month was established in 1926 by Carter G. Woodson to draw attention to the experiences and successes of black people in the United States. And whereas Dr. Woodson originally chose the second week of February for Negro History Week because it marks the birthdays of three great Americans, Frederick Douglass, excuse me, W.E.B. Dois, and Abraham Lincoln, and the founding of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, on February 12, 1909. And whereas the 2021 Black History Month theme is the Black Family, Representation, Identity, and Diversity. The Black Family has been a topic of study in many disciplines, history, literature, the visual arts, and film studies, sociology, anthropology, and social policy, and whereas its representation, identity, and diversity of the black family have been referenced, stereotyped, and vilified for the period of enslavement to our own time. The black family offers a rich tapestry of images for exploring the African-American past and present. And whereas it is essential that we acknowledge and are aware of the wide diversity of black organizations that provide an array of perspectives and contributions to the municipality, and that the identity of the black community is as diverse as each person. And whereas, during Black History Month, community celebrations will focus on the achievements, history, wellness, and inclusiveness of the wide diversity of the black community. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Anchorage Assembly that February 2021 shall be recognized and celebrated in the municipality of Anchorage as Black History Month passed and approved by the Anchorage Assembly this ninth day of February, 2021. Welcome. I understand that we have a, a few folks who would like to speak, so go in whichever order you'd like. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you guys for acknowledging uh, Black History Month and the activities and the contributions from our community to the municipality of Anchorage and all of Alaska. And thank you very much. 
Welcome. Hello. I'm Pastor Adrian Richardson, and I represent the Faithful Few. I've been a part of Alaska for over 41 years, and I thank you for acknowledging us as Black History Month, but we're really just black every day, all day, 365, <laughs> proud to be black. And, and the contributions that the black community have made to Anchorage and to Alaska, and we thank you for this honor, but we still have a long way to go, a long way to go for inclusive and not just black people, but all people of color need to be recognized every day. As they walk down the streets, we need to be seen every day. So it's not just Black History Month for us. It's a whole new year to be inclusive for everybody of color. I thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hi. Um, my name is Teresa Lyons, and I'm here tonight representing the Anchorage chapter of the Lynx Incorporated and on behalf of our chapter that we're celebrating our 20th year in Anchorage, as a matter of fact, this year. I just wanna say thank you to the assembly for this honor and recognition. We are really grateful. Um, and we have enjoyed serving the uh, Anchorage community and uplifting uh, people of African descent uh, to be prosperous and to thrive in our great city. And we um, hope to continue to perhaps work with the assembly closer in the coming years. Um, and I think it's important to pause and to recognize the contributions of African Americans in the great state of Alaska. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sil. I represent the Senegambia Association of Alaska. It's one of the many immigrant groups that are, rep uh, that are here in Alaska. Just wanted to thank the assembly for this recognition and uh, hope to work with you guys in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Hi. for the assembly for recognizing the Senegambian Association. Coming with the president, we thank you for recognizing us and we know that we can work together for a commonwealth for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. My name is Vani Gaither, and I am representing the African American Artists of Alaska. We're pretty much a newly formed organization and still trying to gain members so that um, more African American artists are getting a chance to show their artwork throughout Alaska. Thank you very much for the recognition. Thank you. Is there any, anyone else on the phone? I understand we have some folks who may want to speak. Hello, this is Kayla Green, and I am the first vice of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And on behalf of the NAACP, we just want to thank the municipality for this recognition and also look forward to our continued commitment as we work together as a community to not only recognize the great achievements of black African Americans, um, especially in Alaska, but throughout the entire um, U.S. And, out, and outside of the entire country, the world. And we hope that this will be prolonged into something greater than just one month, that this is something that is embraced through all of American history and that uh, all cultures can also embrace. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else on the phone? All right, not hearing anyone else. Thanks everyone for speaking. I, Ms. Salato, you're in the queue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanna thank everyone who attended um, today. I apologize for not being there with you. I'm a little bit ill and you know we're all very precautious at this point in time. Um, I also would like to um, thank um, both of my aides, Andrea and Madison, who worked very hard um, on contacting a large variety of organizations within our community. I believe the last list I have is 16, and I will forward um, that list along with contact information to members. I really encourage you to reach out to these organizations and learn um, from the diversity of viewpoint that so many of them are willing to share. Um, so again, thank you for being there tonight um, and participating with us. Um, happy Black History Month. Thank you. Mr. Constant? Thank you everybody as well for coming in and to the drafter of the resolution. And part of the conversation I had with some folks 
before uh, we got here was what can we do in 2021 in the context of families and black history in, in Anchorage in particular. And so one pathway that I'm endeavoring to move down is finding some funding to create a catalog of all of the neighborhoods and plats in particular that contain restrictive zoning covenants, restrictive covenants of all kinds, um, many of which stated such things as um, this lot may only be sold or alienated to an American of the white race. And so I think it's important for us to contemplate specific manners of uh, living, uh, celebrating our cultural diversity in this town. And one way I hope we'll take on this year, and you'll see it come forward, is to do that, which is create a catalog. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Next, we have item 10A3. Resolution number AR 2021-41, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly recognizing and celebrating February 16th, 2021 as Elizabeth Prachevich Day. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Second, Del. Okay. Moved and seconded. Is there any opposition? Okay. Seeing none, that item is approved. Who's reading, who's presenting? Uh, this is uh, Cameron Perez ready. I'll be reading. Uh, if folks are here to accept this resolution, please join us up in the front. Thank you. We're ready? Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Perez Radio. Oh, thank you. Whereas Alaska Native Sisterhood Grand President Elizabeth Wanamaker Paradovich was born in Petersburg, Alaska, on July 4, 1911, as a member of the Tsuka Adi clan in Raven Moiety of the Slinket Nation, with the Slinket name Ka Kush At, who, which stands, which means person who packs for themselves. Whereas, after being orphaned, Elizabeth was adopted by Andrew and Jean Wanamaker, graduated from Ketchikan High School attended Sheldon Jackson College and Western College of Education, and married Roy Peradovich on December 15, 1931. Whereas seeking greater opportunities, the Peradovich family moved to Juneau, where Elizabeth and Roy encountered discrimination against Alaska Natives in their attempts to secure housing and gain access to public facilities, spurring them to become leaders in the battle for Native rights in Alaska. And whereas leveraging their positions as leaders with the Alaska Native Sisterhood and Alaska Native Brotherhood, Elizabeth and Roy worked to bring attention to the issue of discrimination, lobbying territorial legislature and governor for passage of anti-discrimination legislation. And whereas Elizabeth's compelling, passionate testimony before the Alaska Territorial Senate was instrumental in the passage of the Anti-Discrimination Act of 1945, which provided for equal access to public accommodations in the territory of Alaska and which Governor Gruning signed into law on February 16, 1945. Whereas in 1988, the Alaska legislature designated February 16th as Elizabeth Paradovich Day. And in 2020, the United States Mint issued a $1 coin bearing the image of Elizabeth Paradovich in honor of her legacy of social justice activism, making her the first Alaska native to be honored on United States currency. Now, therefore, the Anchorage Municipality Assembly resolved that February 16, 2021 is designated as Elizabeth Paradovich Day in the Municipality of Anchorage and encourages the community to celebrate the life and legacy of Elizabeth Wanamaker Paradovich, passed and approved by the Anchorage Assembly this ninth day of February, 2021. Welcome. Thank you, Tasha Hotch. I am the local Alaska Native Sisterhood Camp 87 president. We were the proud hosts of the Alaska Native Brotherhood Sisterhood Grand Camp Convention last year. It was the 100th anniversary of the Grand Camp and where the United States Mint came to Anchorage the first time ever to do the presentation of the coin design. And um, things have been a little bit hard with the pandemic, as you guys know, but we will be hosting 
an, a virtual event on the 14th showing um, for the rights of all, the ending of Jim Crow in Alaska, with some discussion afterwards, and then a larger event on the 16th in the evening from 6 to 8, partnering with First Alaskans Institute, Alaska Federation of Natives, and Alaska Pacific University, um, just really highlighting um, the leaders of today that have been inspired by Elizabeth Pradovich. It's really wonderful that our community goes through such efforts to highlight um, our indigenous people and people of color. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, uh, Mr. Constant. Thank you. Just, I wanted to say thank you to Ms. Hotch uh, for coming in and always being a, a very um, strong advocate for youth and for uh, Native rights. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Next, we have item 10A4, AR number 2021-42, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly recognizing February 2021 as Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. Is there any opposition? Seeing none, that item is approved. Uh, before we, we read, uh, let's go ahead and call in um, our folks accepting over the phone. Hello? Hi, this is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. Um, we are about to read the resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly recognizing February 2021 as Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month. Um, so who's going to be reading on the assembly? I will, Mr. Chair. All right, go ahead. Thank you. Whereas teen dating violence is a serious issue that can affect a young person's safety, development, and sense of comfort, it can take many forms, including physical, sexual, emotional, or spiritual. And whereas, according to the 2017 Alaska Youth Risk Behavioral Survey, one in 10 Alaska students had experienced sexual violence during the year. And whereas 8.8% of Anchorage students surveyed had been physically hurt by someone they dated within the past year, and 6.4% were physically forced to perform sexual acts by someone they dated. And whereas Brianna Bree Moore was tragically murdered by her boyfriend in Alaska in 2014 as a result of dating violence, after which her parents worked with the Alaska legislature to pass the Alaska Safe Children's Act, known as Bree's Law. And whereas teens and all persons deserve happy, healthy relationships where conflict is managed without threats and where there is honesty, trust, mutual respect, open communication, and a balance of power dynamic. Now, therefore, the Anchorage Municipal Assembly resolves that February 2021 is designated as Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month in the Municipality of Anchorage. Passed and approved by the Anchorage Assembly this ninth day of February 2021. Thank you. Uh, would you like to speak, uh, sir and ma'am? Uh, yes, this is Cindy Moore. I'm Bree Moore's mother. And I just want to say that I'm extremely grateful to the Anchorage Assembly and the acting mayor for their 100% support for bringing forth this resolution. Um, not only is teen dating violence uh, not only destructive and so prevalent in our community among our teens, but it is a major risk factor for domestic violence in adulthood. And we all know that that's a major problem here in Anchorage and in Alaska. Um, but we all must do our part to promote healthy, nonviolent relationships in our community. And by you guys highlighting this issue through this resolution, you are increasing awareness, which is invaluable. This is an invaluable step to preventing uh, dating violence among our teens in the future. So thank you again. Mrs. Butchmore, Bree's dad. We learned, I learned when I went to Bree's office, her dental office, from her coworkers who hugged me and cried and said, we wish we would have done something. And I said, what do you mean? They said, well, Bree had come in several times with black eyes and I said, well, why didn't she do something? And they, I said, if she was choking, you'd give her the Heimlich maneuver, 
wouldn't you? And they said, yes. But we didn't know what to do, and we were scared, and we were afraid, and we didn't want to interfere, and we didn't know. And that was the first that we had heard that Bree had been abused by her boyfriend, and that was four months after he murdered her. So along with help from you and a lot of other people here in the state, we got the first Bree's law passed in 2015. And the same youth risk behavior survey that you just referred to, within two years of passing that bill, the teen dating violence across the state dropped almost in half. So we've had a lot of help, uh, and we really appreciate the Anchorage Assembly for all the help you've given us. Um, we haven't been before you for probably more than a year, but we, um, we wanted to mention that we are still working on the site uh, selection um, with Anchorage Parks Department for a communication installation. And the purpose in that is to help people like Bree and her friends that don't know what to do, that are in a domestic violence or dating violence situation, to know where they can go to get the help and the resources that they need. So this doesn't happen again. And we just really want to thank you and uh, everybody out there for all this support because it is making a difference and our kids grow up to be adults and Alaska is the number one state in the nation for men murdering women intentionally still. And we want to get that, want to, get that to stop. So thank you very much. Thank you. I have a question for you from Ms. LaFrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, I just wanted to thank Mr. and Mrs. Moore for their advocacy and tremendous work in getting Bree's Law passed. Uh, I know this has not been easy work for so many reasons, but it's so very important. And thank you for helping to make our community safer, especially for young people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Next, we have item 10A5, AR number 2021-43, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly in support of the organization Save Sea Wolf Hockey. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any opposition? Seeing none, that item is approved. Who's reading? Who's presenting? I'll be reading. And then I believe we have some folks in the audience to accept. All right, if you can come on up. Go ahead, Mr. Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly in support of the organization Save Sea Wolf Hockey. Whereas the Sea Wolf Hockey program was first established over 40 years ago. And whereas Sea Wolf Hockey is popular in this community among an estimated 10,000 hockey fans of all ages. And whereas the UA Board of Regents on September 10th, 2020, at the request of the UAA Chancellor, made a decision to eliminate hockey, gymnastics, and alpine skiing, starting with the 2021-22 season. And whereas a caveat was made allowing reinstatement of those programs, if each could raise through private donations, the funding needed to fully support those programs for two years. And whereas the Sea Wolf Hockey Program needs to raise $3 million no later than February 15, 2021. And whereas the organization Save Sea Wolf Hockey was formed last year to raise the funds necessary for UAA Division I hockey to continue. And whereas UAA Division I hockey is one of Anchorage's connections to the lower 48 states and drives interest in Anchorage and Anchorage's many other attractions. And now, therefore, the Anchorage Assembly resolves that Anchorage businesses, corporations, and families who care about our vibrant culture of hockey in Anchorage are strongly encouraged to donate any amount at SaveSeaWolfHockey.com before February 15, 2021, or support them on social media at Save sea Wolf Hockey on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. This resolution shall be effective immediately upon passage and approved by the Assembly. Passed and approved by the Anchorage Assembly this 9th day of February, 2021. Welcome. It was already on, I think. 
Uh, on behalf of Safe Seawolf Hockey, my name is Sean Holman. I'm an alum at the university. Uh, Mr. Chair, the Assembly, Pete Peterson, I, I can't thank you guys enough. Uh, this has been a long road uh, for us uh, the last four or five months. Uh, we were tasked with raising $3 million as it shows up there within this time frame during COVID. It's not been easy. Uh, a lot of businesses, a lot of people, um, they're very cautious with their money as they should be. Uh, these are trying times for you, the Assembly, uh, the state, our government, trying to manage this uh, situation that we're in with the pandemic. We totally understand. We're very um, compassionate to all of this. And in the midst of it, of all of that, the program at the University of Alaska Anchorage, the hockey, uh, as it was mentioned, 40 years running, uh, it was put up as a cut. Uh, to resolve a budget reduction or line item to the state. So we can't, you know, we appreciate you. We can't thank you enough for the support at the municipal level. Uh, we operate here. We, we play our hockey here in the city of Anchorage, uh, but it is a state funded institution. And so we're trying to work with them um, in, in resolving these budgetary items and issues and sustainability in the future. This is going to go a long ways. Uh, we still have time till the 15th of February for those who need to or feel compelled to donate. Um, I don't want to take too much more of your time, but I can't thank you enough. On behalf of Safe Seawolf Hockey, thank you. Ms. LaFrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for being here tonight. It's hard to imagine Anchorage without Seawolf Hockey. Um, how close are you to your goal? Or can you talk a little bit more about, because um, February 15th is pretty close. It is, and I, I, we, we are, we have met our obligation as far as the 2021-2022 operating season. We have pledges uh, that have met that, which means that people can make their payments into, this, into the next year. Uh, the cash is what we were, so I guess to go backwards, they were asked, we were tasked and asked to provide 3 million, 1.5 in cash, 1.5 in pledges. Uh, the, the pledges could be used or utilized in the next year's budget. Uh, this year we're, we're running, we're looking like we're gonna be about one point, we're sitting at about 1.3, uh, today, I believe. I haven't checked the numbers, uh, so the accuracy of that may not be 100%. Uh, we're very close. We're within 200,000, I believe. Um, I don't want to be misquoted on that. Uh, however, we have recent business uh, opportunities and developments that have happened. The Seattle Kraken, they are an NHL franchise uh, due to operate their, their NHL season next year. They have stepped in, uh, donated over 160,000, and wanting to work with the university uh, for long-term sustainability. Uh, Bering Sea Native Corporation has also come to the table and uh, that are willing to, to help try to find more corporate uh, donors. So to answer the question directly, uh, we're sitting at about 1.3 for, for the cash, at 1.5 for the, for the pledges. Great, thanks so much and best of luck to you. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have item 10B1, AR number 2021-44, resolution of the Anchorage Assembly to address Assemblymember Allard's actions and conduct that breach the public trust. What is the will of the body? Move to approve the yes. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Um, Ms. Dolatel, you pulled the item? Um, yes, Mr. Chair, um, and I believe there's uh, an amendment that was uh, sent out as well. There is. I don't know if it's going to be moved. Uh, so we can go ahead and um, deal with that if you'd prefer before we actually um, look at the underlying. Sure, we can go ahead and do, amend do this amendment before I turn it back over to you. Um, so I see a uh, Kennedy amendment number one. Is there a motion? Yes, Mr. Chair. Actually, I would like to move to postpone indefinitely. Second. Okay. All right. Moved and seconded. <laughs> it, we're not going to have those types of interruptions while we are deliberating, please. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and have you uh, speak on that motion, Ms. Kennedy, and then I'll go down the queue. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I move to postpone this because there's actually nothing of value in the therefore portion. Um, so the result of the AR actually accomplishes nothing and, and actually does say that there is no pathway 
um, by which to pursue the goal for, I which, for which I believe the sponsor was creating this AR in the first place. And uh, if you'll indulge me for a minute, I, I think there are just um, an array of negative and undesirable things that would actually come to fruition uh, for bringing forward something like this that would allow the assembly to um, use the ethics uh, committee for these kinds of actions in the future. Um, I think it could set a dangerous precedent because all the negative impacts of this resolution would be to subject all members of this body by all members of this body to a never-ending political attack on each other for whatever appears to be the offense of the day. And believe me, in that department alone, I'm sure there's plenty of fodder to fuel that fire amongst all of us. But that just leads to more divisiveness, ugly rhetoric by members and the public alike, distrust by the public, and even more embarrassment for the assembly, as this entire incident already reflects poorly on this assembly as a whole. And whether any of us likes it or not, we all get lumped together in how people view this body. Additionally, if we give each other the right to do this to each other, we actually circumvent the pathway that's readily available to the constituents for dealing with an assembly member who's not living up to their expectations. And that is the right to submit such a claim to the ethics commissions themselves, uh, the commission itself, and, and more importantly, the right to recall, which is protected in our own code and in, the, in state statutes. So the assembly has no right to interfere with the will of constituents and to disenfranchise voters in that way. So the assembly is not needed in that relationship that already exists. Also, the assembly itself has the right to remove a member of this body. That process is very clearly outlined, it's quite formal, and if I'm not mistaken, would even provide for a member to actually defend themselves with an attorney present. And I think that concept of being allowed to mount a defense is foundational to our system of justice, but it is lacking in this current process that's being suggested. As individuals, we all have the right to seek, seek the counsel of the Ethics Commission for any complaint, but let me point out, the role of the Commission doesn't actually deal with such an animal as breach of the public trust. They typically deal with conflicts of interest and with declaring the value of gifts to employees, which, believe me, some of our employees get offered some pretty amazing gifts, um, so that service is definitely needed. But our Ethics Commission has no guidelines or standards by what determines a breach of public trust, let alone how to weigh that in the balance of whether or not it's been violated. The other thing to keep in mind is that the Ethics Commission has no authority to pass any kind of sentence or to even enforce any kind of remedy. They may have some aspirations as how they would like to be more useful in that realm, but for now they strictly decide if there's a conflict of interest or if a gift is valued beyond the threshold that's allowed. So if anything should be given direction in any, another document without all the political attacks to the commission, um, having those conversations and seeing if they can come up with some standards, and that's, a, that's a reasonable request. So let's postpone this resolution. Let's just chalk this entire incident up to COVID fatigue. And let's on, move on to more professional and productive conversations that will actually make us more worthy of our elected positions and certainly more worthy of the public trust. And we all agree, I believe we all agree on this body that that is incredibly important. So this resolution doesn't accomplish um, what I believe it was really intended to do, or I hope it was intended to do. And so I would hope that we would um, put this one to bed, move forward with some better suggestions about how we can actually allow the Ethics uh, Commission to um, be more of a, uh, a positive benefit to the public who may want to use them in the future uh, for any complaint that they may want to file. And I guess one more last thing, Mr. Chair, I might add that um, once we get through all this, I would like to make the suggestion that the entire assembly do some training on anger management. Um, and I say that a little tongue in cheek, but believe me, there are times when we can all use some of those pointers that I know is very prevalent in that kind of a training. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Perez Verdia on the motion to Folks, we're not going to be doing in interruptions or disruptions while we are doing 
uh, deliberation. So please refrain from that. If I have to uh, pause our meeting again, then I'm going to start kicking people out who I see are interrupting or disrupting our meeting while we are doing deliberation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, um, Mr. Just a, a few, thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Please continue. Okay. Thank you. Um, just a few, few comments. Um, one, I, like many of my colleagues, I have received many emails and phone calls about this is, issue, and, it, and it's clear to most of us that we are existing in a uh, highly divided and toxic uh, environment, both at a national level and a local level. Um, and, uh, and, and I know that there's a lot of people that feel like that this is an effort uh, to do things uh, that, that are political. Um, I, I'm not sure that that's the intention here. I, I think that, that the intention here is in some ways good because it's an, an intention to speak up and to stand up to things that are racist or that are, um, you know, hate, hate speech and that, and that it's important that when we see it that we speak up and, and, and we stand up to it. Um, I, I was not part of the exchange during this, this thing that happened on face, Facebook, um, and I don't know the intention of this m m member or the purpose of, of why she posted what she did. I, I don't know what was in her, her heart. Um, and so, you know, it's tough to, uh, to, to judge that. Um, I know that it, it's clearly, um, the, 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 the license plate is clearly hate, hate speech and that any effort to, to defend that is wrong. Um, but I don't think this is the right pro process for us, for us to go through either. I think that, um, that what, what, what pains me is that we need a clear process. We need a stronger code of conduct and we need a process to hold members accountable, all members accountable for their, for their behavior during meetings and, out, and outside of meetings. Um, I want to just make sure that I say clearly that, that it's important that, that I can condone the, the license plates and, and, this, and, the, and the hate speech around that. Um, but I think it's important that, um, that we, we post, postpone this. I think it's important that we um, uh, clearly state that the actions and the, st the statements um, from this mem member were, were ill-informed and wrong. Um, um, but, I, but the most important thing for me is that I feel like that uh, there has been a number of things that have happened over the last year, and we don't have a, a proper process to address it. And, um, and so I would really encourage the, the body to, to, to consider going back and trying to find and then develop a stronger code of conduct and a process to hold mem members accountable. So when this happens in the future, we have a thoughtful, well-laid-out process to de 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 deal with it. So I'm going to support the, uh, the motion to postpone in, in, in indefinitely. And I want to thank uh, the bravery of member uh, Zalatel for bringing this forward because I think it's important that we point out that it is wrong um, and that, that that needs to be, to, to, to be said. But I don't believe that this is the right way to address it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ms. Zalatel? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I'd like to start out by um, acknowledging that um, we do get lumped together. And my concern and the reason I brought this resolution was, um, you know, I could have simply spoken about the offensive comments, which I did. But what sh shocked me was the total disregard for the responsibilities that we hold to the public around the use of social media when we do it in our official capacity. Um, and when we do use social media in our official capacity, it comes with responsibility and uh, rules. And deciding to block access or delete the public and, or its comments from that forum is a disrespect for them and for the process of democracy that we should be expected to honor as all members. It undermines that process, which I believe breaks the public trust. Um, in going through the drafting of this resolution and endless conversations with counsel, I very quickly ran up against the limits of our ethics code and the ethics board and what it can do, what um, stepwise responses we may have as a body might be available. I um, conducted considerable research about what other jurisdictions are doing. 
And so I think we need to make that commitment that we're going to explore what may be available in the future and that we should really take another look at the ethics code, which was last revised in 2017. Um, and we've since been provided pretty clear guidance, particularly around the use of social media in official capacities and what that means. So um, I will support the motion to postpone indefinitely, but will not drop this issue around making sure we respect the process and follow the rules that we commit to um, when we have official forums. And I think it's really important that we engage in that conversation around what co whether that's a code of conduct or something else. <clears throat> it's a conversation that needs to be had. Um, and it's a conversation I didn't know need to be had until um, it really came into stark relief with the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. So I just want to talk a little bit more broadly about the situation I've found myself in as chair for some time. Over the last several months as chair of the assembly, I've often been asked by constituents about various forms of disciplinary actions I can take against assembly members. Over the month, uh, months, the list has grown of different assembly members some would like action taken against. My answer has been consistent and in two parts. First, there are really no tools available to me or the assembly body to do what is asked. And second, we have an appointed body, the Board of Ethics, which, which can investigate these matters. This answer has never been satisfactory to those appealing directly to me as the chair. In the past, the assembly has, as an example, made the decision to censure another member. I've only heard of once as an example of this type of disciplinary action, and that was from a different body with different legal advice being given. Without an adequate process and code of conduct that is detailed and described in policy, it makes it difficult for this body to take action when asked by our constituents. Whether or not to take action is another conundrum to untangle. But for my part, I appreciate Ms. Alice for bringing this forward for us to consider. And on a final note, I look forward to the day when I receive fewer requests for disciplinary actions to be taken against my colleagues. And any help that y'all can give on this would be much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Weddleton. Well, thanks. You know, I, we all have uh, ample opportunities and, and we um, erroneously take advantage of them to say stupid things that are wrong and dumb and clumsy and miss opportunities to say right things um, every week, every day. And I would, I'm not comfortable at all with us taking pot shots at each other up here. Um, we have to work together, get to work together, and that will not help us. And ultimately, we're not the bosses of us. The bosses of us are the voters, and the voters have plenty of opportunity. <laughs> voters have plenty of opportunity to kick us out. I mean, every three years or through the recall process. And, and even beyond that, you know, nothing, you know, these things aren't, we're very public. We're out there. Things we put on Facebook, you get to see, and we hear back. And we hear back through lots of forums. You know, people tell us we were wrong, or you were stupid, and don't say that. Um, the feedback is there, and the message when we do something stupid is there, and the education that happens. So, you know, this is not, we shouldn't be pay, taking pot shots at each other. Voters have that power. Thanks. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote on the motion to postpone indefinitely. Excuse me, Chair. I yes, Ms. Haller. I forgot to get in queue. Oh, go ahead, Ms. Haller. Thank you. I just wanted to say that there was no violation of the municipal, municipal code, ethics, rules, or of law. I have always and will continue to unequivocally denounce racism 100%. I have never defended racism in any form, regardless of what fantasy members of this body or the media attempt to portray. This is a pathetic attempt to create division within our community for political gain. And in the process, the assembly is wasting time and municipal resources. I think there are tens of thousands of members in our community who would appreciate the body actually doing their job instead of pushing a hyper-political agenda and wasting taxpayer money. The fact is this body 
is entertaining this nonsense demonstrates how out of touch some are. None of the comments that I've made had anything to do with supporting racism were made in my, and were not made in my official capacity. I do not now, nor have I ever, supported racism in any manner. And just because Ms. Solitel says, it doesn't make it true. I ask Ms. Solitel to stop her fixation on me and to please focus on her constituents. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, have one person left in the queue and then we're going to vote. Mr. Constant. Thank you. I have to agree with the sentiment that just because somebody says something does not mean it is true. We have seen ample examples of that in the last two weeks. That testimony that I just heard really cuts against, cuts against hard the reality that I have to agree with my peers who have spoken that this isn't within the realm of what we should be acting on at this time. But the fact is that just the statements that were expressed by the member from Eagle River demonstrate that individual's lack of understanding of the impact of her words to the world. But thankfully, those words did circle the entire globe of planet Earth with that member's name attached because the record will always reflect that reality. Now, I personally have been called upon for personal commentaries made on my private Facebook pages, and I tend to agree with the member from Eagle River that these should not be subject of three-minute testimonies by campaign managers for the Mike Bronson campaign who come forward to make political hate to distract from the facts that were before us. Now, I think that the reality of the situation here is that the, the code and the charter make it very hard, very hard to remove a member for political gain. The idea that we could just simply, with a supermajority, remove somebody is a fantasy that is something the legislature might be able to do, and even the Congress. But the process here established has 10 or 15 different steps that involve multiple parties outside of state jurisdictions. The framers of our code and charter decided they did not want politics to be the defining factor of this body. But instead, they wanted the business of the people. And so for that end, I'm going to join, hopefully, a unanimous vote to step back from this brink and not create a precedent that isn't wise and certainly is cuts against what has uh, been, been written. But the fact is, people have asked, what was the difference between me this summer and this member now? Well, I recognized my wrong. I made a genuine apology, and it was accepted. That's the difference. With that, I urge a no vote. Thank you. All right, Ms. Kennedy, then I would like us to vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to point out that one of the things that I think has been important in this conversation uh, that, that at least I've had with a couple of our attorneys is to have a better understanding of how an assembly member can and or shouldn't uh, use their Facebook page. And one of the biggest questions uh, that I've had is what deems a Facebook page an official page? Because a lot of people have said we've been using our official assembly member Facebook pages. And as far as I'm concerned, I don't have an official Facebook page. I do have a Facebook page that says Crystal Kennedy assembly member. But that's not an official page, uh, I guess, according to my definition of it. So in other words, we probably need uh, a little bit of a a primer on, on really what constitutes being official and, and to what extent we have a responsibility to host that site in a certain way. And, uh, you know, I would, I, I'm not a big Facebook post user. There might be one person besides me in this whole room that's looked at my Facebook page, and that's okay. But, um, but my point is that uh, if I want to shut it down, I, I want to be able to shut it down without somebody saying, oh, now you're violating freedom of speech um, requirements. So anyway, so I, I think that we will have some of that, uh, um, some of those guidelines coming forward here in the new, near future because some of our attorneys are looking at that question for us. So thank you, and with that, I would, um, encourage a yes vote. Thank you. Thank you. 
Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote on the motion to postpone indefinitely. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Dunbar? Yes. Mr. Constant? Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia? Yes. Ms. Zolotel? Yes. That item is postponed indefinitely, uh, 10 to 0. Next, we have item 10D3, Assembly Memorandum Number AM78-2021, <laughs> Cooperative Purchase from Western Peterbilt for two 2022 Peterbilt 520 Library Commercial Front Load Dumpster Trucks. Mr. Vice Chair? Move to postpone indefinitely. Is there a second? Second. second. And I'll speak to that really briefly. This was at the request of the administration. I believe there was an error in the document and they'll be bringing something new to us. The same rationale goes for the next item, item 10D5. Uh, is there any further discussion on the motion to postpone indefinitely? Seeing none, is there any opposition to the motion? Okay, seeing none, that motion is approved. Uh, next, we have item 10D5, Assembly Memorandum Number AM82-2021, Cooperative Purchase and Service and Maintenance Agreement from NC Machinery for one 2021 Caterpillar 966 MXC wheel loader. Thank you. Um, Mr. Vice Chair. Moved to postpone indefinitely. Second. Moved and seconded. Same rationale as the previous one. Is there any discussion on the motion? Is there any opposition to the motion? Okay, seeing none, that item is postponed indefinitely. Next, we have item 10F4, AIM 25-2021, emergency powers award, emergency procurement awarded under AMC 7.20.090. What is the will of the body? And for clarification, it's a motion to uh, accept. Move to accept, Zalto. Is there a second? Second. second. Moved and seconded. Uh, Ms. Alatel, you pulled this item? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you to um, the administration for providing additional information with regard uh, to this item. I just wanted to flag on it for the administration for a later follow-up that um, I see that there is a request to keep track of uh, certain information of the uh, residents uh, each day. Um, the question becomes, can we just be using the HMIS, the Homelessness Response Systems database to do that and uh, take care or take out that intermediate, intermediate step? Um, as you all have heard me speak a lot of times, um, is the frustration, <clears throat> is the concern that we aren't keeping our data up to date, particularly um, with regard to uh, non-congregate locations and where we do have a homelessness service provider providing the services um, under contract, it would make good sense to just utilize the system that's in place. It will be just as important for inflow as it will be for outflow and connection with housing programs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, just to be clear, are you asking for a member of the administration to respond? Sorry, no, I just wanted to flag it and okay. we can um, talk about it more later if we need, but I think it's important to also make all members of the body aware of that because it is a key piece of uh, what we've been talking about with regards to uh, making sure we're getting accurate data. Okay, thank you. Is there any further discussion on the item? Seeing none, members may proceed to vote on the motion to accept. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Dunbar? Yes. Mr. Constant? Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia? Yes. Ms. Zolotel? Yes. That item is accepted 10 to 0. With that, that completes our consent agenda. We're going to go ahead and take a regular 20-minute break. When we come back, we will come back to item 11A, uh, which 
for reference, this public hearing was closed on this item back in January. So it'll just be the deliberation and vote. Our first public hearing item will be item 14A. Thank you. folks on the phone and um, folks in person. Uh, we're gonna be extending the break um, by likely another 20 minutes so that we can uh, work on a technical issue. Uh, thanks everyone for your patience. We will be back here soon.
We're going to get started here in a minute. started again. All right, so next we have before us item 11A, ordinance number AO 2020-132, an ordinance of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly amending Anchorage Municipal Code Chapter 12.40 to specify that electronic smoking devices sold to hemp retailers registered with the state of Alaska are excluded from the excise tax on tobacco products. Thank you. Um, so the public hearing on this item was closed on January 14th of this year. An action was postponed uh, to today. Um, Ms. LaFrance, if you could speak to your intention. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the intent is to reopen the public hearing because there were three people who had requested testimony. They had believed that the, um, based on last time when we had public hearing for this item that it was continued over to today. So if we could let those three people provide their testimony, it would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, from my understanding from uh, talking with Assembly Council, um, we, we can't officially reopen the public hearing on this item as it does not meet the public hearing notice requirements, but we can unofficially uh, have public testimony and hear from these three individuals along with anyone else who would like to speak on this item. Um, so unless there is objection, which I will wait a second to hear any objection. Yeah, Mr. Chair. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Constant. Thank you. So I don't know what about this informally opening a public hearing business or having anyone who wants to be heard, but isn't it possible for the member to invite up those individuals for some basis on their expertise so that they can speak to us on that basis as opposed to in the context of a somewhat squishy public hearing. Ms. LaFrance, would you like to speak to that? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I suppose that would be an option. I don't know if all three persons who signed up are necessarily um, experts on the subject. I mean, I would prefer to have them just testify for three minutes and then move on. So, okay, then I won't object. It's just pretty squishy. Thank you. Um, sorry, Mr. Constant, I, I didn't hear what you said. Did you, did you say that you objected? No, so I said then I won't object and I will just okay. uh, go with Ms. LaFrance's intuition. Got it. Yeah, and again, we can just limit it to those three folks who were signed up to testify and then we can move on from there since the public hearing was closed. Mr. Presvidia, and, and then I'd like to see if we can move on. Okay, I, I, I think you answered my, my question. It's your intention to just open up public testimony for those three people un, informally, so it's not actually going to happen, but just for those three, and then we're going to move on. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct, because the public okay. hearing was thank, already thank closed on this item. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I appreciate the clarification. Okay. Thank you. All right, um, so hearing no objection, then we're going to go ahead and hear from these uh, three folks, and then we will move on 
uh, with deliberation and vote on the and discussion on the item. So first we have Mr. Niall Williams. Reach Niall Williams. Sorry, I have missed. You. Next, we have Miss Emily Neenan. Hello, this is Emily. Hi, Miss Neenan. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are uh, on unofficial public testimony for item 11A, ordinance number AO 2020-132. You have three minutes. Welcome. Much appreciated. Thank you. For the record, my name is Emily Neenan. I'm the Alaska Government Relations Director for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. I had withheld my testimony last time um, just because I knew that there was some continued work being done on this and trying to figure out um, a way to tackle uh, the goals of the ordinance. Um, and the only thing I'll add here is it does take, uh, I'm coming at this from the comprehensive approach to um, youth prevention issues. Um, there's a few things that are that remain of concern to me. Uh, we know when it comes to electronic smoking device use, um, flavors are the thing that attracts the kids. Um, and the nicotine is the thing that keeps them um, going back. Um, when I have spoken with Rob Carter from the Div State Division of Agriculture, um, there isn't any particular restriction on flavors uh, in these products. And the other thing that um, I, he and I discussed was the fact that they're not testing for nicotine now. He was interested in maybe taking that up since there is a lot of evidence around the country of um, liquids containing nicotine, even though they're labeled not uh, not to, at least in the um, on the regular vape side. Uh, the other issue that I have with um, the the whether it's CBD or whatever other kinds of products that would fall under this industrial hemp exemption is that they are not age restricted. So some of them may be sold in age restricted locations, but they don't have to be um, sold in an age-restricted location. And for those reasons, I just uh, wanted to raise those ongoing concerns. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Ms. Valeria Delgado. Hello, this is Valeria. Hi, Ms. Delgado. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on unofficial public testimony for item 11A, ordinance number AO 2020-132. You have three minutes. Welcome. Um, good evening, Anchorage Assembly. My name is Valeria Delgado from Northeast Anchorage, and I'm opposing this ordinance, which excludes hemp products from the tobacco tax. It is important to protect young people from harmful products, as we will only be able to test certain um, products in this um, CBD products, we won't know the extent of the chemicals that are found in this, including nicotine. It is important that we keep taxing and continue to protect this um, young people when we fully know um, all of the chemicals that are present in um, CBD products. Thank you for your time um, and good evening. Thank you. Let's go ahead and try Mr. Williams one last time. Reach Niall Williams. Sorry. Okay. Um, so we're going to go ahead and move on to deliberation on the item. 
Just want to double check with the clerk. Um, I understand that we don't have a motion on the floor. Okay. Uh, so, so what is what is the will of the board? Move to approve. Yeah, Mr. Constant, move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. I believe we have an amendment, Constant LaFrance Amendment number one. Is there a motion? <coughs> move amendment number one. Second. Moved and seconded. Which of the sponsors would like to speak to it? I can speak to it, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Thank you. So, um, as outlined in the AM for this AO, when we debated um, the tax for electronic devices, electronic smoking devices, we wanted to, you know, make it very clear that it only pertained to tobacco and nicotine. And um, sorry, I'm getting into the EO piece, Mr. Chair, but or the AO piece, and the reason why that we're talking about hemp. But what this amendment does is just clarify and modify the language so that it's clear that any registered hemp retail establishments that sell um, tobacco-related products containing nicotine are not exempt from the tax. Thanks. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? Mr. Constant. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I only saw it kind of earlier today, and I agree with what it does and, and how it does it mostly. But just for the record, I want to state that the, the amendment, in some ways, if you look really closely at the language, asserts that <clears throat> the stores that are selling CBD-related products but no tobacco are selling tobacco products but are exempt. And it's just a weird oddity of language that couldn't figure a way around that this satisfied the tax division and the legal division that it won't do anything bad, but at the same time, there's kind of a, an optical issue there. And so I'm not going to oppose this. I support it, but I just wanted in the record that it doesn't create CBD vendors as tobacco vendors. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I have a feeling that this is getting rather convoluted. And um, so, so I guess I'm just looking for some more clarification about what this really will do. Um, just because I know this is very complicated in terms of who sells these products. I mean, this we could be talking about grocery stores. And um, so anyway, um, I guess, like I said, I'm looking for some a little more clarification uh, in terms of what this really does. So thank you. Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Mr. Constant. So, Ms. Kennedy, the simple action that it does is it ensures that any vendor of CBD products who does not also sell tobacco products is exempted from this tax. And so, it, it effectively, it leaves the CBD industry in their own universe outside of this. If we don't pass this whole ordinance, then they become taxed under the tobacco tax scheme, which is, just doesn't make sense. And so the specific ordinance, excuse me, the specific amendment here ensures that the individual businesses who are selling CBD are also not selling tobacco. If they are, then they're taxed on all of it. Thank you, Mr. Constant. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And uh, just a reminder uh, to help out with folks on the phone, if we can just make sure that we are speaking closer to the mic and um, projecting a little bit more, that would help for folks on the phone. Um, any other discussion on the amendment? Okay. Hearing none, members may proceed to vote on the amendment. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Dunbar? Yes. Mr. Constant? Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia? Yes. Ms. Zolotel? Yes. That amendment is approved 10 to 0. Uh, we're now uh, back to the main motion. Ms. LaFrance? Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
So hopefully everyone has a copy of the memorandum. I know that I think only part of it may have been in the binder, but it's available online as well. Um, so I just want to start that this, we're here taking a look at this change regarding hemp because of what came up during the debate on taxing electronic smoking devices uh, back in November, I believe. And the issue of hemp products, industrial hemp was raised, how can we carve out those products in the way that we did for marijuana products because the uh, goal of the tax was to for it to be directed at wholesalers of um, nicotine and tobacco products. Um, especially since there's now an industrial hemp regulation program, the URL is on the back of the AM at the state level. However, I have to say this has proven to be more complicated than it initially seemed. And um, honestly, I, I'm leaning towards right now not supporting the ordinance, the co-sponsors are aware, but there are a number of hemp products, um, mostly they're associated with the wellness community and for health purposes, but there are some derivatives, you know, that can create a feeling of inebriation. On the one hand, marijuana is highly regulated, but um, hemp is not. There aren't age restrictions, and we do know that this, the state doesn't test for nicotine. The amendment does help clarify the focus, but I don't know how to um, amend the ordinance in a way to address some of these concerns. And then I believe that um, this is, you know, this is a fair policy decision for us to take up. There is a lack of um, federal regulation that I think makes it a little bit challenging. And if this does pass, we need to watch this carefully because it's a, it's a new area. And the health department, um, was unable to provide a policy recommendation just because of, of the lack of information. So that's um, my full disclosure on this ordinance, and I look forward to hearing you know, where other members of the body are leaning in regards to it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Weddleton? Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm going to oppose this whole thing. And, you know, when we looked at the original um, the thing to tax e-cigs, and I had an amendment to exempt the marijuana shops. And, and the reason there was partly they're highly regulated. You can't go in there if you're under 21. And they're already taxed. So, you know, it seemed like, you know, taxing for the device that's used often to, um, you know, smoke marijuana and the various forms it comes in, um, that, that was the connection that I had. So moving this into hemp and CBD and so on, those, um, that, that just creates a huge loophole and, it, and they're not already taxed like the marijuana is. So, you know, I think you, what you'll see is with the high tax on e-cigarettes at the shops that have been selling and traditionally do, you're going to see a lot of shops opening it up that sell CBD oil, selling the all whole variety of e-cig tools and um, whatever it is, e-smoking equipment. Um, because they get by without having to pay the tax and they will pull all the business and, and we're back where we started. And it's just too big of a loophole and I, and I just, it, I mean the connection that's made in the AM with the amendment um, regarding marijuana shops um, doesn't make the connection that I certainly intended when I kind of made that amendment or offered that amendment, thanks. Right, so I urge a no vote. Thank you. Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm gonna urge a yes vote for almost the exact same reasons that John is urging a no vote, which is sort of humorous. But, you know, in that e-cigarette debate, um, I was one of the folks who felt we should not be taxing the independent e-cigarette devices. We, we should be taxing the, um, the underlying fluid or the, the things that contain nicotine or the, the, the vapes that were sort of of a piece. Um, but the, the independent uh, electronic devices, I felt we were sweeping up too many that could potentially be used for other things. And I, my colleagues, obviously, that, um, that effort to, to amend that portion failed. And so we did impose that tax, although it was a, a close vote. And my understanding from the folks that voted yes to impose that tax, or I should say, remove the exemption from the tobacco tax, um, they 
sort of assured us that this would not go beyond tobacco products. And, and, and so this is an effort to make sure that the ordinance that we passed um, and the provision that I opposed but still passed doesn't sweep up more unintended devices. Um, so I, I urge a yes vote. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think I'm going to oppose this, too, just because I said I know it's gotten, gotten pretty convoluted and complicated. And from what I'm hearing um, from uh, the Agriculture Division of DNR is they do believe that there's a loophole being created here. But they also suggest that there might be a way to fix this. It's complicated. But I would suggest that we either postpone this or vote it down and let that conversation continue on and let those specifics that might fix this actually be worked out. So um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Constant. Thank you. I, too, urge your support of this item. Uh, the original item was removing the exemption, as Mr. Dunbar noted, of uh, certain products that weren't taxed previously, which are the vaping products for the tobacco industry. But without passing this, that puts a lie to the previous item of removing the exemption as the action. It actually becomes levying a tax. Levying a tax on an entirely new unassociated industry that heretofore has not been incorporated underneath those sections of the code. And so make no mistake that without passing this, you have levied a tax. And so that's one aspect of this that I think people need to grapple with. So industries that don't ever and have never sold tobacco will suddenly be required to uh, sign up with the tax division and pay for their products and get everything addressed in, as a tax entity. Second, uh, people do use these products for healthcare. And while um, the science is certainly emerging, it's been squelched for a century, um, it's coming and it's coming fast, and these products have proven track record of value to members of the community. And so uh, we're literally levying a tax on a product that people find help from that doesn't have the long history of being a toxic and poisonous and deadly uh, substance. And so um, there's a converse argument to what Ms. Kennedy made, and that is uh, if we pass this exemption, we don't levy a new tax, and we can readdress the issue as the regulatory schemes improve with the state of Alaska. Um, I think that I'm a little bit ashamed that we didn't keep dealing with this then. And I, I will have learned this as a lesson not to postpone for later what promises are made that we'll deal with this later because in the end, they probably won't be and you'll lose votes along the way is what it feels like. And so I do urge your support and I hope that we don't incorporate all of these little well, that's not a lot of them, a handful of little uh, stores into our tobacco tax program unnecessarily. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Zolotel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I had a question, and it was with regard to about how many uh, retail establishments are we talking about, and then within that number of retail establishments, do we know how many of them would now be... Uh, not exempted with the amendment because they sell tobacco-related products containing nicotine. Um, I heard Mr. Constant just say a handful, but I wonder if there is a number associated with that. Who would like to respond? I can. I believe it's six or seven in this, in this town. It could be a little bit more, but some of them actually do have a connected licensed facility. So I, I believe it's, it's six or seven. Few. Um, and really, I, I see just three or four that are strictly CBD stores. And 100% of them would be included. OK, thank you. May I um, just follow up with a quick comment, Mr. Chair? Go ahead. Um, thank you. I appreciate um, the amendment that's come forward. I feel um, that to the extent that there is the belief that there's a loophole, it is like the head of a needle. It is very narrow. Um, and for that reason, I will uh, support this. I don't think it is one that will um, contribute to the concerns of the underlying ordinance in a large way um, or um, give an exemption to a, a, a significant 
part of uh, the retailers that would otherwise um, have been taxed. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote on the main motion. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Dunbar? Yes. Mr. Constant? Yes. Mr. Presbridia? Yes. Ms. Zolotel? Yes. That item is approved six to four. Next, we have item 14A. Before I open up that item, so for, for testimony on public hearing items, please direct your comments to the assembly or the chair. Please give your name at the start of your testimony. You will have three minutes to testify. Your comments must remain on the topic of the matter before us and personal attacks are not appropriate. I may interrupt you if you do not follow these rules for testimony. In addition, audience members are asked to avoid clapping or other disruptions during public testimony. Last questions asked in your testimony may be addressed during deliberation. I will, work, I will as chair, work to maintain decorum at this meeting and ask for your assistance. With that, we are on item 14A, ordinance number AO 2021-11, an ordinance authorizing the disposal by competitive bid of Heritage Land Bank parcel 1-074B, legally described as Tract 2, Carroll Creek Subdivision. Public testimony is now open on this item. Let's go ahead and try Mr. Williams one more time, see if he picks up. Reach Niall Williams. Sorry. Okay. All right. That ends our phone testimony. Um, would anyone like to testify in person? Anyone at all? Seeing and hearing no one, public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Moved to approve. Moved to approve. Constant. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on this item? Seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Dunbar? Yes. Mr. Constant? Yes. Mr. Presbridia? Yes. Ms. Zolotel? Yes. That item is approved 10 to 0. Next, we have item 14B, ordinance number AO 2021-16, an ordinance authorizing and providing for the issuance of not to exceed 110 million in aggregate principal amount of tax anticipation notes. John, wave reading. All right, wave reading. Thank you. Public testimony is now open on this item. We don't have anyone on the phone list. Would anyone like to testify? Anyone at all? Seeing and hearing no one, public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Moved to approve. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on this item? Seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Dunbar? Yes. Mr. Constant? Yes. Mr. perez Verdia. Yes. Ms. Zolotel. Yes. That item is approved 10 to 0. Next, we have item 14C, ordinance number AO 2021-18, an ordinance to amend Anchorage Municipal Code 4.60.100A to make changes to the requirements for public transit advisory board members. Public testimony is now open on this item. We don't have anyone on our phone list. Would anyone like to testify? Welcome.
My name is Eugene Carl Haberman, Alaska resident for 33 years approximately. 20 of those years in Anchorage resident, currently Master Valley resident. Um, I'll be speaking on the subject of this and my familiarity in attending these meetings pre-COVID time. And uh, it alarms me that um, the key to this whole thing that's being requested is to change the, uh, the makeup of the, uh, the body. And due to the difficulty of getting the requirements dealing with uh, this, this disability, they uh, make an exception here and says, okay, if you can't get that, represent agencies who serve disabled populations as an exception. Um, give me a break. I mean, uh, the law dealing with this disability goes back many decades, federal, and define Anchorage going in the direction. I'm saying, well, we're having trouble getting the makeup dealing with that to represent that group. Therefore, let's change it around and agencies can be the exception to do the makeup. Excuse me, no. You're walking away for your responsibility dealing with that issue and I'm really deeply concerned. I strongly oppose you to change the wording on that and do your, do your uh, proper steps to making sure that you comply with this. Now to the respect to the attending those meetings pre-COVID, a lot of people attended those meetings. It's a large group. It's upstairs in the city mayor's conference room pre-COVID time. There was a lot of interest. And I was alarmed frequently the, the process not being followed. And the members of the public were very encouraged of my presence there and thankful I was there. But COVID time has created a situation where your anchorage has gone to a situation where they making excuses, which there's no excuse because you should be more involved in connecting with the people. And a show you example is simply notification. If you look at the notification page on the Burroughs site for this meeting, which is, I believe, the 11th, there's no notice for that. You've got to go to another area on that website, and you'll see it there. So in reality, there's a lack of consistency even for the notice of this meeting, of this group, that you're already saying we're having trouble connecting, getting the makeup, therefore let's change the legislation, but you can't even do proper notices. Thank you very much. My time is done. Thank you for your testimony. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Anyone at all? Seeing and hearing no one, public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go ahead and go through the queue, starting with uh, Mr. Weddleton. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm sympathetic to this. You know, we have um, hundreds up to, I think, 600 people or positions on boards and commissions in Anchorage that look at a whole variety of things that we deal with. If you look one, just two items ago, it was a fairly major thing, a sale of city land that had gone through the Heritage Land Bank Advisory Commission, gone through the public process for their five-year plan. Um, the people on that commission has huge influence on things before they even get to us. They're, they're, um, so here's another one that's a Public Transit Advisory Commission, and they're having trouble recruiting people. And it, it's a shame because people want to be involved a lot of what we do, the heavy lifting has already been done by those boards and commissions before they get to us. Those people have real influence on what goes on in the city by taking part in those things. Um, so uh, anyway, that's my little plug for people to take a look at the boards and commissions that are available and consider um, getting a seat on there. You have real influence and you will learn a whole lot about how the city works. Um, and I urge support, thanks. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess I have a question or two about this too. And one would be, uh, how long has it been since there has been a disabled person sitting on this uh, board? How long have they had to go without representation on this board from somebody who's actually uh, a member of the disabled community? Because it looks like we're supposed to have two 
uh, from, from that population on this committee, and um, it appears that that's not happening and maybe hasn't been for a while. So I would just be interested in hearing a little bit of history. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Acton, are you on the phone? Ms. Acton? Ms. Henderson, do you have anyone else who could respond? Mr. Chair, this is Jason Bockenstedt. Um, I'm happy to take a crack at this. My understanding is that uh, it has been well over a year um, since we have had anyone that has uh, met the disabled criteria that um, has applied and or uh, sought a seat on uh, this board. Thank you, and I, I guess then a follow-up question, Mr. Thank you, and I don't know if Mr. Bach said if you can actually ask this, but or answer this, but I wanted to ask what kind of impact does that have on the workings of the committee when a board is two members short like that? Thank you. Yeah, through the through the chair, Assembly Member Kennedy, uh, certainly it, it it does have uh, an impact, um, particularly um, you know in the age of uh, COVID in that, um, you know, for a variety of reasons, sometimes some of the other members can't make a monthly meeting. And if you're already down two members because you can't fill the seat, um, some commissions do have difficulty um, reaching a quorum um, to even be able to meet uh, on a monthly basis. And that's something that we would like to try to avoid. And that is why uh, this ordinance was was put forward because we we believe that having the the type of representation that uh, is envisioned by um, you know having at least somebody that works for you know an organization that represents the disabled um, will still get at the some of the core issues that uh, I know the the transit department is really interested in in knowing more about, which is how can they provide a better service to those that, that are disabled. Thank you, Mr. Boxted. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ms. Zolotel? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have an amendment, uh, lines 22 to 23. Instead of what it reads, it should read, members shall be individuals experiencing disabilities or represent agencies who serve people experiencing disabilities. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. Can you uh, state that one one more time, and then please explain the amendment? Sure, I'll state it one more time. It's also been emailed to the clerk. Um, it should read: Members shall be individuals experiencing disabilities, or represent agencies who serve people experiencing disabilities. The reason for the amendment is people first language. We do it in a lot of different areas within the municipality, and there should be no exception. Thanks. Thank you. Is there any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, members may proceed to vote on the amendment. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Dunbar? Yes. Mr. Constant? Yes. Mr. Presverdia? Yes. Ms. Zalatel? Yes. That amendment is approved 10 to 0. We're now in the main motion. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, members may proceed to vote on the main motion. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Dunbar? Yes. Mr. Constant? Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia? Yes. Ms. Zolotel? Yes. That item is approved 10 to 0. Next, we have item 14D, ordinance number AO 2021-19, an ordinance of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly temporarily waiving Anchorage Municipal Code Title 16 permit fees for 2021 for the hospitality industry and certain other food permits used in response to the COVID-19 public health emergency. Uh, public testimony is now open on this item. Um, let's go ahead and start with phone testimony before I do that, Mr. Dunbar, I see you wanted to get in the queue. I, 
sorry, Mr. Chair, that was, um, no, uh, I'll, I'll get in the queue after public testimony. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so first on the phone, we have uh, Ms. Schild. Hi, this is Christiane. Hi, Ms. Shield. Uh, this is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on public testimony for item 14D, ordinance number AO 2021-19. You have three minutes. Welcome. Um, is this the one on the temporary waiving of food permit fees? Yes, this is regarding the food permit fees. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to say I'm Christiane Shield. I uh, am represented by Weddleton and LaFrance. And while it sounds lovely, allowing restaurants to keep their fees to do food business, a little over 600,000 in fees unpaid to the city is laughable, in my opinion, especially compared to the loss of revenue, paid wages, livelihoods that your work as assembly members have caused the city businesses. You continue to use ambiguous words without precise definitions. You say in here, some businesses closing, some workers laid off, on restaurant economic impact, you should own up to the damage you've created. More than 75 businesses are gone. How many employees for those businesses? How many companies provide services and goods to those closed businesses that now no longer have that revenue? You might not have realized it when all this started, but you can't ignore the collateral damage that you have created. How will this help those businesses that are already shut down? Minuscule unemployment benefits won't replace their lost wages, their storefronts, their employees, or pay their debts. How about next year when you have all these EOs to AOs going on indefinitely? Will you propose this again for another year just to throw us all a tiny little bone in good faith? This is purely for show and makes us feel like you care just a little bit, just enough to make us feel a little bit better. Um, I'm going to reach out and go on a stretch here, but bear with me. And I want to point out um, the support of this memo. It's listed as uh, Heather Harris from the director of Anchorage Health supporting this. And I'm just trying to figure out who exactly that is in the organizational chart when I look on Alaska Department of HSS. Heidi Hedberg is actually listed as the director. So I'm not sure if it's a married name or anything. But there's also there's a few other Heathers and Heidi's over at the HHS um, in this organizational chart, none of them have medical degrees. I'm a registered nurse. We've had doctors testify. I'm just wondering why we don't actually have someone in medicine supporting these things that they're proposing on these memos. So I just, it really, really frustrates me that we can, we can question and not listen to our citizens who testify as doctors and nurses and give them just as much authoritative opinion on these orders that you guys are putting forward. I just, I'm very frustrated. So I think you guys need to do your homework and really look at whose medical expertise you're taking over at the health department because I, I'm just saddened when anytime we disagree with the health department, all you guys do is let's refer to the health department, what's your opinion? And they'll say, no, we don't, we don't want to do anything. We don't want to open up more. We, we don't want to do any of this. I think we need to get some more background and really look at who's giving us advice. Even the policy Apologies maker over there. Apologies for ma'am, but your time is up. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Roy Witchers. Hi Mr. Hello. Hi, Mr. Witchers, this is Felix Rivera. Um, you're with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on public testimony for item 14D, AO 2021-19. You have three minutes. Yes. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm a 46 year resident in the state of Alaska. And just watching how many businesses have 
have closed. And, I mean, it's directly from the actions of the assembly and the mayor, etc., that these things have happened. I mean, this is just a, a little, a little tidbit you're going to throw to the people that you put out of business. But you have to look way beyond just the businesses of the households that have gone completely under. People having to leave the state. You're creating more homeless than you are helping people. And really, you should be opening businesses up instead of throwing them scraps like this. I mean, it really needs to change. What you have created is something that's going to take decades, if not longer. And you, you talked about how Anchorage is like the center of the economic system for Alaska, and you have crushed that very system. So the whole state is hurting because of what is going on right here. And you can't, if you can't tell how many people are very upset and why they're upset and why we want to change everyone in the assembly except one, nameless, but you really need to start looking at yourselves in the mirror. I mean, it really is coming straight from you. And you really have to start doing what is good for the people. And that isn't going around all these different agencies and uh, the health department and everything. No. Common sense is telling people this is really wrong. And you have done it wrong. And I, I'm, I'm truly ashamed of what what's happened in this city. And I'll leave it with that. Thank you for your testimony. That ends our phone testimony. We'll switch to in-person. Welcome. Jennifer Anderson. The last testifier used a great phrase, throw us a bone. And uh, it sure does seem like that's what you're doing here. I understand that we've got these emergency orders. I understand that we're working on changing our emergency order orders to ordinances as though that somehow makes this all better and more palatable. It doesn't. It's still a dog shit sandwich. Ma'am, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you right there. Uh, can we please not use inappropriate language? Thank you. I would be glad to not use inappropriate language. However, that was the most appropriate word I could think of to describe the actions. I will, I will amend my speech to suit your tender sensibilities, however. Um, we wouldn't be considering whether or not we should switch from an emergency order to an ordinance. We wouldn't be considering whether or not we should be lifting these fees, continuing to lift these fees. If you would let us get back to business, open the restaurants, lift the restrictions, Stop living in fear-mongering panic. Find your courage. Dig deep. Get your intestinal fortitude. And live. And let us live. And let us make the best decisions for ourselves and our families and our lives. We're coming, on, coming up on one year of this nonsense. We don't need to change emergency orders to ordinances. We need to lift the emergency orders and live. We have better ways of handling the, the virus. We have better ways of managing contagion. We are not dying in the streets the way we thought we would be a year ago. We have made a mess. No, you have made a mess of our economy. You have made decisions that bring us to where this somehow, miraculously, seems like a reasonable thing. The only reason this seems reasonable is because you have gutted our economy. We don't need to change emergency orders to ordinances. We need to knock it off. We need to lift them all. We need to get back to life. If you want our behavior to change, you need your behavior to change. You need to look in the mirror 
You need to adjust your behavior. You need to get out of our way and let us live. Because all you're doing right now is slowing us all down and hurting us, the very people that you were elected to represent, not lead, because you aren't leading, to represent. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome. Uh, for the record, my name is Russ Reno, and I'm here uh, representing myself. <clears throat> Through the chair, I, I honestly, uh, I have several friends in the hospitality business that would benefit from this, and I think it would, uh, it would be nice, but I too have to agree with the other statements that this seems like just a little bone you're throwing people. Um, you actually passed $14 million worth of uh, COVID funding for both the hospitality business and the tourism industry. We still have not gotten a single dime of that tourism money that you, you passed in October. And you guys keep taking credit for all those things you're doing for us but you're not doing anything because it never happened. And I know there's some other things that i worked with, and I've been working with uh, Mr. Weddleton uh, with, with the parties that be, um, the powers that be on this, and, and we are getting some headway, but to throw this out there like it's something profound that you're doing by, by lifting this uh, normal fee of doing business is literally just an insult to the damage that's already been done. Um, and, and the things that you've promised before that has still have not been given out, and you like taking credit for it, like I said. Uh, I'm represented by one person, uh, Mr. Constant, and uh, he seems to believe that, that uh, he said it in our downtown community council meetings, that um, there's just this one group of people from online rallies going on that are just trying to attack you guys and all this. This is not one group of people trying to attack you. This is nonpartisan at its best because you are attacking us and we're trying to tell you that you need to step up to the plate and start getting back to work and work for the people and quit blaming it making excuses and these little bones throwing them at us when you have huge huge financial loss people have I still am homeless by the way I still don't have a home uh, I have not been able to recover my place I've been staying in hotels and on people's couches I've been homeless since July of this year I chose to get my business up and running first these are the real issues you have out there this is all great, and I'm, I'm happy for my friends in the hospitality industry uh, for if they get this, but it's nothing. It really is nothing. Think about what, what you have caused. If you can fix some of the stuff you have caused, if you can do something that will just meet us halfway in the middle, maybe we can start believing on what you're doing. But this is an insult. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome. My name is Eugene Carl Haberman, 20 years in resident in Anchorage and currently resident in the Valley. Follow the public process. When the public process is done appropriately, the decision made by the governing body is more like the public interest. First of all, it does make sense in this proposed ordinance. In order for you to deal with a fee scenario, you need to do it as an ordinance, which is being proposed in order to, because they're expecting certain fees and, and businesses of this area have already Many of them have already paid, and you clearly were transparent and note that in this ordinance, they will, those who have already paid will be refunded. Thank you for that. But let's look at the picture, a more clearer picture of what's happened. Yes, there's been a lot of suffering, and also a lot of unnecessary suffering. I have witnessed scenarios with businesses that when the administration, and even the prior administration, it goes back, changes the orders, the mandates, whatever you call it, the fact is, when do they go out? Like a Thursday and a Friday, and they go into effect on a Monday? How were the businesses supposed to plan? And in the midst of the difficulty of getting the necessary supplies, the businesses were frantic in saying, oh, where are we going to get it? And they find, oh, God, we can't get it. How do we reopen? So it's a two-way street here that you're, we're all not dealing with. A three-way. One is the businesses that have difficulty getting the necessary protective gear to comply with the mandates to reopen with what you say. The short-term notice that the administration that has provided in the mandates of notification so, they, so those businesses can go out, including 
the uh, restaurants and so forth. And the failure of the public, because there's been a lot of attack with you all, but in all respect, we all are respons have to have responsibility in dealing with this issue. And a lot of people in the room and elsewhere are confusing freedom with responsibility. And to help each other, this mask is necessary. So make those businesses open. We need to have these masks on. So thank you. And with all the respect, it's a start. But these businesses have felt a lot of pain. And you need to look at that picture. And whenever you make a decision here tonight and in the future, recognize those decisions and how they affect the financial situation of the community and its future. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Welcome. Good evening, my name is William Topol. Uh, my alleged representatives are Mr. Dunbar and Mr. Peterson. Okay, I, I agree with the cynicism that you've heard tonight regarding this, but philosophically, I'm all in favor of lessening the economic burden upon our businesses because they provide jobs. That's all I got to say about this. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Anyone at all? Seeing and hearing no one, public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Moved to approve. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on this item? Mr. Weddleton? I'd like to uh, offer an amendment. Line 13, change EO17 to EO18. Second. Moved and seconded. Do you want to speak to that, Mr. Weddleton? I just crack some um, or updates it to current status. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on the proposed amendment? Is there any opposition to the amendment? Okay. Hearing none, that amendment is approved. We're back on the main motion. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Dunbar? Yes. I'm sorry, Mr. Dunbar, was that a yes? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Mr. Constant? Okay. Yes. Mr. Presbridia? No. And actually, before we do the vote, um, can I clarify from both the mover and the seconder, uh, Mr. Dunbar and Ms. Zalatel, are you moving the S version of this item? I don't believe I was the mover, Mr. Chair. All right. I believe that was Mr. Peterson. Yes, it was the S version. Okay, thank you. And, and yes, Alatel? that's correct for the second. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Mr. Weddleton, did you have something before we voted? We finished no, I just want to clarify also that it was the okay. best version that was amended. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and continue our voting with that added clarification. Ms. Zolotel? I vote yes. That item is approved nine to one. All right, uh, before I open up the public testimony for our next item, as I stated at the start of the meeting, we will be opening up the public hearing for this item today with the intent of hearing approximately one and a half hours of testimony. After that time has elapsed, I'll ask for a motion of the body to continue the public hearing for this item to a future regular meeting. With that, uh, we are on item 14E, ordinance number AO 2021-13, an ordinance of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly amending Anchorage Municipal Code Chapter 16.140 to require masks or cloth face coverings in response to COVID-19 and terminating, terminating the relevant emergency order. 
As usual, we'll start with our phones, do three on our phones, three in person until we complete our phone list. Um, so with that, uh, let's go ahead and dial Miss Rebecca Gall. Remember, you must... Your call has been forwarded to an auto. Okay, we'll come back to Miss Gall and try her again later. Um, and so just a, a reminder for folks in the room, um, if you signed up uh, for phone testimony um, and you are in the room, I'm going to ask you to get in line because uh, as it clarifies on the phone testimony form, uh, that should only be for folks who are planning to testify over the phone. Um, so next I have Mr. Mark Marion. Are you in the room? Okay, so if you can go ahead and get in line, please. Uh, next, we have uh, Adriel Butler. This is Adriel Butler. Hi, Mr. Butler. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with Anchorage Assembly. We are on public testimony for item 14E, AO 2021-13. You have three minutes. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I live in South Anchorage. Uh, my uh, representatives would be LaFrance and Weddleton. Uh, thank you guys for taking the time for public testimony on this. Uh, definitely appreciate um, the fact that it will probably be long public testimony where you guys will hear a lot of things. Um, so thank you for uh, investing the time in that. Do definitely ask that you would make sure to um, listen to the testimony and let it impact you um, and um, let it be a consideration as you weigh this matter. My um, questions really revolve around uh, why this would become a code, part of the ordinance, part of the legal ordinance of uh, the municipality of Anchorage, uh, with no clear termination pathway, when there is a very clear um, outline that at some point this virus, in some manner, will fizzle in some way, whether that's through um, vaccines, herd immunity, or simple genetic mutation of the virus, and it becomes less severe. At some point in the future, it may be a different virus, but it won't be this virus. Uh, and so why are we putting a code in place that has no clear mm, shutdown metric when it is a item that has got a known demise? That seems to be setting ourselves up for failure and frustration, public frustration, business owner frustration, and assembly frustration around how do we close down something like this. Um, the other is uh, it puts business owners and um, enforcement in a very, very difficult position uh, because if I am a person who doesn't want to wear a mask, um, I simply say I have a medical issue and that's why I can't wear it. And due to HIPAA, uh, nobody at any establishment could say that I needed to tell them why or to bring my medical files with me because that's a violation of HIPAA. Um, so it puts business owners as well as um, enforcement people uh, in a very difficult position. Um, so from a, a standpoint of being able to work well with people 
for the benefit, I, I see it as um, not well crafted. Um, so I'd ask that you guys would consider these items uh, when, you're, when you're looking at this. Thank you for your time, uh, and I would request that this either be indefinitely tabled or voted no on. Thank you for your testimony. All right, we're going to go ahead and switch to in person. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Assembly. Uh, my representatives are Mr. Dunbar and Mr. Peterson. My name is Scott Stansberry. I am an industry expert in the OSHA regulations regarding respiratory protection. For those that want to know about what my credentials are, I was a member of the men's organization with a documented IQ of in excess of 150. I have 35 years experience in process safety management. I was a sought after consultant. I specialized in risk analysis, risk mitigation, <clears throat> OSHA regulations, OSHA compliance, and much more. It is, an actual, it is an engineering field, and I had clients in every continent throughout the world. The industries I consulted in were oil and gas, chemicals, power generation, NASA, and the military. <clears throat> For 25 years, I was a member of a volunteer fire department in the state of Texas and have logged over 5,000 EMS calls and also flew on Life Flight, which is an air ambulance with Herman Hospital in Houston, Texas. From industrial explosions and chemical releases that are world famous that I responded to, and many other community emergency responses, I have first-hand knowledge and experience that people, that few people will ever bear witness to, and I'm glad for that. I'm a strong advocate for safety with, that is proven with data and science to protect the people and the environment. An N95 mask is designed to be 95% effective down to three microns. A micron is a unit of measurement that is very small that most people cannot comprehend because it is so small. An example is that COVID is 0 0.125 microns. That means it is 0.125 millionths of a meter. To put things into perspective, a human hair is a 70 microns and a ping pong ball is 38,000 microns. Also, most people can relate to it being an inch and a half wide. COVID is 2.4 times smaller than a respirator can stop. What the public is wearing is non-surgical masks and homemade masks. They are made from loose weave material purchased at local stores, most of them are. Using an example of a bed sheet with a 600 thread count, uh, it will have more filtering properties than normal loose weave material. This still places the space between the threads at 42.3 microns. This means that the virus is 388 times smaller than the 600 thread count material can stop. If we scale up the size of the virus to a ping pong ball, now we can relate to something. The air gap on an N95 mask, instead of it being an inch and a half, it would be 3.6 inches. Thank you for your Thank testimony. You. Your, your time is up. Um, before we continue with our in-person testimony, it's hard for me to tell from my position right here, but just want to remind folks, uh, please, if you're in line, to be physically distant. And also, um, we're going to get through an hour and a half of testimony. So some folks, uh, you may not need to stand in, in line. Um, we will just roll through as much as we can. Um, welcome. Hello, my name is Amanda Forrester, that's F-O-E-R-S-T-E-R. -E Thank you for the opportunity to stand before you today and waste my breath. I was really conflicted as to whether or not I should come here to testify. I had to decide if I should arrange a babysitter and stand in line for hours so I could come here and give you my two cents, knowing that it ultimately isn't going to change your minds at all. You've already decided to vote yes to further oppressing the people of Anchorage, and we all know that my testimony isn't going to change that. Still, I couldn't stand idly by and watch my city circle the drain without doing at least what is in my control to do. So, I oppose your tyrannical mask law. Did that just go in one ear and out the other? This is literally tyranny made law, and when tyranny is made law, rebellion becomes duty. 
You guys had been sailing under the radar for quite some time, but you were pushing the envelope way too far and people are starting to take notice. I myself used to be oblivious. Then I took notice but would just roll my eyes and carry on my merry way. But as your deeds deteriorated, I knew I had to get involved. Write emails, attend meetings, put up yard signs, which by the way, were stolen out of my yard by people who share your values. I've watched many meetings and I can't help but notice that the vast majority of people calling in and testifying oppose your agendas as well. Why don't you listen to the people? I feel for the few on the assembly who actually listen. Their diligence to fight for the people while up against a tidal wave of idiocracy is most admirable. The rest of you are criminally insane. You put on your pompous airs, you move this and you second that, you echo your esteemed colleagues, all the while trying to out virtue signal one another. You could save the city a lot of money if the eight of you and the pretend mayor would just meet in a dimly lit room chanting and cackling around a cauldron while you manifest your evil agendas over our city. So what recourse are we left with when the Anchorage Assembly refuses to follow the will of the people? What is your metric for success at your job anyway? How do you measure how well you are representing your constituents? Is it when 5,000 people sign your recall petition? Is it by how many police officers you require to be at these meetings or SWAT team members? Is it by how many death threats you receive from desperate citizens? Stop trying to impose your delusional ideas on Anchorage. Did you know you don't have to spend all your time and energy coming up with, with outlandish ordinances and resolutions? There is joy in the mundane, approving, Liquor license renewals and, selling prop and settling property line disputes is noble work too. So let me tell you how to manage this or any pandemic. Listen to this, it's gold. Give the people accurate data without fear mongering. Allow them to assess that data, weigh the risks, and make their own choices. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome. Mark Rule, citizen. I have the 3M N95 mask. The warning is this respirator helps protect against certain particles. Misuse may result in sickness or death. Um, this is from the National Heart Lung Blood Institute, National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. Kevin Finley, Dr. MD. States here, although surgical masks offer little protection from inhaled agents, they have a role in protecting healthcare workers when, role, when worn by patients. Okay. This is uh, on line uh, 26 and 27. And my concern is communal spaces outside their home, on my private property. OK, and on the back, on F, it says 18. The municipality reserves the right to use all available enforcement options to ensure compliance with this section. So what you're telling me is if I'm in my yard with my neighbor without a mask on, you can come and arrest me and put me in jail. That is wrong. I'm a citizen. This is wrong. The people will speak up and remove you guys. Next election, okay? You guys need to wake up. Do some proper research. I worked in the hospital industry 21 years. Every year we had to be fit tested to use those N95 masks for them to work properly. And if you had a little hair on your face, they don't work either. Okay, I see people walking around with those little blue masks and the other masks, and some of them are wearing them upside down, and those cloth masks don't work at all, like the gentleman said. 
the coronavirus is much smaller than 3.3 microns, which this will protect to. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We're going to go ahead and switch back to our phones. Uh, we'll start with Ms. Schild. Hi, Ms. Shield. This is Felix Rivera. We are on public testimony for item 14E, AO 2021-13. You have three minutes. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Um, I am a registered nurse. I just want to point out a few things within this order. You reference scientific studies, and I'm curious which ones you're referencing in support of us needing to use masks. Because even on the CDC's website, there's studies that supposedly support masks. I've read them. There are too many variables. And that's the exception. When you read the whole study, at the end, it shows you, okay, there's this, this, and this. There's at least four or five variables, and they're trying to jump to grand conclusions stating masks are actually helping. The majority of those studies are actually in the healthcare setting on symptomatic patients not asymptomatic or healthy individuals. We should not be wearing them. You use Dr. Zink as quoting, stating wearing a mask is a key tool to stop COVID. Masks are a medical tool, and that's important. They need to be used very specifically with detailed instructions, but they're meant to be used by educated individuals on that mask. She uses skiing as an example of how easy it is to wear a mask when you exercise. So you have this EO18 attachment that we all have to require for sports, and it's, it's ridiculous. Skiing outside in no way compares to the speed or the breath you're using when you play basketball or you're doing speed running. When you're, um, when you're outside, you just want to wear a face covering to keep your face warm. It's not for, for breathing or keeping COVID away from you. You can space anyways when you're outside. And I'll just add again, her team at the health department is composed of more non-medically licensed or even educated individuals than those with a medical education. Masks do not stop virus particles. They're too small, like as the other testifier stated. They do, however, cause a tremendous amount of collateral damage. I'm using that word often because it is collateral damage you're forgetting about. A mask over the mouth and nose creates the perfect dark, wet, foggy, humid environment of perfect Petri dish for viruses to grow. And, I mean, even bacteria. Dentists are seeing more cavities in their patients. Asthma patients are seeing more complications and attacks. Bacterial infections in and around the mouth are becoming more and more frequent. My own teenagers are having difficult controlling acne around their mouth and nose. They're causing social anxiety in our young. They're causing isolation in our citizens because they would rather stay home than have to wear a mask. So now we're isolating them for that. I recently had to do an assessment on an asthmatic young girl, and I asked her to remove her mask so that I could assess her face. The inside of this cloth mask was brown. I mean... We, we cannot be doing this anymore. Why would you make this indefinite law when pandemics historically are done? Apologies for months? interrupting, ma'am, but your time is up. Thank you for your testimony. Okay. Thank you. Next, we have Jennifer Todd. Hi, Ms. Todd. Uh, this is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on public testimony for item 14E, AO 2021-13. You have three minutes. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Jennifer Todd. Um, I'm in the Sand Lake area represented by um, Mr. Perez Verdia, and I just wanted to add my comment along with the rest um, that I'm against 
this EO to AO for the masks and um, actually all of them, but especially for this one. Um, I listened in on to the work session and something that um, one of the assembly members said about, you know, turning the light switch off and on and that this would help be a dimmer switch. And in my opinion, the dimmer switch um, would be we the people. Um, we'd be able to decide for, you know, for our health if we were going to wear a mask or not. And the businesses could decide for themselves if they would require a mask. Um, so I think that would be more of a dimmer switch. And, um, you know, once the emergency is over, uh, so should um, all, of the, all of the orders that go with it. And um, I do have just a concern about, um, you know, getting the assembly. Um, I know this will come with a sunset date, but to to get 10 people, you know, to to reverse this, um, I have some concerns over that, especially when um, myself and it seems like a lot of other people um, are frustrated, um, feel, not feeling heard um, by the assembly. And um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Last on the phone before we go back to in person, we have Miss Kristen Bush. Hello? Hi, Ms. Bush. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on public testimony for item 14E, AO 2021-13. You have three minutes. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Kristen Bush, and I wholeheartedly oppose this ordinance about masking. This assembly continues to think that you are medical professionals, and you are not. This assembly continues to think that by being restrictive and totalitarian that you are saving us from something. You are not. Your actions and emergency orders, mandates, and now trying to move all this into ordinance is unacceptable. It's almost as if you are intentionally trying to propel every single person from this community into wanting to leave this community and move someplace else. A mere 40 miles north of here, businesses are open, schools are open, the economy is doing better than expected, and people are happy. Happy as they can be in the middle of this crazy time. But 40 miles north, it really isn't that crazy. It's only crazy right here in Anchorage. People walk around with this look in their face here. Can somebody please make this stop? This city is under a plague. But it isn't a plague of a virus. It's a plague of your complete ineptitude and mismanagement. We cannot endure another month of this insanity, much less one more day. There isn't enough mountains of federal money coming our way to save this city. We have to save ourselves from economic ruin. We need to open the city. We need to be a welcoming place. We need our children to be educated. We need our businesses to be fully operational. And we sure as heck do not need your dictating our medical decisions with a mask ordinance becoming a sub law that has no sunset date and that you will never relinquish. We do not want to live like this. I encourage you to visit the website from CDC that talks all about the people and instances where a mask should not be worn. I sent all of you an email today that contains that link. You can't unilaterally continue to make people who cannot wear a mask have no place to freely go out into the world. What do you propose happens with those people? Do you think they should just get imprisoned in their homes forever? Should they continue to be discriminated against? Here you are requiring masks be worn on children while playing sports. It's unbelievable that you'd think they are getting enough oxygen during cardio exertion through a mask that literally blocks air. When the first kid dies from some type of adverse effect of masking, I will help that family hire a lawyer to sue this city and you individually for wrongful death. Vote no on this ordinance.
Thank you for your testimony. All right, we're going to go ahead and switch back to in person. Welcome. My name is Tim Cole, and I live in District 4. One of the primary themes that have been written into this mask order is the claim that scientific studies have shown that mask wearing reduces the spread of COVID-19. Your administration cites the Alaska State Epidemiology Bulletin, which mentions a few studies that focus on respiratory droplets and aerosol exposures in regards to mask wearing. First of all, one of them states, there is little information on the efficacy of face masks and filtering respiratory viruses. That's interesting. Secondly, these particular studies have been refuted on many occasions due to the simple fact that even the N95 masks, which most people aren't even wearing, are tested to 0.3 microns and the coronavirus is three times smaller at 0.1 micron. There are numerous studies that show that not only can particles of that size flow right through the mask, they more efficiently flow out the sides of the mask, around the mouth, and through the top of the mask near the gaps around the nose, just as you can see with the mask that you're wearing right now. None of your studies are randomized control trials or peer-reviewed studies, and if you were to look at the more thorough studies that exist, and there are many, you would find ones such as the Danish RCT study, the Oxford Center for Evidence-Based Medicine, the University of East Anglia, the University of Illinois, the New England Journal of Medicine, Cochrane Review, the Norwich School of Medicine, and the British, and British Medical Journal, all which have found that high-quality medical face masks and cloth coverings, due to the large pore size and pore fit, cannot filter out respiratory viruses. There is no no statistically significant effect against the transmission of the SARS-CoV-2 infection, and wearing masks could even increase the risk of infection such as viral pneumonia. It actually says right on the box of the ear loop mask that everyone is wearing, these masks cannot eliminate the risk of contracting infectious disease. You would think that with this large body of scientific studies and evidence refuting your claims, you wouldn't rush to make mask wearing a law when it is surrounded by such a large debate and controversy. Not to mention masks are harmful and unhealthy to wear. Numerous studies show that when masks are worn, CO2 intake increases by 20%, oxygen is re reduced by 6%, and blood pressure increases in order to pump blood and more oxygen to your vital organs. So if masks don't work, how can you expect us to believe that a face shield will? This mask law impedes the right of the free people in this city to make decisions about their own health and bodily integrity. The United States Constitution has survived several centuries of crises, civil wars, world wars, seven smallpox epidemics, Spanish flu, Asian flu, swine flu, and not once were any of these constitutional rights suspended. Not once. Our founding forefathers were well aware of pandemics such as smallpox, and nowhere in the Constitution can you find it written that a, quote, state of emergency supersedes these fundamental human rights. I urge you to vote this ordinance down and let the people of this city make their personal health decisions on their own. Your laws and mandates are nonsense and nothing more than virtue signaling to seek political praise, and those re reasons are not enough to uphold government action that puts the people at potential risk of harm, violates the liberty of the citizens, and dismantles the republic for which we stand. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome. For the record, I'm Samuel Wilson. Decisions and efforts to have a mask mandate or ordinance that only instills more fear in people during economic hardships not only vi directly violates constitutional protected individual medical rights and freedoms, but doesn't allow any, doesn't follow any science. Let's talk about what we know and has been proven. We know this virus is 0.1 microns in size. We also know that cloth mask materials have microscopic holes in them and is measured anywhere from 25 to 100 microns. This means we are trying to keep mosquitoes out with a chain link fence. We also know that the survival rate of COVID is above 99%. We all get told how many cases and deaths there are in the state and how short staffed hospitals could be. It's always how bad we are doing and never how good we are doing. This is because this is not science. This is fear mongering and it's disrespectful to our citizens. When our, when our children come to us at night and tell us there's monsters in the closet, we don't tell them to hide under the covers. We turn on the lights, open the closet, show them the reality that there aren't any monsters in the closet. They're able to sleep because they know the truth. Masks, masks have hindered our economy and the simple values we cherish in life like seeing a smile on someone's face. Going back and forth according to some CDC guideline about masks working, then not working, then maybe two masks will work, etc., has the same pattern as a liar because their story is always changing. We are also told that medicine malpractice is the third leading cause of death in the U.S., according to John Hopkins University. 
Someone gets on a ventilator in the hospital because they might have COVID-19, gets too much pressure and their lungs explode, causing death. That cause of death wasn't COVID. It was medicine malpractice. We also know that our citizens don't want any more handouts from the government's or draconian style mandates that say they have to close their businesses or only be at a certain percent for capacity. We're six feet apart in line at the airport, but less than six inches apart when we get seated in the aircraft. What's the science in that? Our citizens want to be left alone and run their businesses as they see fit. They don't want to worry about some parking lot littered mask or if they can open past 25% capacity because the selfish assembly thought it was a good idea since California, California and New York were doing it. We also know that some businesses may never open again and that is a direct reflection of the poor leadership within this body. These businesses create jobs, boost our economy and have their own ability to decide whether or not they want people to wear masks in their place of business. So let them choose. And those businesses may flourish, and they may not. Their customers will ultimately decide. But it's not up to the assembly to take away their individual rights and freedoms or hinder their business so they can't provide for their employees and their families because we thought we could flatten a curve that never existed, much like the monster in the closet. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome. Uh, thank you. I also oppose 2021-13. Dustin Sherman is my name. And changing the mask mandate to a law is an overreach uh, of the <clears throat> is an overreach by the body who's already lost public support. You guys. <laughs> This will do nothing but hinder the mayor, the next mayor, if said person is not in line with the assembly's policies, and hinder their chance to govern the, uh, to the best of their ability, which will be just one more poke in the eye to the public and their trust. The same people not wearing masks now were the same people not wearing masks six months ago. Nothing has changed. In fact, there's more people not wearing masks. I see it every day in my, in my business. As someone who's gone through COVID-19 and whose wife almost died from it, we, all, we understand exactly how dangerous it can be. By the way, we actually caught that here in the assembly, wearing masks. Imagine that. <clears throat> we understand the risks when we aren't afraid of them. Changing this to a law does, nothing, or does so many negative things to our already stressed out society, and it's just another spoke in the wheel that keeps rolling down the road to an endless mandates and laws created over a virus we honestly have no idea how to control. Since I'm guessing you'll end up eventually voting this to, or making this pass, I will encourage you all to put in a sunset clause, which I hope you do, that will be revisited monthly. It needs to be visited every month and eliminated once we reach the threshold of cases at 25% of the current caseload. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We're going to go ahead and switch uh, to three over the phone. Uh, so first, we will start with Gail Hadley. Hello, this is Gail Hadley. Please leave. Next, we will go to Mr. Ron Dewitt. The what? Okay. And uh, next we will go to Mr. Roy Witchers. Hi. Hello. Hi, Mr. Witchers. This is Felix Herrera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on public testimony for item 14E, AO 2021-13. You have three minutes. Welcome. Yes, this is Roy Witchers, actually. Um, but I think that the issue really, since you won't even listen to a man that's an expert, OSHA expert, and I'm not a big expert on medical or any kind of diseases or chemicals or anything, although I've spent my life around chemicals in, in the taxidermy industry my whole life. 
and I mean, it's common sense wearing a mask at certain times. But one of the issues really coming down to it isn't about the masks or anything else. It's you and the liability issues with people in government, elected officials and appointed, you are not responsible, li you're not liably responsible for your own actions as long as they're in line with the description of your job or job description. That needs to be changed so we can go after personally every one of you individuals or as a group that don't do what the public demands. And that's the issue at hand. This also goes back to treason laws. You are not liable for treason if you are within the guidelines of your job description. This needs to be stopped. And that's going to change things completely on the federal and local and state level. That's where we need to change. So I'll, I'll go ahead and let things go to the next person. And I think this is what we need to st listen to and find out how to change that law first and make these people responsible for their actions in a criminal and punitive damage way. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We're going to go ahead and switch to in-person. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Lisa Huffman, and I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to the assembly tonight. Um, I had prepared some comments, but um, as I've listened to the testimony of my fellow citizens, I've kind of am just going to speak from my heart and um, my personal experiences. Um, I oppose this ordinance or the EO becoming an AO. I think it's far overreaching. Um, you know. I've, I've lost family members. My dad passed away in November, November 7th, due to complications from COVID. Um, my stepmom was sick, very, very sick. Um, I've had other family members that were sick. I, too, tested positive for antibodies, but I chose to do an alternative treatment called the Math Plus. It was very successful. Um, people have shared a lot of facts and information with you, and I really hope you'll listen to them this evening. Um, it's really important that you not overreach and, and make these into ordinances. There's no reason for it based on all the information shared with you tonight, how it impacts kids, how it impacts sports, how it impacts industry. I mean, the stories that I've heard this evening are um, powerful and I really hope that you're listening. Um, here's a great example, personally, of how individuals can make choices. They don't need you to make them for them. In 2012, I was diagnosed with breast cancer, and I had to undergo several surgeries and chemotherapy and radiation, and my white blood cells dropped to under 1.0. It was near zero. And my immune system was severely compromised, and I had to make some decisions, wear a mask when I went out in public. But more importantly, I stayed home. I washed my hands when people visited. They were very cautious. I wasn't around people. It's just a simple example of how we, the people of Anchorage, can make decisions for ourselves. We don't need you overreaching your authority and turning these EOs into AOs. It's not necessary. So I really, truly hope you'll listen this evening to what you're hearing. Um, I found it very, very powerful, and I hope you do too. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome. Hello. My name is Sarah Jokola, and I identify as a free breather. I am here because I don't support this ordinance. I'm not going to cite math science to the majority of you because I don't feel like you're listening already. You've either picked the science or the funding package that you're going to make your decision on. Chaos is reigning in our municipality. You've said that the Matsu Valley is the Wild West when really is, in fact, Anchorage. 
and that is the Wild West. Popular opinion outside of Anchorage is that it's being run by the inmates at the asylum, and they don't want anything to do with our town. The infighting has reached epic proportions, and it has to stop. If the goal is unity, which includes compromise for the greater good, then all of this nonsensical behavior has to stop, right? The heckling from the audience, the petty emotions from behind the bench, all of it. Governance and constituency should not be about winning and losing. It's obvious that we're all losing at this point. The assembly majority is not listening. If they listen, they do not hear. The public is not listening. If they do, they're incited to anger because the governing body is disregarding them with a thank you for your participation. And their testimony is quickly forgotten. Mine will be forgotten too, and I accepted that before I came. But some things are worth standing tall for. In many ways, minds are made up, and that may not change, but I hope that all can and will be become better than the issues that are tearing our city apart. Myself and my children, we can't mask without health repercussions. My one child has largely removed himself from life because of this forced masking, and the other one is breaking mentally and emotionally, and I have to walk her through that. You don't. We wear face shields where we can, but we're walking into stores that are allowed to discriminate, and they, they're yelling at your child, face mask, no mask, or face shield, no mask, and it's like hearing leper unclean, leper unclean, what does that do to a child who can't process, they can't process that like I can, but I have to walk her through that. And there's many, many people who have to walk their children and try children who have to understand what's happening, and they can't. There's so much at stake here. It's not simply an ordinance. This is people. This is emotional and physical torture for a lot of people. My body, my choice is, is okay until it comes to this, and that's not okay so from a very sincere place in my heart, I'm asking you to consider all people first. No one should make decisions for our families without knowing our unique needs. Nobody cares more about my family than I do. All, please, all of this, it just has to stop. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome. I am about ready to pass out. I can't do this. I sent all of you some pictures that were taken in 1918. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. This is important. Ma'am, if you could uh, state your name for the record. Sherry please. Coburn. Thank you. In the 1918, the Spanish flu was an epidemic worldwide. And many people, you know, it was, it was new, many people died. But what they did is they took samples from some of the dead soldiers. And in 1919, they started studying the tissues of those bodies. And what they discovered, and this is amazing, the people didn't die from the Spanish flu. What they died from was bacterial pneumonia that was caused because the virus ruined their, laid down their bronchial tubes, opened them up, laid down the cilla, and that bacteria was able to get in because did you look at the pictures I sent you? What did it look like there compared to today? They were wearing masks and they didn't know the damage that they caused to those people. Back then they thought they were doing something good to save lives. And now we have the data to know that they didn't save lives. They not only did not save people from the Spanish flu, they created a whole other disease. Do you want that on your legacy? Do, your, do you want your kids to know that you were the one that was trying to make me be arrested? Because I don't want to have bacterial pneumonia. I've had pneumonia four times, and it's extremely deadly. I'll take the COVID all day long over bacterial second double pneumonia. Um, we also, um, wearing the mask, a lot of people have talked about the detriment to that. The depletion of oxygen, I'm so lightheaded right now, I can't hardly stand here. It's like smoking an extra pack of cigarettes a day. And you guys are it's like, do you not care? Do you not understand what you're doing? Dr. Fauci keeps moving the goalpost. When this first started, he said, oh, you don't have to wear a mask. I've got him on video saying, you don't have to wear a mask. It's not going to help you. Then he comes out and says, oh, you have to wear a mask. Oh, you don't. Oh, you do. Now he's saying you too. And then he comes out and he says, when we, we, when we reach 60% herd immunity, it'll be safe to open up. He said that way back. I've got it on tape. 
He said at 60% herd immunity it will be safe. That's been the standard practice of medical thing is 60% it's safe. We've already reached 60% and now he's saying, oh, you've got to reach 85 to 90. We're there, people, we're there. Nobody's in danger from the COVID. It, is, it was manufactured, it has a patent, and it is, this is ridiculous. You guys are telling us that you're going to pass an emergency order, make it illegal. When I the crime in this city is outrageous, and you're doing nothing about that, but you're going to arrest me for not wearing a mask when it's a huge detriment to my health, and you've already heard a lot of other testimony about that. You cannot take our life you are, you're, by taking away our freedom, you're taking away the possibility that we can create in our lives. You're, you're ruining everything. Stop. Thank you for your testimony. We're going to go ahead and switch to testimony over the phone. Uh, so we're going to start with Miss Mary Trimble. Hi, Ms. Trimble, this is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on public testimony for item 14E, AO 2021-13. You have three minutes. Welcome. Thank you for taking my testimony. I am 66 years old and have lived in Eagle River since 1989. My husband is a neurologist and our son is a critical care pulmonologist. Both of them have helped me to understand the science of COVID. On March 12th of 2020, we were told to hunker down for two weeks to slow the spread and flatten the curve of COVID cases. The goal was to make sure the hospitals had beds for those that had developed COVID and give healthcare workers a chance to figure out how to best treat the disease. Since March 12th, 2020, emergency orders have been written under the direction of the mayor in, re in a responsive process with the assembly. Recently, I listened to the work session on AO 2021-13, changing the municipal approach from COVID emergency orders to an ordinance is the wrong direction for our country to take, our city to take, especially now. Dr. Anthony Fauci recently said the goal to extinguish the spread of the virus is to achieve 70% herd immunity. Reaching herd immunity is accomplished when people either recover from COVID or receive the COVID vaccine. A municipal ordinance gives the appearance our lives will never be normal again. So why should we get the vaccine? Additionally, what is the bar to remove the, this ordinance? During the work session, it was stated the goal was one case per 100,000. Are those the numbers you're working with? Where'd those numbers come from? Also, 10 cases per 100,000 is considered high risk. Where's the science on those numbers? Now is the time to encourage people to take the vaccine so we can reach herd immunity. Local businesses and individuals have worked hard to slow the spread of the virus with the hope of returning to our normal lives. Making the emergency order into an ordinance is counterproductive and reaching that goal by dashing that hope and creating frustration with you, our local government. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next on the phones, we have Dr. J.C. Cates. Hello. Hi, Dr. Cates. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on public testimony for item 14E, uh, AO 2021-13. You have three minutes. Welcome. Yes. So, um, I've uh, been a doctor up here about 30 years, and I've cared for uh, well, probably about 45, 50 COVID patients this trip um, since March. And uh, 17 of them were in the um, demented ward of the Pioneer Home. 
where um, they got infected, which was about half the population. Out of that 17, uh, three of them passed away. One of them had metastatic cancer. One had heart failure, and the other had something else, but uh, some other medical problem. But uh, 14 of them really improved, and uh, several, four, about four of them, had no symptoms. So I've cared for patients. Um, these patients were, you know, 80 to 100, and 100 years old. And they are in wheelchairs. My mom is there, and I was able to go in and, and care for these people. And I, I brought in some zinc and some vitamin D and quercetin, and I uh, asked the food service to help them with uh, fruits and vegetables and puree them so that they could suck them with a straw. And, and they got better. And there's, this is such a wonderful opportunity to educate people on how to care for themselves. And there's no education on, you know, protecting your immune system that's going around this community. I mean, we talk about food as physicians for many reasons, good food. One of them is to bolster your immune system so that if a virus or a bacteria comes around, it doesn't take you down. There's no education going on here. There's so much that we can do to improve the health and well-being of everyone in our community, but it's not being propagated in our media. A lot of this is false. A lot of this fear is unrealistic. It's unwarranted. This is fear. Fear compromises the immune system. It's amazing what fear does. And mandating that people wear masks Apologies for on their interrupting, face. sir, but your time is up. Thank you for your testimony. Yes. Yeah, Last, bet. before we go back to in person, uh, we have Miss Joan Priestley. Hi, what's up? Hi, Ms. Priestley. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on public oh. testimony for item 14E AO 2021-13. You have three I minutes. See. Welcome. You're not doing this in real time, are you? Uh, Hello? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> in real time. If you're watching online, there is a, a bit of a lag, but it's only about 15 seconds. Um, but oh. anyway, you have three minutes. Welcome. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, this is Joan Priestley. I'm a retired medical doctor. First, a statement from the New England Journal of Medicine from 2020. Quote, we know that wearing masks, a mask outside of healthcare facilities offers little, if any, protection from viral infections. The greatest contribution of expanded masking protocols may be simply to reduce the transmission of anxiety. End quote. But I'm not going to talk any more science today because this ordinance seems to be based largely on a political agenda that is independent from science, medicine, and statistics. So I want to address some serious omissions in this ordinance that I'm asking you to correct. One, a very important sentence in the mayor's orders on masks is missing. It read, violation of this order does not create grounds for residents to harass individuals who do not comply with it. People don't wear masks for all sorts of reasons. They need and deserve your protection here. So I would also add another clause, quote, no citizen shall be fined for not complying with this ordinance, period. 
you're exempting businesses from fines. You need to extend the same status to people. Two, there is no sunsetting clause ending this law. A mandate this pervasive needs to be reexamined and extended by assembly vote periodically, like every 60 or at most 90 days, or it ends, gone, sunsetted out of existence. Three, include the U.S. Code citation for the Americans with Disabilities Act since you're making businesses comply with it. The ADA is found in the U.S. Code, Title 42, Chapter 126. It is very protective of our rights against discrimination. People need to know where to find it. 42 U.S. Code, Chapter 126. Number four, this is an unfunded mandate being imposed on citizens. To what city department do we send our bills to reimburse us for the endless masks and plastic shields that you are forcing people to buy? Please include the contact address. In summary, if nothing else, include the statement that violation of this ordinance does not create grounds for residents to harass individuals who do not comply with it. That is very important and exempt both businesses and people from needless fines. Google America's frontline doctors for effective treatments for COVID. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We're going to go ahead and switch back to in person. Welcome. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, my name is James Caswell, for the record. Um, I want to go back to the uh, ping pong ball analogy. Um, so I, where, where Mr. Sansbury left off, he was saying a ping pong ball is one and a half inches wide. So if, if we were to take and magnify the virus to the size of a ping pong ball, we are now looking at the, the gaps between the fibers on an N95 mask at being 3.5 inches wide. <clears throat> the threads on a 600 thread count sheet um, would then be 42.6 feet apart, and that's um, probably better material than most of these masks are made out of. Uh, multiple peer-reviewed studies show that cloth masks do not work and infection rates are higher for those wearing masks than those that do not. OSHA has put on their website that, quote, cloth and non-surgical type masks will not protect you against airborne transmiss transmissible infectious agents, end quote. Um, <clears throat> I was reading something today that, um, that kind of I, I'm, I'm looking at as um, kind of the opposite of what's going on here in Alaska, yet the patterns are the same. Um, Iowa, as of Monday, is the governor of Iowa is uh, announcing that there is no mask mandate, no social gathering, and uh, no social distancing limits. Um, they state that uh, their, um, their numbers um, peaked in November, similar to what happened here. Um, I'm looking at their, their case counts as well as their population, um, and the ratio from uh, case counts to population is very similar to what it, what it is here in Alaska. And, um, and we're talking about Anchorage now, though. Um, and you guys are turning this into a permanent law, um, whereas in Iowa they are lifting all restrictions and limitations. So I'm not sure uh, why or how the, where the logic is behind making this a law um, when like I'm seeing what Governor Reynolds in Iowa is doing and that makes sense to me, you know, that makes sense. Um, and this is based on um, their numbers and their hospital, their, hospital, their hospitalizations, their ICU bed counts, it's all down just the same as if I recall correctly um, what our, our acting mayor said earlier. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I know you guys, the, those of you that have decided to vote this, vote for this are not going to have your minds changed, and those of you that are going to vote against it are going to vote against it. Um, so, I, you know, I, I just would encourage you guys to do what's right by the citizens that elected you, um, but also remember that no matter what you guys do, whether it's in our favor or against our favor, um, we'll continue to do what we're doing, which um, is that we, we won't forget the um, trials and tribulations that you guys have Thank put you us for through your during this pandemic. So, thanks. Thank you. Welcome.
Hello, my name is Marie Caswell, for the record. Um, this testimony is going to be in a little bit different direction, but it does have to do with this. So, have any of you ever experienced loss due to suicide or drug addiction? Have you been a victim of domestic violence or sexual abuse, or were you abused as a child? I ask these questions because these are the areas that have seen a significant increase since lockdowns and mandates were put in place. Someone mentioned 665 suicides and um, drug addiction losses, which is more than COVID. I personally have experienced every single trauma I mentioned. And the effects these losses and traumas have last a lifetime. They can be extremely difficult to manage, especially now. As someone who battles with mental health issues, I can attest to the hoops that I have had to go through just to get the help that I want. This arm of tattoos represents the people that I've lost to suicide and addiction. And it would be completely full, but right now it's only what I can afford. But this entire arm would be covered. And this, this isn't all of them, like I said. Why would we need a mask law outside of an emergency declaration? Why is it a mandate now? Give us back our choice. And those who want to and believe in masks will wear them. <phone rings> Victims of rape and abuse should have a choice because masking triggers their PTSD. Children and people with disabilities should have a choice based on their specific needs and what is best for them. Everything that you guys have done has been based on fear. And I think what you are forgetting is that masking for some people creates fear. When I put my mask on and I go out, I am in fear. When I don't put my mask on, I am in fear of the people that are going to judge me. And it sucks. And I feel like what we have been taught most of our lives about fear is that we should face it. And that's not what's been happening. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome. Hello, Miss Allard. Hello, most hated people in Anchorage. My name is Amber Sword. I had a lot to say. There was science, there was medical testimony, but as I watch your clerk roll her eyes and I watch you, Riviera, visibly laugh at testimony, I know you're not listening. Or we know you're not listening. So I'll tell you something that I was asked to record on video some time ago. I'll tell you about my experiences with the joy you're putting on the city for two and a half minutes and pretend you're actually listening because we all know you're not. In April, I lost my sister-in-law, not to COVID, but to the fear you could at least look at the people talking to you to the fear that you've propagated. She didn't want to go to the hospital because she was afraid she'd die. So she died in front of her two little girls in a hotel room, just right in front of them, sat up, took a drink of coffee, and keeled over in front of a 12-year-old little girl who's now in my mother's custody of a heart attack in front of her two daughters. Can you imagine? Because you guys scared the crap out of people to the point they don't want to go to hospitals. She's not the only one. 650 people committed suicide. That's blood on your hands. You, you did that. You killed 650 people with your stupidity, with your stupid fence to keep out mosquitoes. This is bullshit. I'm tired of it. I work at a gym. I'm not telling you which one because we don't want to see you and your wasted employees 
They should be solving real crimes, like the time I was robbed or the time I was raped. And they sat and told me straight up, oh, you know, we only, we're not going to tell you you're not important, but we only have one person handling those cases. How many people do you have handling putting chain link fences up against a damn mosquito? What is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? Seriously. And then you roll your eyes and laugh at people. Hello, you're not even looking, right, rolling lady. You're not even listening, and we know it. I'm going to pause your time. I am not going to allow you to attack staff. Feel free to speak to assembly members and go after assembly members, but I am not going to allow you to attack staff. I'm going to continue your time now. I'm going to ask your staff to not roll her eyes at her employers. Okay, ma'am, that's your second warning. If you do it again, I'm going to ask you to leave. Wonderful. We know you're not listening anyway, so I'll proceed. I work at a gym where you're asking me to force elderly people to suffocate themselves. Are you going to pay for it when they fall over? Are you going to pay the insurance costs? Because our insurances don't cover people in saunas with, hot, with masks on. They don't cover that. People are getting sick. People have developed bacterial rashes. I know four people that have bacterial asthma. I didn't even know that was a thing. But you're giving people asthma. That's more blood on your hands. You're doing that. You're taking people's livelihoods. You've put thousands of people in homeless shelters. It's a good thing you bought the Sullivan Arena so you can slam us all in it. Do not thank me for my testimony. I know you don't appreciate it. Good day. Thank you for your testimony. We're going to go ahead and switch to folks on the phone. We're going to start with Mr. Toby Ventura. Hello? Hi. Uh, is this Toby Ventura? It is. Great. Um, this is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on public testimony for item 14E, oh. AO 2021-13. You have three minutes. Welcome. Okay. Let me just, uh, I went to bed. <laughs> Hold on a second. Okay. So I, um, I'm speaking on the, um, the mask mandate. And I just want to read to you a uh, video. It's from last year, and it's Dr. Zink. I know it's, it's kind of like old news. Um, but uh, Dr. Zink, uh, the chief medical officer of the state of Alaska, um, was having a meeting with the state legislature. And I'm just going to quote um, almost word for word from, from what that video she talked about it hard to write it all down. But um, um, I, she wanted to show how, I want to show how the politics of um, fear have um, and are driving the narrative away from sound medical practice. So a question was asked during that um, meeting. Um, about the different types of masks, the N92 being worn and how effective they are. And Dr. Zink said, are you still there? Yes, we're, st we're still here. Please continue. OK. Uh, the CDC does not recommend the average person to wear a mask. If you think about a mask, you breathe into it. It's a wet, moist environment that's collecting viruses and bacteria. In general, it's not necessary to protect you from other people. It can be useful when someone walks into a clinic and they're having symptoms, coughing and sneezing, or to keep you from coughing and sneezing on surfaces or other people when you're sick. In general, if you are sick, putting on a mask and calling beforehand before you go to the clinic is recommended. General day-to-day -day wearing of a mask is not recommended. The N95 mask needs to be tested and requires being specially fit. In general, only healthcare professionals need to wear a mask in specific settings. 
And that, that, was, uh, that was all a quote from Dr. Zink. She goes on to say, having consistent information is really important as we're fighting multiple epidemics at this moment. And this was back in February of 2020. One being COVID, but also fear and disinformation as we move forward. So I wanted to say, since that time, in all, in all fairness, most likely before then, politics and healthcare have merged. And we now have a conflagration of misinformation and half-baked data. It's a, be it's a beast. It's similar to having half a donkey and half an elephant. Um, you, you don't have one or the other, you just have a mix of two things. I feel like we're at a greyhound race. Have you ever been to a greyhound race? The dog runs around Apologies the track. Apologies for interrupting, ma'am, but you are out of time. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we have Shannon Slater. Remember, you must... Okay, we'll go ahead and try this later again later. Next, we have Robert Farabauer. Hello, this is Robert. Hi, Mr. Farabauer. This is Felix Rivera. Uh, you're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on public testimony for item 14E, AO 2021-13. You have three minutes. Welcome. Thanks, Chair. My name is Robert Fairbauer, represented by Mr. Whittleton and Ms. LaFrance. In general, I would like to see the EO mask mandate revoked and no replacement AO mask mandate. The assembly can recommend that residents wear masks. Reviewing results of other localities that impose mask mandates show case rates over the past three, past three months trending with Anchorage. The virus doesn't seem to care if you are wearing a mask. I think the over-reliance on masking causes people to defeat the other measures, such as social distancing, this over-reliance instills a false sense of security, leading potentially to reduced adherence to well-recognized preventative measures such as physical distancing and hand hygiene, according to the World Health Organization. I have several concerns about AO 2021-13. One, there's not a sunset clause for the AO. Please include a sunset clause of two months or less. People need some hope that this will end and with immunity levels increasing due to people who have recovered and people getting vaccinated, this seems reasonable. In lieu of a sunset clause, there is no other criterion for ending the mask mandate. For example, when the 14-day average cases drop below 10 per 100,000 could be a criterion. And the AO does not have the exemption that the EO does for employees within their own fully enclosed office or workspace or within an unenclosed workspace if they are totally alone. That was deleted in the uh, transcription from the EO to the AO. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. 
All right, we're going to go ahead and switch back to in-person. Welcome. Uh, actually, bef before I go to you, Ms. Allard, did you have? Sure. Can I have just a moment of privilege, just for a second? Sure. Thank you. Um, I wanted to say to everybody, I appreciate everybody's passion for being here tonight. But I really want to reiterate to you, and I know the chair already brought it up, but please do not disrespect the staff. They're, they're not elected officials. We are. And we're the ones that are responsible for what's going on. And it's hurtful to them. They're here to just do their job and to do the, the best of their ability. But if you guys could just keep that contained, I would appreciate it. And I know the staff would too. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Welcome. This will probably kill more COVID than a mask will. Thank you. Good evening. William Topol, East Anchorage. My assembly representatives are supposed to be Mr. Dunbar and Mr. Peterson. I see several issues with this proposed ordinance, so I'm urging a no vote. If you go to page one, line 15, excuse me, page one, line 12, and its provisions shall be liberally construed to accomplish this pur purpose. No, they should be strictly construed so as to protect the rights of the individuals in accordance with our charter. Okay, also on page one, line 36, may extend beyond the need for a declared emergency that authorize the issuance of emergency orders. What does that mean? What is more urgent than a true emergency? I don't get it. Okay, also on page one, lines 42 and 43, actually 43, before vaccination becomes the primary tool to mitigate the spread of. The vaccine manufacturers have said that their products will only minimize or lessen the effects of the coronavirus. Okay, page two, paragraph, or 16.140.030, paragraph A, clause one. Indoors and in public settings or communal spaces outside the home. Well, that violates my property rights on my property. Okay, same page, paragraph B. Now this section here starts to show some common sense as far as exemptions, starts to. Okay, page three, paragraph D, clauses one through nine. Okay, again, this section starts to reflect some common sense about exemptions until this paragraph, paragraph eight, Musicians, presenters, ministers that are communicating to an audience or being recorded for the duration for their presentation, practice, or performance where mask usage impairs communication and so long as they are 25 feet from the audience. Why 25 feet? Why not six feet like everyone else? Page four, paragraph E. Businesses and building owners shall deny admittance to any individual who fails to comply with the section. So we're gonna make the businesses tools and agents of the government. And section F, reserves the right for all available enforcement options. We're gonna have our APD do this, Thank you become for your mask enforcers, come on. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, my name is Jordan Harari from District 4 in uh, Rivera and Zalatel's district. Uh, this is going to go a little differently. Get ready for this. You have forgotten how big you are. You think you're small. You think you're fragile. You think you're weak. You think you're susceptible to a virus. In that fear, you have become a body that produces crap like this. 
in your fear, in your perceived weakness, which you were not. You were strong. You were brave. You were, it's in there. It's in there. You've just forgotten the way. And to quote, because I know you're probably going to censor this, there is a Supreme Court case, Cohen versus California, that allows me to use offensive language for political speak. That's bullshit. And any kind of mask mandate telling the people how to act and how to live and how to breathe now is bullshit. What are you doing? There are so many people lined up here talking today, speaking, that have had enough. The fact that I'm here, <laughs> I'm pissed off. And I know pretty much everyone here is too. There are so many more reasons to let this go than to enforce it. We need to restore individual freedom and liberty and responsibility. That's a word that isn't talked about. It's my responsibility to wear a mask if I think I need to for my own health, not yours. It's my responsibility to live my life the way I want to, not yours. We can, as a group and as a community, speak to other things and work together to proceed forward, but it is my responsibility for my health, not yours. This is utter crap. You need to take a serious look at the reason why we're all here. Anyone who's watching in, at home or listening at home, anyone who's listening and watching in the auditorium across the way in the overflow area, it's time to show these members, because they're not listening to us, it's time to show them visibly that we're not taking it anymore. Anchorage, stand up. Yeah. Mask off. Mr. Rivera, you are facing recall soon. I am in your district. You will be seeing me challenging your seat, sir. Thank you. Good day. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome. Hello, I am Sarah Boyer, Eagle River. Uh, regardless of my personal beliefs on the effectiveness of masks, I think we can all agree all medical professionals are not on the Actually, same Actually, ma'am, I'm going to pause your time, and I'm just going to give a reminder for folks in the audience about our COVID-19 protocols and ask uh, for folks to wear their mask. And um, if I need to make further reminders, I will have security start escorting people out. Thanks. Uh, once upon a time, medical professionals that most of you point to as experts have spoken against the effectiveness of masks. But the science behind how the virus behaves has changed so much that their stance has also changed. This had to do with the discovery of asymptomatic spread of the virus, virus, which recently reports have been released pointing to the impact of asymptoma asymptomatic spread being lower than originally forecasted. But that changing science apparently doesn't count. The CDC lists three ways to slow the spread. Wear a mask, stay six feet away from people you don't live with, and avoid crowds. The state of Alaska lists four ways. Um, good hygiene, social distancing, wearing a mask, and getting tested when you are sick. In the past five or six months, the only one that seems to really matter anymore is wearing a mask. People are taking pictures standing next to one another. There are crowds at stores, and you can fly for hours sitting next to a stranger. My fear with the mask is that it's giving a false sense of security for those in the community. The message is simple. Wear a mask. There's no real guidance being pushed on which masks to wear, the importance of changing them, cleaning them, and even potential side effects from prolonged mask wearing. Everyone should wear them and screw your health condu condu conditions if you can't. Children under a certain age don't have to wear them, but Sandra's 90-year-old grandma with COPD does. Masks are being worn many different ways, being hung by re rearview mirrors and not washed properly. It doesn't matter if a pair of underwear, if it's a pair of underwear or made with $1.99 fabric from Joann's, as long as your face is covered. That is all that matters, and it's very concerning to me. If the true goal is to slow the spread and keep people safe, why does nobody care about the cleanliness, effectiveness, and side effects from wearing masks? Furthermore, if we're in the middle of a health crisis, why are we not regulating, regulating other activities that go against slowing the spread guidelines? Like the reasons for which people travel, family vacations and girls trips to Cabo are cool, but restaurants are limited seating. People can shop for curtains and new TVs, PS5s and new appliances. If masks were, were and continue to be so effective, why did they release prisoners instead of just making them wear a mask? 
I know you've heard all of this thousands of times before, and it doesn't really matter what I say, but I wanted to voice my concerns. A lot of my points are shared with the people that are losing faith in the decisions being made regarding COVID mitigation. If you're going to force continued lockdowns and mask wearing onto a free society, you better have a damn good reason for doing it. And so far, the, the virus having a 99% survival rate is not a good enough reason. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We're gonna go ahead and switch to phone testimony. Uh, so first, we're gonna ring up Val McKay. Hello? Hi, Ms. McKay, this is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on public testimony for item 14E, AO 2021-13. You have three minutes, welcome. Yes, sir. I, um, I really don't approve of making the assembly in charge of mask mandates. And then the other part, um, I'm really, I didn't expect a phone call this night. <laughs> I, uh, I really want everything to be back open. My daughter's been in therapy four times a week because we moved to the homeschool thing for all of this and uh, the mask thing, it's she's claustrophobic already. <laughs> so I, I really don't think you guys should have the power to do that. I'm upset about adding more money just so you guys can give yourself raises because yeah, you had to work a little harder this last year or spending more money on a building so you can have better offices this year. You know what? Everybody else had to suck it up. I think you guys should too, as the assembly as a whole. I really, really appreciate that you want to be public servants, but public servants listen. And they find a compromise they do not dictate. I'm unhappy with certain accusations of misconstrued racism or sexuality choices. I, I'm really upset that everybody is throwing a lot of dirt at each other and not working together and not working for us. I, I really believe that you guys were really supposed to work for us, not for your plans. I really, really, really hope you guys understand watching our children in therapy and go through homeschool and then turning us into teachers that are trying to work and make a living. And it's just very, very frustrating. And I really think all of you should listen. And I won't name names, but yes, there is somebody out there championing for us. And there are many others that are disappointing me. And I want to scold them like children. I really, really need all of you to start backing up the people that care. Because guess what? It's just another flu. That's all it is. It's just another virus. You're not going to get herd community by, or herd immunity by not I mean, separating people. No, it's going to get worse because you're going to have to put them back together and they're going to have to develop that immunity. The sooner you do that, the sooner things can happen. Apologies back for normal. interrupting, ma'am, but your time is up. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Thank, thank you, sir. Have a good night. You too. Next, we have Elaine Hedden. Hi, Ms. Hedden, this is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on public testimony for item 14E, AO 2021-13. You have three minutes. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Yeah, let me get on speakerphone. And let me pull up my uh, discussion. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
Okay, great. Thank you. My name is Elaine Hedden, and I'm a physical therapist, and I am speaking on behalf of my patients who are unable and have been unable to wear a mask since masks became mandated in the municipality in June of 2020. I help a number of patients that have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, also known as COPD, congestive heart failure, asthma, or they have been molested and raped in their lives, and they can't tolerate anything over their mouth. I also work with patients that have autism and do not have the mental or emotional ability to handle the stimulation of a mask or even a face shield on their face for five seconds. Many of my patients have been denied access to stores or even medical facilities due to the fact they can't wear masks and the ADA has been of no help for gaining access to medically necessary procedures. Also, there is mounting evidence from the dental community that there's an increase in levels of gum disease, cracked teeth, dental cavities, since this introduction of mask mandates due to the increased level of carbon dioxide under the mask which interferes with the microbiome, increases the acid level of the oral cavity. If this city chooses to make a law where we must wear these yet-to-be-proven masks, then you may be potentially be held liable as a city in class action lawsuits for denying uh, for dental issues or other medical issues that the community at large will more than likely take up in a very short time. Also, what will stop this radical assembly from making the Moderna or Pfizer experimental biological agent being touted as a vaccine, what will keep this radical assembly from making a law that everyone has to be vaccinated? So many of my patients are unaware that if they are injured by a vaccine, they have no legal recourse since 1986. If you get injured by vaccines in the United States, you cannot sue the vaccine manufacturer since 1986. So many people don't know this, but what would keep you from making that a law? The decisions the assembly makes has so much gravity and that I'm not sure if you're aware of the reality of the decisions that you make. Just look around. The levels of stress of my patients are unprecedented and unnecessary. 25 miles away, there's absolutely no mask mandates. And what are their statistics per 100,000 people? There needs to be dialogue and discussion and the Socratic method of asking questions of all sides. I'm all for people if they want to wear a mask and it's their choice and that's fine. But if they are unable, then they should not be forced by the government to do something that goes against their health. Thank you very much and I'm against AO 2021-13. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, put a pause right now on our proceedings. Um, in the middle of Ms. Haddon's testimony, um, the, my timer went off for the hour and a half. So now um, the assembly is gonna make a, um, is gonna have a little bit of a deliberation and one of two things is gonna happen. We will either continue our public testimony today or we will continue our public testimony to a future date. Emphasis on we are gonna be continuing our public testimony. So. Um, at this point, um, Ms. Salatel, I believe you may have a motion for us, then we will deliberate and see what happens. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Move to continue the public testimony to the meeting of April 13. Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. Um, so we're, we're gonna go ahead. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and deliberate uh, and we will take a vote on the motion or amend the motion, whatever we decide to do. So, uh, Ms. Zalatil, do you wanna go ahead and speak to the motion and then we'll get, go on with our deliberation? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as was indicated at the work session and previously, the intent um, by myself, or of myself in bringing forward um, this particular ordinance was so that we had time to have public hearing and start the conversation. Um, and keep it going um, so that we have um, options that don't solely rely on the emergency declaration. Shifting the date to April 13th, that is the next date, we are likely to take up a continuance of the emergency declaration um, and we will be in a better position to know um, the utility of the ordinance as well as kind of the lay of the land. Thanks. 
Thank you. Uh, so next we have Ms. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to amend that amendment to say that we will continue to hear the public hearing we have here before us tonight and continue additional public hearing on April 13th. So just add that portion in be, uh, before that April 13th date to continue the public hearing that we have before us. It looks like there's maybe seven people in line. And so maybe we can finish that up. Yeah. And I would like people to understand, well, I guess I need a second on that first. But uh, actually, what I'm going to try to do is see if the mover and seconder of the motion agree to that. And then okay. if not, we will go ahead and do an amendment to the motion. Thank you. So Ms. Zalatel, we'll start with you, then I'll go to Mr. Constant. Um, so since I'm not there, I apologize, but I can't get a good sense of how many people are left to testify, so I don't know if I can agree to that. Um, because I do want to see us get the rest of our business done. Okay, um, thank you. So with the mover not agreeing, then I will go back to Ms. Kennedy. Well, thank you then. I have made an amendment to the amendment, so I, I guess I'm awaiting second. a second. Yeah, so just, just to be clear, so the motion we have before us is to continue the public hearing to April 3rd, so you're wanting to amend that motion for us to conclude the public hearing we have today, not necessarily conclude, but continue the public hearing till we get through everyone and then continue it after that even further to April 13th. Yes. Okay, great. So is there a second for that motion? Second. Okay, seconded okay. by Ms. Allard. Do you want to speak to it further? I would please, thank yeah. you. Um, and I just want people to know that the way we handle public hearings like this, if you've testified once, you don't get to testify the second time. So if there is continuation on April 13th, those that testified today will not be testifying again on April 13th unless there's a different, unless there's an S version uh, that's uh, a substitute version that's uh, introduced for that April 13th meeting. But I believe that since we have, we do have people who came out specifically to testify the, to this, even though I think to a certain extent it's a good thing that this is being extended till April. Obviously there's no real rush to want to vote this in at this point. Um, but I, I, th I want them to understand that um, uh, I think we can get through what we have here tonight and then continue on, but thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dunbar, did you want to speak to this amendment to the motion? Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll speak now. I, I mean, it, it applies to the amendment to this motion and to the, and to the motion itself. I, I do not support the motion. Um, I don't think that the conversation that has been sort of stirred up by this um, ordinance is very productive um, for a couple of reasons. One, because as we've heard tonight, there have been, it has been a, become a platform for disinformation about what masks are and what masks do. It also has become, I think, a distraction in terms of what the law actually is. The emergency order is a law, and if we vote this up or down or if we let it hang in the air, I think people are confused about whether or not the emergency order itself Will continue. Um, I think this is a good faith effort to put this into ordinance um, from, or rather to put it into code using an ordinance based on the conversations we had in the fall. Uh, but I think it's pretty clear that um, the folks that argued for doing that, at least some of them, have now come around to the idea that we shouldn't do that at all. Um, so I, my preference is that we resolve it tonight if we can. And if we can't, um, I would actually like us to see it, us continue this at a meeting tomorrow night and resolve it then. Um, if the chair is opposed to that, then I would say the next February meeting. But I'd like this resolved as soon as possible um, because, again, I don't think the conversation is spurred has been productive. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Whittleton, do you want to speak on the amendment? Uh, yeah, and actually, um, I think Mr. Dunbar's statement is, is pr pretty much where I'm landing on this. You know, if I don't understand why there would be a delay to April 13th. You know, if it makes sense to move it to kind of the normal system of an ordinance, it makes sense tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And if it doesn't make sense, it won't make any more sense on April 13th. If the goal is to just kind of see where we are with COVID then, well, you know, if, if this were passed soon, then we would retract it. You know, we would say, okay, we're done. Um, or just leave it as an EO and let it happen that way. You know, I, I just don't see a delayed April 13th and have this as lingering out there all that time makes sense. So I'm more inclined um, 
to finish the public hearing here, and it looks like we've got probably more than a dozen, um, you know, if we can, and then extend it, maybe not to a special meeting, but just um, do the deliberation or finish the public hearing at our next meeting in February. So I don't, I guess, what is my answer there? I think I'd say no to your amendment because I want to finish this sooner, but I would like to fin do more testimony tonight and then just make our deliberation much sooner. Thank you. Ms. Allard on the amendment. Thank you. I, I'd like to finish the public testimony tonight too, but I'd also like to uh, do the final vote and extend it to, I believe Ms. Zolotel said the 13th of April. I agree with that with uh, Ms. Kennedy. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Presvidia on the amendment. Thank you. Uh, I have to echo some of my um, colleagues' comments. I, I think that the majority of the testimony tonight is about the, you know, the whether masks work or don't work and, and sort of all of the conversations around masks as opposed to whether we should move um, EOs to AOs. Um, I, I, I would prefer that we, we end this tonight. I, I, uh, I think that, that it was a good faith effort to um, think about how to move from the emergency orders to or ordinances um, but I, I don't, I, I certainly don't, um, I'm, I'm not in favor of it. I, I, I think that, that we need to continue to, to keep them as EOs and when there's no longer a need for it, then we end it. So, um, and I, I think that extending this uh, for weeks or months just kind of creates confusion and, and, uh, and extends the conversation beyond what's necessary. So I would really encourage my colleagues to finish the, the, the testimony tonight. I would encourage those that are going to te testify to, to, um, to um, you know, fo fo focus on whether we should move them from EOs to, to AOs and, um, and finish it tonight and, and then move on. Um, I, I, I certainly am not going to be in favor of, of moving them into or or ordinances um, out of the emergency order. So um, I'm hoping to get this done and move on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, so I have a couple of folks left in the queue, and then I would like us to vote. Ms. Zalatel? I withdraw the motion to continue the public hearing. Does the seconder agree? Yes. Okay, so then that, that withdraws the main motion that we have before us. Uh, Mr. Weddleton? Mr. Chair. Um, I... So, Mr. Constant, I'm going to go ahead and put you uh, back in the queue. I will come back to you, okay? Uh, so we'll start with Mr. Weddleton. So I'd move to continue the public hearing this evening um, and see if we can get through it Second. as much as possible. We, we don't need a motion for that because we're in the middle of the public sure. hearing. Okay. So, so we can continue the public hearing without any, any further motions. I just put a pause on the public okay. hearing so that we can have this deliberation. Yeah. Um, okay, so... I'm going to go ahead and go through the queue as I see it. Mr. Constant? Yeah, I, I don't believe anything that we do tonight is going to end the public hearing tonight. So I just want people to recognize that I believe there are more people on the phone list substantially. Um, if I'm wrong, if it's only seven people left, we should definitely let's just get it done or 12, but I don't think that's the case. Thank you. Yeah, and at that point, that is when we will deliberate if we want to continue the public hearing to tomorrow as an example, which I've already stated I would prefer we not, uh, that we just continue the public hearing to the second meeting in February. But that's a second deliberation we will have. Uh, Ms. Allard, then Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Chair. Can I just um, move to postpone indefinitely? Um, so I, I need to double check with our um, Council, but because we have not closed the public hearing, yep, I don't. I just I, did. That's why I'm asking. Dean knows. Uh, sure. Go ahead, Mr. Gates, if you want to uh, address that. Uh, Mr. Gates, are you able to address that question? Um, I'm actually looking that up right now. If you could give me uh, one or two minutes. Sure. Um, so, 
Mr. Dunbar, did you have a motion to make or just a comment? I have a question and then perhaps a motion. And so my question for you, uh, Mr. Chair, is um, if you're willing to uh, continue to tomorrow um, and have us you know, perhaps fulfill, uh, finish this. And also, uh, c can you tell us how many more people are signed up to, to testify over the phone so we have a sense of the, the length? And then my point is, it, it, I guess my last question is, do, do any of us feel that we should change the order of the day and perhaps pass the other items now? Do we feel that those are in any way time sensitive? Thank you. Uh, thanks. So um, first on tomorrow, uh, yeah, as I've stated already, um, I, I would prefer we not have a continued meeting tomorrow. Uh, I would prefer it, if we need to continue the public hearing on this item that we do that to the second meeting in February and then hopefully we're able to finish it up, do the deliberation and vote at that meeting. In terms of uh, length in person, there are probably about a dozen folks in line and then We've gone through the phone list once, and as usual, I go through the phone list twice for the people we didn't hear from or weren't able to connect with, and that is four individuals on the phone list we were not able to connect with. Okay, great. Well, the, in that case, Mr. Chair, I'm not going to make a, a motion to change the order of the day. It sounds like there are, you know, maybe a dozen, maybe two dozen more people left to testify, and I guess I would just urge people in the, in the room that are thinking about testifying, I believe that there are the votes to postpone this indefinitely, to table it, if you will, so um, the sooner you let us vote on it and close public hearing, the sooner that will happen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Gates, do you have an answer to the question posed by Ms. Allard? Uh, yes, we need to conclude the public hearing before we can do that action. Does that answer the question? <laughs> yes, that does. Yep. Okay, Ms. LaFrance, and then I think there's sort of a majority will, so I'd like us to move on, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, um, I was going to say that I am in favor of postponing this indefinitely for the reasons that Mr. Dunbar said in terms of the discussion. Um, I don't know if, and I don't mean to unnecessarily complicate, but if there's a way to close the public hearing and put that motion forward, I would like to do that. Uh, thank you. So uh, municipal code does give me some tools to close a public hearing, but I would suggest that this circumstance is not one of those that applies. So um, we're going to hear from as many people as possible. I think as Mr. Dunbar has stated, um, I think there is will on this body from everything that I'm hearing to postpone this indefinitely. So we can do that tonight if we finish the public hearing. So unless there's anything else, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and continue the public hearing so that hopefully we can actually take a vote to postpone this indefinitely. Welcome. Hello, my name is Amber Glasser. Man, you guys are something else. Um, the testimonies that I've heard tonight are amazing. The misinformation through the chair that uh, Mr. Dunbar is speaking of, um, I, I don't know where he's getting that. So, he, you know, we, we can all, and my, um, my assembly person is Mr. Perez Vierda, and I wish he was here, but he's not. So, um, you know, we can all find a narrative to fit whatever outcome we want to see, right? And those are his words from a conversation that I had with him over the phone. And um, I, I just, we are doing this wrong. You guys have got to step up and start listening to us. Put your phones down. Um, acknowledge your constituents. And this, this mask mandate, I have been testifying it on it over and over and over again. I urge a no vote. I would love to see it indefinitely tabled this this is nonsense and I would also like to echo what uh, Maria said earlier and I've said this to you guys before and I'm gonna say it again you are not acknowledging the mass amounts of people around the world that have suffered physical abuse I personally have had 
an ex put his hand over my nose and mouth for two years. He tried to kill me multiple times, and I was a teenager. I had moved out of my house. I told you this before. I was living a double life. I've been raped multiple times by different people, and I have never gone to law enforcement because of the, the shame revolving around all of this. And, and you guys, you don't understand how many kids have autism. You don't understand how many grown adults like myself are still suffering PTSD from abuse. You don't under, I have periodontal disease. I am one of those people who cannot mask up because it will affect my oral health. You guys can't make health decisions for your constituents. Who is going to be liable? And I, I know that you don't want to be held liable. I know that the city doesn't want to be held liable. I mean, my, and let's go on to the kids because I only have 30 seconds. My kids are suffering. That mom testifying, do you guys, excuse me, um, assembly, can you pay attention to me? Like, what, do you not care about if your parents, if you have kids, you, you should understand what we're going through. And the rest of the state is living their best life and Anchorage, we are the economic hub for the state, and you're destroying us. You're destroying our mental health, and you're destroying our hearts, and you guys need to show more love. Please. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome. Hello, my name is Susan Snow, and I live in District 6, so Assembly People of France and Muddleton, um, you are my representatives, and I want to say thank you for doing that. Um, I also want to say thank you to the other assembly people. I may not agree with you hardly any of the time, but you did step up to the plate. Um, to the sponsors of this AO, or EO to AO, I would just have a few comments. I don't agree with you. I'll keep this pretty short, but when I contacted you, you say that you've heard from many people who don't like it that the mayor has the kind of unilateral authority over these issues for such a prolonged time. Instead of an AO, I think there is a much easier way to make sure that the mayor doesn't have this kind of unilateral authority for such a long time. You, as an assembly, have the ability to stop extending the emergency declaration which gives the mayor these emergency powers. I've been believe you have been given at least six of the opportunities to do this. And I'll just keep it short and say that to the sponsors and the assembly on this AO, EO to AO effort, it's not necessary to keep kicking the can down the proverbial road. So I urge you not to pass this effort and furthermore not to continue granting the mayor, acting mayor, emergency powers. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome. Uh, good evening. My name is Victor Knott. I'm a 56-year resident of, of the city of Anchorage. I stand beho before you in opposition to the AO 2021-13. For decades, this town has had its ups and downs. But until the last four years, this town has seen nothing but destruction by its assembly members, mayor and the acting city manager. All of you should be proud of what you're doing to this town. I'm sure your parents are. You have succeeded in not only killing our economy, but our way of life as many of us know it. You do not care what is happening to this town and its children as long as you keep inching towards your utopia agenda. I'm telling you with the exception of one of the assembly members that what you're doing is wrong. And as I've been told growing up as a kid, karma will come back and haunt you. With this mask law, you're pushing residents to move out of this town and forcing people to travel to the valley to do their shopping. They're killing this town. You are killing this town financially. It is a scientific fact, medically proven, 
that wearing these phony mask coverings is causing short and long-term respiratory health issues and some reported deaths nationwide. Also, I'd like to play a little short excerpt that was, that was recorded from Dr. Zink from the state of Alaska. I don't know if you can hear that. I just wanted a health care professional to address that. Yes, no, thank you. Um, and it's a question that we get often, so thank you for bringing that up. Here's a map currently. Having consistent information is incredibly important. Um, as Dr. Jay Butler said, we're really fighting four epidemics right now. One is the coronavirus, this novel coronavirus, but there's also an epidemic of fear, stigma, and misinformation. And having consistent good information is incredibly important. So I appreciate the time to share this here, and we are kind of working around the clock to get out consistent information in any way that we can. With that information, she does state that masks do not work. With that, I wish all of you would take a sincere personal check and turn down this AO 2021-13. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. All right, we're going to go ahead and switch back to the phones. Um, so we're going to uh, try folks for a second time. We'll start with Ms. Rebecca Gall. Remember, you... Your call has been forwarded. Next, we will try Miss Gail Hadley. Hello, this is Gail Hadley. And then last, before going back to in-person, we will try Mr. Ron Dewitt. Hello, Ron here. Hi, Mr. Dewitt. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on public testimony for uh, item 14E, AO 2021-13. You have three minutes. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Uh, again, my name's Ron Dewitt. Uh, I'm a college professor, and uh, I'm also retired law enforcement. 28 years, I retired from the U.S. Marshal Service 2008. The citizens of our city and our nation have been subjected to draconian anti-COVID measures for nearly a year. Forced business lockdowns, mandatory masking, and social distancing in response to public safety, they're not the panacea to conquering this disease. Our society has become an Orwellian lifestyle that is perverse, as well as spiritually and mentally debilitating. Even our suicides have increased in our nation at an exponential rate due to a forced isolation in several states. Uh, many physicians even disagree with the so-called effectiveness of masks. One of my doctors from the Mayo Clinic in Phoenix and my local infectious disease doctor here in Anchorage stated that masks are limited in their effectiveness. Wearers of masks of certain types uh, can even possibly run the risk of contracting hypercapnia if they're worn for prolonged periods of time. This is also a problem when wearing masks while exercising in gyms. Uh, it, it can create uh, some serious uh, medical problems, and this must stop. Moreover, germs are also spread from the soles of our shoes and trapped into our homes and places of work. They also attach themselves to our outer clothing. The absorption of germs into our system uh, through our eyes is also uh, problematic. 
even more precarious is the enforcement aspect of this proposed AO. How will this work in a pragmatic sense? Uh, this will detract police from performing essential duties that truly matter. Moreover, this measure uh, potentially will turn honest citizens into criminals. Therefore, why are we utilizing uh, force masking now? There have always been dangerous diseases amongst us, thousands. Yet we have never reacted in this malicious manner in the past in our country. Now that anti-COVID vaccines are being dispensed, we should be moving toward opening up, unmasking, and returning to a state of normalcy. Now, that being said, on another note, a different topic, I just wish to state briefly that my, one of my representatives, uh, Ms. Jamie Allred, has been maligned and misunderstood. Her argument was solely related to First Amendment issues. To accuse her of being pro-Nazi and anti-Semitic is pure stupidity and political grandstanding. Uh, that's all I have to say, sir. Thank you for your testimony. You're welcome. All right, we're going to go ahead and switch back to in person. Welcome. Okay, um, my name is uh, Mark Marion, M-E-R-I-O-N. Um, I live in uh, Dunbar in Peterson's district. And what I can tell you um, as a um, someone who was born of special needs, I want to relay to a testimony that was done a couple weeks ago by Miss Gall with her 12-year-old son. And if you change the environment radically to a special needs uh, child, it, it, it does make it hard for them to be able to um, weather or be able to adapt and, um, and that sort of thing. Um, I would say we need to, um, considering this ordinance is gonna be probably put in the trash can anyway just by the, the way you guys are doing this anyway. Um, I would say that um, just let the um, business owners decide whether they want to enforce the, the um, mandates or not because that's how it's been, been doing it and that's how it's been done. Um, I mean, it costs too much money to have co code enforcers. And let me also tell you something else. In the cold weather, wearing a, a face shield and a mask, it fogs up. Doesn't work very well. And you're going to find that out, uh, what, you know, with the, the the fairies on the outside. When you wear glasses, it fogs up. And I can tell you, um, you'd be better off just letting the people decide whether they want to wear a mask or not. Um, I see it, um, I work in a, at a re retail outlet. There are some people that choose not to wear a mask. And as long as our manager has basically said that if they don't um, make a scene or anything, you can suggest that they wear a mask, but not force them. So um, I basically, um, I say, let's just uh, scrap this ordinance, which I, I kind of see that that's kind of where this body is going with this anyway. So um, let's just uh, put this in the trash heaper and forget about it. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome. Good evening. For the record, my name is Bernadette Wilson. There's been some incredible testimony tonight. We could sit here and go through all of this debate as to whether or not masks work or the latest study that someone has, but the reality is it's the wrong conversation. This body is so far off topic, it's embarrassing. Whether your mask is effective or not, your chances of surviving COVID are greater than 99%. That is where your focus needs to be. You politically are trying to distract people
people with what's going on over here. But let's assume for a moment that you all buy your own BS. Let's assume that everybody out here is wrong and you guys are right. Then why on earth is it that I've been to more assembly members than the member that happens to be running for mayor? Where's everybody else? If your masks work, why aren't you showing up? The reality is you want to change this to a law because you know your mandate can't be enforced. Now you have people all over the streets of Anchorage pooping, peeing, having sex, walking around naked, and you can't even figure out how to enforce the dang laws you already have on the books. I'll tell you what, you guys got your hands full. You don't need another law that you can't enforce. But the reality is Anchorage residents, you are being played. This assembly knows this has not a damn thing to do with masks. You know the debate on why to change this from an emergency ordinance to an assembly ordinance? Why all the back and forth about April 13th, maybe, maybe not? Because you're being politically played. Because you know that a new direction is coming. You know that this mayor and those policies are on their way out the door and you are panicked. This has everything to do about who you think is going to be next in the mayor's seat. That is completely what this is about. How can the assembly get control? If it was about masks, you would be content to let this emergency order sit. It has not a darn thing to do with that. And you have played everyone trying to convince them that this is about masks. No, it's not. The assembly member who wants to bait about should we wait till April 13th and all the confusion, well, why April? That's not what we've done. How convenient. That's after an election. Now, you have a lot of people showing up here, thank God, that haven't shown up in the years past. And you all think that you can pull one over them. Let me tell you something. They're not stupid. And I'll leave you with this. My challenge to any one of you, how about you sign the waiver that if anyone gets sick or has any complications from wearing a mask, you will assume responsibility. And then I will rest my case. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome. For folks on the phone, apologies. We're just sorting an interpreter situation out. Uh, so just give us a, a second and then uh, we will be back. Okay. Yeah. Oh. My interpreter's on my iPad. And uh, um, the setup here is different, but I think I can voice translate what she's saying. But uh, can you read the interpreter here? Will that help you? <laughs> Excuse me. So I can voice for her to the record, but for her to understand if you have questions for her, I have an interpreter on the iPad. Will that help? Okay. So um, 
She says, my name, my name is Dati, B-A-T-I-E-M-M-A, E-M-M-A-S, E-M-M-A-B-E-G, E-M-M-A, Emma Bagel, me, oh, Emma Bagley, Oh, Begley, B-E-G-L-E-Y. Yes, sure. Um, I guess that's a visual you can all understand. Mr. Chair, I think we should stop that. Mr. Order. Vice Chair, go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Vice Chair, I can hear you. Uh, point of order. Um, we need to stop the fire here. Do, do we have okay. security available or something? Yeah, security, if we can please handle that, please. So if you can. Oh. Okay. Thank you. She says, good, good. Well, thank you. Did you need this paper? No. Thank you for collecting that. I can, oh, um, if you speak to her, I think she should see the interpreter. And sure. You do it, but yeah. Um, Is there any further testimony? Dean, if you could help with that. Do you have any further testimony? She wants three minutes. So I, I will go ahead and put two minutes back on the clock. Go ahead. Please continue. She wants three minutes. Uh, again, I, I will go ahead and put two minutes back on the clock. The, um, the fire uh, issue uh, was, was about a minute. All right, thank you. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and go back to the phones. We just have one individual to try on the phones. Can and I then... move to extend the meeting to midnight? Uh, sure, yeah, we can go ahead and do that before we continue. Uh, is there a second for that second. motion? Second. Okay. Moved and second. seconded. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion to extend to midnight? Let's finish. Yeah, I think the idea is we will finish 14E and then uh, assembly comments and then adjourn. Um, the remainder of our agenda will just move on to our second meeting in February. Is there any opposition to extending to midnight? Okay, uh, then uh, let's go ahead and move on. Then we're extended to midnight. So let's go ahead and try Miss Shannon Slater one more time. And then that'll complete our phone testimony. Remember you... All right, so that completes our phone testimony, uh, so the remainder is just in person. Welcome. Good evening, Andrew Satterfield. 
I'm tired and I'm not very smart man, so I'll try and make this short. I'd rather be with my children right now. Uh, it seems like you guys have gotten very smart people, very uh, passionate people, and you're probably not really interested to uh, continue to hear facts or reasonable information. So I'm going to try to appeal to you as leaders, as a small business owner, because you probably chose this to be a leader in your community, to try and bring solutions and to help those who are lost and needing things. So let's SWOT this, S-W-O-T, and see if we should really pass this. The strengths of this is that it's going to force everybody to comply to one standard. And that standard and changing that standard is going to be up to those who are elected here. That doesn't sound like a very good strength. The weakness in this is that it restrains the mayor, who right now, as I understand it, he, by whipping his pencil out, can take away the emergency order at any time. The weakness restrains him from listening to his constituents and only holds it up to you guys, who you guys get elected, I don't know, every six years or something. Again, not a very smart man. The opportunity in this is for you guys to continue to create fear in this community. We need leaders who are going to tell us how to be innovative, who are going to provide solutions, and who are going to be with us in this. And I don't really feel that with you. I don't really see my children feeling that with you. And it's unfortunate that I have to involve my children with this. So I pray that you guys are given great wisdom, humility, and love for the taxpayers, for the common people that support you, who pay you for your jobs. Yes, I'm sure you're tired of hearing that. That you would begin to see that Anchorage is strong enough, smart enough, and caring enough to get through this without any more uh, assembly ordinances, without any more sticking into the mud and deciding which companies get to survive and which don't. It's been ridiculous seeing Fred Myers full of places, but you see restaurants that are empty. It's just a little bit over the top, ladies and gentlemen, that I'm talking to my wife about driving my kids out to Three Bears twice a month just to get out of your fear mongering. I understand that there's experts and I understand that the science is out. I understand that I'll probably be considered a white nationalist after this, but unfortunately, I believe in the power of America and that we can overcome crazy, ridiculous things without legislation. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, my name is Stephen Duplantis. I am uh, a pastor who is not pastoring right now because my denomination is, uh, does not want to operate in their First Amendment rights. And uh, that's kind of where I'm at. And what I want to, what I want to address, it, it, before I get into what I wanted to, was, was, was said during the debates a little while ago about the misinformation that has been out here. Let me tell you about some misinformation. My wife suffers from a, 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 a disability. She's a 100% disabled vet. She suffers from a, a, a condition called postural orthopedic tachycardia syndrome means that the blood, the heart doesn't get enough oxygen and she passes out, okay? She was in the VA about a month ago at an at a, at a appointment. She had the stupid mask on and passed out. So I got a phone call from the VA. Your wife just passed out. Oh, my God. I had to meet her over at the hospital. She's in the hospital and she's got to wear a mask in the hospital and she even told her the reason why I passed out was because I wore the mask. Now, you see, that's not misinformation. That's, that's experiential. This is happening to us. And you guys don't, you, you don't even listen. I mean, it's, it's like I feel like I'm talking to a brick wall. It really does. And especially to hear that, that being said, that the misinformation that's being uh, spewed out here tonight, that we should stop the public testimony. It's not misinformation. It's our lives. This is our lives. I want to quote from a man about a week ago who said, there's nothing we can do to change the trajectory of the pandemic in the next several months. That's our president. He said that. So what are you, what are you doing? It, if there's nothing we can do to change it, what are you doing? I, 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 I don't understand the logic in that. So I want to speak to the people behind me that if you believe 
that the Constitution overrules what's going on here, then why aren't you doing something about it? These are the, I'm talking to you guys back here. Because you're all sitting there with masks on. If you know that that's unconstitutional, what the hell are you doing with the mask on? The only power that these people have over you is the power you're allowing them to have. Take it back because it's yours. For me, it ends tonight. You see this mask? In the updated words of Johnny Paycheck, take this mask and shove it. I'm not wearing it no more. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome. My name is Eugene Carl Haberman, Alaska resident for over 43 years, 20 years of that an Anchorage resident and currently a Valley resident. I follow the public process. When the public process is done appropriately, decision made by the governed by is more likely public interest. I guess I don't recall anyone speaking for a mask in this room tonight or on the phone. Maybe there was one, but it was basically on the first one. It scares me scares me to what is what the public is uh, addressing you they have a right to freedom of speech but the problem is here is there's a responsibility of all of us to be responsible and caring for each other and with this emergency we're having right now the least we can all do is wear a face covering many there's exceptions yes for certain medical conditions that they can't wear a face mask and there's noted in their legislation you got but I'd like to start with this key thing about what the assembly did to, with this ordinance. You know, I've raised concern about the administration, the assembly giving the administration and developing mandates and so forth, and pretty much the assembly was out of the picture. I am glad to see the assembly taking a step to push through and introduce ordinances, bring it as law, and not, and take a, and, and that the public here is not seeing that here. This is a very important step. You are closer to dealing with the issue, not sending it over to the administration and they're dealing with the issue. And that was not said tonight. It's hurtful, it's hard, but that was the right thing to do. What also is not known to, to the public here, that even if you fail to prove this mass thing, that doesn't stop the administration with their orders until the, until the assembly knocks off that mass thing. And by approving or disapproving this ordinance here tonight doesn't change that. It has to be that order. Someone has to correct the narrative that's been provided to so many people. Now, I also want to say these words I've said a long time in this COVID. So many people are confusing freedom with responsibility. And I am concerned, too, if so many people have lost their jobs. So many companies are out of business and wanting those who are in business and having jobs are wanting the future. But the least we can do to make sure that the people will have their jobs in the future and keep those jobs is be responsible and party to this issue and not provide a false narrative. And that's what's happened here tonight. A continued false narrative of what we're dealing with COVID and what we all can do. And I'd also like to remind you in Palmer at Fred Myers, those people, employees, are wearing a mask all day long. The people who come into Fred Myers, it's just a few minutes to come in and out that they have to wear a mask. They're not showing respect to those employees in Fred Myers. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And thank you for what you're trying to do. Welcome. Hello, my name is Karen Henniger, and I live in District 5. I am stating my opposition to AO 2021-13. I've attended the last several assembly meetings, and the blatant disregard, disregard of public testimony and opinion is shameful. <phone rings> Regardless of, of party affiliation, each assembly member is responsible to represent all of the voters in his or her district. This job is to mediate between differing opinions 
and create compromises that can best reflect the whole district's needs, not to follow personal political agendas. As the vice, as Vice Chair Wendleton said earlier, the voters are the bosses of all of us. Those elected positions do not give this assembly the powers, the, the assembly members the power or the right to make medical decisions for me or for my family. As recommended by this assembly to get involved on a local level, I attended my local, my quarterly community council for the first time this last Thursday evening and was accepted into the Zoom meeting a little late because, it, it was, well, due to my not seeing the smaller notation on time and meeting changes at the bottom of the Facebook page. I listened through the meeting for roughly half an hour before the meeting began to adjourn. I interjected then, apologizing for any unintentional etiquette breach because I had not heard anything about AO 2021-13. In short, the meeting was adjourned anyway and I was asked if I wanted to speak to one of my assembly members who was present at the meeting. I said no and stated my lack of faith in his willingness to listen to my opinion. After a brief moment of going back and forth, excuse me one moment, after a brief moment of going back and forth with those on Zoom and this assembly member, I again expressed my opposition to the upcoming ordinance. My assembly member's last comment before I was muted and dropped from the Zoom call was, well, I have the vote now, don't I? All, sir, all of you may smugly be enjoying your power right now, but your abuse of that privilege is egregious. And in the end, the voters will remember and use their authority as your bosses to vote you out. You and the majority of this assembly wield mandates and ordinances in a manner that smacks of despotism. And I ask Anchorage to stand up and take back that power through their voices and their votes. It's about time to give up on this assembly, not because we don't care, but because you don't. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome. My name is Deanna Nelson. I'm in District 5. I emailed some of my concerns to all of you um, and was replied to very rapidly and thoughtfully by uh, Mr. Riddleton. Thank you very much. Um, masks have been the topic of discussion this evening. I would like to divert from that just a little bit. And I have to start by saying I'm so disappointed in the assembly member who by phone, um, okay, I'm gonna back up just a second. Many people who have spoken here lump all these assembly members, including the ones that we can't see, and that's so unfortunate, together. You know, like, it's, it's you all, it's you against us, you know, and it, it, it's grievous to me to hear that, and it's grievous that we feel not listened to because we're not engaged with visually. Um, but then to hear him say, um, lumping everyone who has spoken this evening into a category of spreading disinformation, including uh, the woman who is a wife of a pulmonary specialist, the doctor who takes care of the patients at the, at the um, Pioneer Home. It, it's astounding to me to have that kind of disrespect shown. I'm sorry, oh my word, I'm so sorry to hear that. Okay, I'm gonna say what I'm gonna say now. Um, I did listen to the work session twice. Um, I had to listen slowly so I could take notes, but I listened the second time so I could absorb what was being said and what your concerns primarily are. And what I heard um, was a concern, first of all, um, Ms. Vogel said that we were in a, she used the words, the state of emergency in which we are in now. Mr. Wheeler said, um, an emergency is unforeseen, unforeseen circumstances. We're no longer facing unforeseen circumstances. We had an earthquake, okay? Now we're having aftershocks. But those, those really, you know, are not going on anymore. If you look at the website that the Muni um, keeps that anybody can look, click on to that says how many emergency room beds are over, open, how many psychiatric beds are open. It's the psych beds. It's those psych wards that are closed. Not the emergency rooms anymore. That's not the problem anymore. Okay? So I think it's helpful to acknowledge that we're not in a state of emergency. I was, an, I was a nurse in Nome for 10 years. I know what emergencies are. We're not there anymore. 
what we are in, and that's been mentioned, is that we are in a state of heightened alertness. That is called hypervigilance. That is more dangerous than emergencies because the ramifications go on farther than emergencies. You take care of an emergency and it's over. Hypervigilance is not. Man, I'm sorry. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you. And I'll be emailing testimony. you the rest of my questions. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Um, my name is Carson Brennan Young. Um, I'm a Midtown resident. Um, so Felix and Meg are my representatives. I've been in the restaurant industry for uh, a year. So it's been an interesting year. Um, I started off actually volunteering for you on your campaign. Um, this time around, I'm spending a lot of time here trying to figure out how I can get us all back to work and how I can do that. And I've been watching how the assembly functions. And when I was looking at this, a weird question kind of occurred to me. Um, well, a lot of questions did. Um, but one of them, the one I uh, wanted to raise, was with Forrest. And I know I can ask, I can ask questions you're not required to answer, right? That's correct? So typically questions, uh, we take them up during deliberation. So you can ask them and then, and then we may uh, answer them during deliberation after the public hearing. Okay. Um, my question is for Forrest. You're running for mayor. If masks are safe and effective, and we're requiring, required to wear them, and those requirements are being enforced in this building, then why have you not been present for an assembly meeting for months? Oh, wait, I got two minutes. So as I stated before, sir, uh, questions are typically answered during deliberation after the public hearing. Okay. He can answer now, though, if he wants. He has that option. And he's got a minute and 45 seconds. You there for us? That is funny now, isn't it? It's kind of ironic. Run, Forrest, run. <laughs> so do you have any further testimony on the topic we have before us, sir? Uh, yeah, I just want him to answer the question. So I, I've already um, stated the rules of the body. And he has so. a minute and 10 seconds to answer. You can sure. Point of order. Uh, sure, I'll go ahead and pause the time. Uh, uh, go ahead, Ms. Allard. If, I, if I'm not mistaken, maybe, maybe it's a point of information. But if I'm not mistaken, he could technically stand there for the remainder of his time and wait silently, correct? Um, he, that is that is what is happening right now. Okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Good call on the Jeopardy music, whoever did that, I really like that. <laughs> All right, that concludes your time, thank you. <laughs> Welcome. And if you can turn the mic on, it's the yellow button. Thank you. Uh, Mark Nesbaum, for the record. Does it always, doesn't always sound like an echo, does it? C could you state your name again for the record, please? Mark Nussbaum. Great, that's, and, that's much better. We can hear you much more clearly. Um, you know, I had a, I had a whole thing written up <laughs> but uh my colleagues covered it pretty well this evening uh i think you've heard 
Uh, I spent, let me rewind a little bit, I spent uh, quite a bit of time reading through the email testimony that you guys post. I think it was like 150 emails or something, so I don't know if you read them or not, but I applaud you if you do try to at least peruse through them. I didn't read them all, I just perused through them, but um, I saw quite a bit of opposition and not so much um, for this extension or moving this into an AO. And I think those that we did hear the, the support from were affected personally, um, but that shouldn't take away how the opposition is affected personally. Um, I mean, I don't, I, I could say everything that I wanted to say, but it would sound just like uh, everything people have already said. So I just wanted to uh, maybe take my next minute and a half or so to um, read the uh, uh, subsection of the ethics code that says, Holding public office or employment is a public trust. The proper functioning of democratic government requires ethical behavior by public officials and employees. Ethel ethical behavior involves the commitment to take individual responsibility in creating a government that earns the trust and respect. Sir, I'm going to pause your time for a second. I just want to double check. Is this going to eventually be germane to the topic way up before us? Uh, absolutely, that's why I'm, I'm here. Okay, great, please continue. All who serve the municipality have a solemn responsibility to avoid improper conduct. So, while we're talking, I, oh, well here, let me get to the point. I oppose AO 202113. Um, I'm glad that you're looking up at me, Felix, because uh, I saw the assembly, I witnessed the assembly recognize the Save Seawolf Hockey group this evening, and then you welcomed that gentleman to the podium so that he could thank you, and if you want me to send the video to you of you on your phone the whole time that he's thanking you for that recognition, I can do that. Um, I, I just, I can't, you had 63 people in here at 550, you still had 60 at 6 o'clock, I don't know if that means anything to you. The smaller security guard, if he's still here, told me the number was 55, and then I assume it's his boss, wherever he went, uh, confirmed that it's 55. And I said, well, you got 63, and he went, eh. I went, okay, so if I can sneak in here, I, I get in. Um, we do not forgive, we do not forget, expect us. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome. My name's Rachel Colvard, and I just wanted to give a quick shout out to Lisa Huffman. Um, when my son was in second grade, we had a rough patch, and she gave me a book to read called Love and Logic, and I just wanted to give a public thank you uh, for being a wonderful educator. Thank you. Um, we have 300,000 people, roughly, in Anchorage. You have 34 people in the entirety of the state in the hospital for COVID. 34. 300,000 in town. 750, maybe 800,000, I don't know. We'll have the numbers from the Census Bureau about April 1st ish. ish. Uh, that's ridiculous for this much fear. That's fear porn that you all have put out there. Is there something going out there? You bet. My BFF's husband had the double pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia, and COVID and spent over 10 days in the hospital, nearly died. Thank God he didn't. It's real. You all have mismanaged this thing right into the ground. So in preparing for today's meeting, I also looked up your 86 pages of written testimony on all the subjects. You had 86 pages that are uh, a PDF attached to the, the agenda for today. 55 of those deal with this particular subject. 40 of those are against, 15 or four. We had one speaker tonight, four. And you had over almost 40 people speaking against tonight. That's 80 to 16 people. I think the public's been really clear with you about what we want to happen. 
and I am jumping on that train. I am against AO 2021-13. This, this is not the right way. Even Dr. Fauci agrees. Let me pull this up here. Oh, by the way, you have about 200 people watching online right now. Hey, Anchorage. Dr. Fauci, in a 2008 paper that he was um, a co-author on, predominant role of bacterial pneumonia, remember my BFF's husband, as a cause of death in the pandemic influenza, implications for pandemic influenza preparedness. In particular, they studied the Spanish flu. Same H1N1 virus, and has already been testified that uh, that was the predominant cause, that bacterial pneumonia was the predominant cause due to mask wearing in that pandemic, as in this one. Also, I'd really like to see my dentist. She can't perform my services right now because of this mask mandate. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Becky Ranger. I want to officially say that I oppose this ordinance, 2021-13. You might notice that I'm wearing a mask. This is by Mertz Technologies, manufactured in Philadelphia or Pennsylvania, and it has a silver lining. It does not allow any bacteria to multiply. The other thing about the silver lining is that I have a silver lining in my life. Due to extreme violence, abuse, neglect, uh, just total corruption almost in my family, I barely survived, except for the mercy of God that intervened in my life. It started as a teenager, but it ended up culminating much more after I moved to Alaska in 1984. What I'm going to say now is going to seem weird, but many people with major issues do not have the courage to face them. And the reason I'm saying this is because there are assembly members who cannot face their inner issues because they don't have courage, mercy, or know what God really intends for justice to be. You see, when we extend God's real mercy and we experience it, he will bring true justice for us. It might not come for 40 years. I can tell you that because at the age of five, when someone molested someone and then someone molested me, it took 40 years before God's intervention actually happened. So, the courage, or the lack of a courage, affects us all. And I can see definitely, after living here and listening to all kinds of things that go on here, that there is a definite lack of real courage in facing issues. So then we go to another route and it becomes a very disastrous way to live our lives because we think the problem is there, or there, there. When it's actually down under, it comes from hell itself. If you know what torment is, if you know what fear is, because somebody is walking in the door after they drank for hours and after the Spirit of God shows you, that is fear and you have just overcome it by the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your testimony. Your time Thank is you. up. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Anyone at all? Seeing and hearing no one, public testimony is closed. What is the will of the body? Move to postpone indefinitely. Second. Second. Moved Second. and seconded. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion? Ms. LaFrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
I just wanted to say a few comments. It's been pointed out, you know, we have a mask law now. We do. But clearly, the will is not there to put it through the public process and move it through the legislative process. So we'll keep the current mask law, which is an emergency order. I don't understand why so many people here object to the process that, we've, that people have been asking for, and that is the public process to go through amendment to strengthen it. So be it. Um, I mean, we can leave this to the acting mayor. I understand there's not the will further, you know, to get into this. And it was pointed out, you know, during the work session that we have emergency ordinances. That's something that, um, right, the assembly can pass. But they don't go through the public process. And so a big part of the intent here, and I thank Mr. Haberman very much for making those points, was to bring this through the public process and to make it temporary and to strengthen it in a way. And I, I do regret that, you know, the testimony as it was pointed out didn't focus on those aspects. But again, we do have the mask law now and the status quo will remain. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Would anyone else like to uh, speak? Uh, excuse me, sir. We are in the middle of deliberation. Please do not interrupt again. Would anyone else like to speak? Okay. Seeing no further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Dunbar? Yes. Mr. Dunbar? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Constant? Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia? Yes. Ms. Zolotel? Yes. That motion passes nine to one. Uh, Chair, so that. Can I have a. Uh, yes, Ms. Allen? I'm about to do a reconsideration. I messed up. Okay. Got it. You, you meant to vote. Yes. Sure. <laughs> so, so I think we can do that relatively quickly. So Ms. Ms. Allard accidentally voted no when she meant to vote yes. So let's go ahead and uh, do a motion to reconsider to fix that very quickly. Move to reconsider. Second. Moved and seconded. Second. Uh, thank you. Is there any discussion on the motion to reconsider? Okay. Members may proceed to vote on the motion to reconsider. A yes vote will bring it back so that Ms. Allard can correctly vote. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Dunbar? Yes. Mr. Constant? Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia? Yes. Ms. Zolotel? Yes. Okay, the motion to reconsider is approved 10 to 0, so now we have the that motion uh, to postpone indefinitely is back before us. Is there any further discussion on the motion to postpone indefinitely? Seeing none, members may proceed to vote on the motion to postpone indefinitely. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Dunbar? Yes. Mr. Constant? Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia? Yes. Ms. Zolotel? Yes. That motion is approved 10 to 0, so that item is postponed indefinitely. The remainder of our agenda for today, 14F, G, and H, we will take that up at our second meeting in February. For now, we'll go ahead and end with assembly comments. Well, can I point of order, Mr. Chair? Uh, yes. Um, not that that's not an unreasonable thing, but I think people understand where we are on these things. We have three more that are very similar before us, and if we could dispense with them quickly, they're all public hearing items, if we could get through them very quickly, perhaps we could do it tonight. That's a very optimistic, Minister Weddleton, but I don't believe we can. Uh, but th that is a, um, I guess a majority of the body can insist that we continue, but I'm going to suggest that um, we go ahead and wrap things up tonight. Is that a motion that he's, that Mr. Weddleton's asking, Chair? 
I guess so, so, so for me, I guess I, I am making a ruling that we are going to go ahead, unless there's other, other folks who want to convince me otherwise, that we go ahead and just wrap up our meeting tonight and these items will proceed on to our next meeting in February. Um, Move so, to adjourn. Um, uh, Mr. Constant, I'm gonna I'm gonna call that uh, uh, motion out of order. I want us to keep going. Uh, we're not quite there yet. Thank you, though. Um, so, did you have anything else, Mr. Weddleton? No, I think we can do it. I think people have made their points, and we can, having heard that, deal with these other three briskly, with a little more commentary. I'm not sure that's, that's entirely accurate, but again, uh, if there's a majority of the body that disagrees, we can move forward. So, so in that case, in order to determine if there's a majority of the body that disagrees, I need, I need a motion to no. overrule the chair. Uh, move to overrule the chair and continue <laughs> the meeting. Okay, so I, I heard a second from Ms. Allard. Uh, so do you want to discuss that further? I think we can get it done. Okay, Ms. Kennedy, did you want to discuss that? I, I just had a question in regard to how many people were signed up online to testify for those three items. Thanks. So uh, for all, in total, we have uh, five individuals for those three items. Uh, Mr. Perez Radia on the motion before us. Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I uh, just just to clarify, what this means is is that we open public testimony on every single one of these items, and everyone who is present in the chambers and and who is uh, signed up on the phone has the ability to testify on every single one of these these, these items. Is that correct? Um, so I think with with one. Um edit to your comments, which is, it would be one at a time. We wouldn't open up all three at the same time. Right, right. So there, each, each item would be open, and then everyone in the chambers would have the opportunity to tell us about on each item one at a time. If they so wish, my, yes. my, my sense is that based on the, the, the time that we have left and the interest of the public has in sharing their ideas and thoughts about the, these items, I do not believe that it's realistic that we will finish this, this tonight, and I would urge the body to, uh, to, to postpone these items until our next meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So I think just, just to be very clear for the record and for the public, so we don't need to take any action to postpone these items. All we need to do is just adjourn and, and eventually, Mr. Constant, and these items will um, go to our second meeting in February. So what we are deliberating right now is whether we want to continue tonight or not. So I, I think I'll just put one more bit of information out there. A yes vote over, overrides my ruling and will continue the, uh, we will continue in our agenda until our time's up. A no vote sustains my ruling. Um, so is there any further discussion on the motion before us? Okay, seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Peterson? No. Mr. Dunbar? No. Mr. Constant? No. Mr. Presbridia? No. Ms. Zolotel? No. Uh, okay, so that <laughs> motion fails nine to one. Um, so my ruling is upheld. Uh, okay, so then we're gonna go ahead and move on. And actually there were a couple of folks who signed up for f uh, final audience participation. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and go through these two individuals. Um, and then uh, if there's uh, anyone in the uh, room who would like to participate, um, otherwise there will be plenty of future meetings to participate. Oh, excuse me, more than two. Thank you, Madam Clerk, for pointing that out. Um, okay, so we're going to go ahead and go through these individuals and then assembly comments and then uh, end the meeting. So with that, we're going to go ahead and start with Ms. Kristen Bush. Uh, <laughs> okay.
Hello? Hi, Ms. Bush. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on the final audience participation. You have three minutes. Welcome. Okay. Just a moment. I have to get that open. <clears throat> My name is Kristen Bush, and I was once a proud citizen of Anchorage. I'm no longer proud of this city. I'm embarrassed of it. These emergency mandates and the proposed ordinances are inconsistent, impractical, and discriminatory. A few meetings back, we heard a lot of commentary from the assembly members, finally recognizing that the citizens of this city are having major problems with how you are choosing to run it. You hypothesized that our problem isn't really with the emergency powers given to the acting mayor. You believe our problems are with the various mandates under the emergency powers. For the record, we don't agree that the mayor should have broad sweeping emergency powers. If you need the emergency declaration to remain in place in order to distribute personnel and emergency federal funds, then you can certainly keep it in place, but also retract all of the mayor's tyrannical mandates within. You don't need to replace that with other ordinances, just abolish them all in one swipe. As our elected officials, your duty and obligation is to be flexible and acting swiftly to adjust in this extremely desperate time. It's disappointing that you are relying upon hypotheticals and a constant what could happen, might happen. All of it is just an oppressive fear mentality. The continuing restrictions on restaurants, bars, theaters, churches, museums, bingo halls, small stores, and schools needs to come to a stop. Open the city up and recognize that COVID-19 isn't going anywhere. You can predict surges and overwhelming deaths, but the fact is, based on the numbers of today, the mortality rate of COVID-19 in Alaska is 0 0.004437. Here's another number that uh, this city um, leadership is contributing to, unemployment upwards of 21,000 Anchorage people and food insecurity climbing to 30%. You need to get out of the way and let people decide their own risk tolerance. We are capable of wearing a mask if we want. We know how to wash our hands and stay home when we're sick. Beyond that, you really shouldn't be dictating anything about how we choose to live our lives on a daily basis. COVID-19 is no longer a pandemic in the state of Alaska. It's an endemic and we must adapt to living with it and around it and through it. And we desperately need you to lift all restrictions before not even a single business is left standing. In closing, I wanna share my experience from today. Driving to an appointment, I saw school buses and I had to pull over because I broke down in tears, crying because something was finally happening to bring normalcy back to kids' lives. I then went and had lunch in the Chinese place in Eagle River, and they were so happy to see someone saying, and I quote, no one comes in because our customers have given up on the mayor lifting restrictions, so they don't ever even know if restaurants will ever open, end quote. You people are failing us all. Apologies is for interrupting you, ma'am, but your time is up. Thank you. Next, we have Shannon Slater. Remember, the one of the and then last before I start going through the priority list for final audience participation, we have Tikita Parker.
Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and uh, move on to the top three folks on our priority list. Uh, so first I have Amanda Forrester, then Shirley Rainbolt, then Nathan Marshall. Thank you. All right, so do we have uh, Ms. Rainbolt or Mr. Marshall? All right, let's go ahead and call them then. Hi, uh, Ms. Rainbow. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on final audience participation. You have three minutes. Welcome. Uh, yes. I wanted to talk about the uh, masks and the uh, fact that the COVID is a man-made uh, deal. It's nanotechnology and those the testing, the, uh, the uh, vaccination, uh, both cause you to get the COVID. The masks do not do anything because it goes through the pores of the skin. And there is no reason to require masks. All it does is break your health down. For those that are asthmatic, they can't wear them. There is no reason for those masks. They're... they're Somebody said they were symbolic on television and they're trying to push it on people. If you make it a law, that's taken away our freedom of choice. I will not wear a mask. I have asthma and I do not believe in the COVID either. I will not take the test. I will not get a vaccination because it's a death sentence. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Next, let's go ahead and uh, ring up Nathan Marshall. Hi, Mr. Marshall. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on uh, final audience participation. You have three minutes. And just as an FYI, in case you weren't following the meeting, we did vote to postpone indefinitely AO 2021-13. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I don't really have much to say other than I just want to make it clear that majority of this city is absolutely sick and tired of the tyranny that goes on in the assembly with the exception of the very few and you know who you are uh, there's really no pandemic that we're dealing with uh, the real problem is the seats of power you're there because we voted you in and I said this last time you stab us in the back you, tr you want to make this a law you want to make masks a law so you want to make me and everybody else who walks outside of their house without one a criminal. I mean, don't come on, don't the cops have better things to deal with? Can't you find better things to spend your money on? I mean, you made it so, you, you said that it's too expensive to have a special election, but you spend your money on uh, buying a Sullivan for the homeless and uh, hiring code enforcers, and now you want to make this a law to where we would be criminals by stepping out of our house without them. I mean, come on, if masks really worked, don't you think when Berkowitz made them mandatory, our cases would have dropped? No, instead they spiked. I'm in strong opposition to this. And you should, by the way, this is for the whole assembly. You should really think about voting on this. You should really think about what is going to happen if you vote to pass this. Because, believe it or not, the anchored citizens are pissed off. 
We are sick and tired of being told what to do, when to do it, how to do it, where we can and where we cannot go, what businesses remain open and what are closed, who is and is not essential. We're sick of it. We're sick of being treated like children. That's all I have to say. Thank you. All right, we're gonna go ahead and go back to our final audience participation list. We have two more folks on it. Then we'll go back to the priority list. So we have Rosalind Weish and Carolyn Keel. Let's start with Ms. Weish. The call has been forwarded to an automatic voicemail. Okay, uh, and then let's go ahead and try Ms. Keel. This is Carrie. I'll give you a call back. Thank you. Okay. Then um, we'll go ahead and go back to the priority list. So our next three on the list are Susan Snow, Billy Toen, and Andrew Satterfield. Satterfield. All right. Seeing none of them there, let's go ahead and start calling them. We'll start with Ms. Snow. Has been forwarded to an. Let's go ahead and go to Mr. Toen. And then, once I'm, what I'll do after I'm done with these three while we're ringing up Mr. Toen is um, I'll likely just go down and for folks in person, we'll go ahead and do that. And then anyone else that's on the phone, we'll go through them after we're done with in person on the list. Billy Toyin speaking. Go ahead. Hi, Mr. Toyin. This is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on final audience participation. You have three minutes. Welcome. Okay. Um, a concern and in part a specific issue on the agenda. The iceberg tip of the reason that I oppose the proposed mask law is that it doesn't do anything except cause health problems, breathing and breathing bacteria, we breathe in depleted air, etc. But what it does do is set a dangerous precedent, which brings me to the prime reason for opposing it and what can follow. We need to stop mandating medical procedures right now. Today the masks Tomorrow, the mandatory invasive testing. Day after tomorrow, mandatory vaccines. And I hate to think, what else? Some of the hazards have been brought up, I heard a few minutes ago, and are very verifiable with patent numbers and some credible physicians. Many will turn a blind eye, and that's their business. But I will not abdicate my God-given right to say no to say no to anything that I have decided is harmful to me. Now, others can choose for themselves, but we don't need a new law that sets a dangerous pattern that violates individual personal decisions. So that is my input on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Next, we'll go to Andrew Satterfield. Good evening, Miss Andrew. 
Hi, good evening. Uh, this is Felix Rivera You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on final audience participation. You have three minutes. Welcome. Yes, sir. However, I already spoke, uh, so I don't know if I'm allowed to speak again. Okay, so if you already spoke uh, during initial audience participation, uh, then no, um, you are not allowed to speak again during final audience participation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Y'all have a great night. Go to sleep, Mr. <laughs> Wilson. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. All right, so next uh, is Mr. Topol. All right. Welcome, Mr. Topol. Good evening for the last time tonight. My name is William Topol. Uh, my alleged representatives are Mr. Dunbar and Mr. Peterson. Just two or three quick comments, please. Tonight, I saw glimpses of maturity by this assembly by postponing indefinitely two very controversial actions that could have further divided this town. You postponed action against Representative Allard. You also postponed action on AO 2021-13. I want to thank you for that. I will criticize you when I think you do wrong, and I'll compliment you when I think you do right. I think you did right tonight. A small victory for the people, and hopefully a start to move forward when you continue to listen to the people. Okay. And Mrs. Kennedy, good to see you. Haven't seen you in a long time. So that closes my remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Mark Roll. Are you in the room? All right. Welcome. My personal opinion about these masks is all you politicians that want us to wear these masks are telling us, you guys be quiet. We don't want to hear nothing from you. We want to govern you guys. We want to rule you guys the way we want to. That's what we want. You guys be quiet. Don't say nothing. Don't raise your voice. Don't don't say a thing. We're your rulers. We're going to rule over you. But I just hope the people of Anchorage, the people of this state, and the people of this nation rise up, go to the polls, and vote y'all out. Except for maybe this one over here. That stood up for us. You guys are a disgrace. You guys are a disgrace. You try to rule over us. It's time for you guys to step down out of your position. Let somebody else that will really represent the people. Let somebody else step into your position that really care about the people. It's really sad. You can't even go to a restaurant. What is that? You're ruining people's lives, people's businesses. It's really disgraceful. Please get some integrity. Quit doing this, especially that Dunbar right there. It's not a, a narrative or fake something. Go research, 
research it yourself. I showed you the medical doctor that says the mask, if you use it with a patient that has it, it's going to protect somebody else. But it doesn't work. Even these masks don't work. But I wear it because I want to breathe. I don't want to wear one of those kind. And even the blue masks, they're not going to work. Like that guy said, like a fence, okay? And a ping pong ball. I know. I worked in the medical field. Thank you. Is Jordan Hooray uh, in the room? Okay, uh, Mr. Habern. My name is Eugene Carl Haberman, 43 years Alaska resident, 20 of those years in Anchorage resident, Gurney Valley resident. What I'm going to talk about tonight concern, should concern all of us. While there's uh, concerns about how COVID is going to be handled in Anchorage, what's going on in the state level, in the legislature, is alarming, dealing with and putting out a continuing an emergency declaration. There's a block there among certain members of the legislature and certain committees. Unfortunately, they dominate with from valley rep representatives in the legislature that are responsible for that scenario. And this is not a time for that, and I'm concerned about the future. For those who don't understand what that declaration means, and the governor's continued it several times, but is hoping that the legislature will continue it, is the end result is it's going to be more hard hardship for those who are from the medical field in dealing with the regulations and getting the COVID issue being handled effectively in their hospitals and so forth. I mean, uh, this is not the time for it. Also, as you know, you got dealings with federal and uh, when you declare a state emergency like for earthquake, uh, it's needed. For those in this room and elsewhere to understand we are in an emergency, not just in Alaska, not just in the United States, but around the world. And the fact that we are maybe one of the states that will block dealing with a continued declaration is extremely alarming. And we should all be fearful because even when I'm critical of the governor, and I have been, because he's provided a false sense of security on the issues, and he's not done with the mask and all that, but he's recommended people wear face coverings and social distancing. He's done that, but he has not complied his own personal example of doing that. The thing is, he has continually pushed through that emergency declaration. But with the legislature in session now, the handicap now is it's up to the legislature, and the members in the legislature right now are particularly members of the Valley Delegation, are irresponsible. And this is going to be alarming, and other states are going to look for it. And I'll leave you this one thought. Those who are looking at Canada and what they announced and concern about tourism. How can Canada expect comfort that their next-door neighbor is not going to continue a declaration? emergency declaration. Can you can expect them to come around and say, okay, Alaska, we feel comfortable with what you're doing. And so those in the tourism industry and elsewhere are in hot water with this scenario. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and end our meeting with uh, Mr. Sherman. Uh, thank you, Chair. Dustin Sherman. So I'm going to end the, in, end the evening with a little bit of levity uh, for everybody. So uh, have you ever felt that you're in a movie or following a movie script? Like right now, I feel like we're in a movie, but we're using two different scripts. One is V for Vendetta, and the other is Idiocracy. In V for Vendetta, a government decided to unleash a virus on the unsuspecting populace, then lie about it, basically telling the public, we will take care of you. Trust us, we will fix everything. Well, of course, that never happened. Instead, they elect a dictator, turn the country into a fascist society, 
where there are curfews and police doing all sorts of bad things whenever they are caught out in public. They also have a special police force to capture and enslave and kill distance, dissidents to the regime. Idiocracy, on the other hand, is where the society of weak-minded people destroy the world because of idiocy, hence the name. My question for this assembly is, when do you want us to start watering our grass with uh, grass and plants with Gatorade because personally I'd like to buy stock so I can leave the planet on my new starship built by Elon Musk. Just saying, everything is possible with the reality that you people live in. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. We're adjourned. Uh.